Block 2. Pulling herself out of the cramped maintenance scrollway, Kyrie looked around. Thankfully there were no turrets shooting at them. She did notice a burned turret husk 20 meters down the hall. She knew they didn't shoot it, but that didn't mean someone else didn't. Kyrie turned to help May out, and pointed the turret out. May responded, no certain way to know for sure, but it was likely knocked out in a firefight before the crash. She then pointed at various scorch marks on the walls, and the remains of damaged barricades, not to mention the scattered weapons. No corpses, but there were odd piles of dust. There was clearly a firefight in this corridor. Not too shocking though, since our goal is just past that turret there, Kairu sighed. Good thing too, I don't like getting shot at. Since they started, they had wandered half the deck, and been shotted multiple times by still functioning turret emplacements. This was the first time they had found one not functioning. A couple moments later they were joined in the corridor by Kuk and Iris, who then looked around as well, and Kuk said, Yeah it definitely looks like a firefight happened here. Makes one wonder why we didn't find firefights elsewhere on the deck. Maybe not. There should be an airlock just over there. Although by the looks of things, it has been thoroughly buried commented Iris while pointing at a collapsed bulkhead. It looks like the crew must have repelled the borders, at least on this deck. Well we can sit here all day and speculate, but I am sure we will find all the answers in the ship's computers. Let's push on and check out that security station. Hopefully the consoles are still working. They made their way down the corridor, but soon discovered that the blast door leading into the security room was sealed shut. Worse, the entire door frame was warped. The blast door would not be opening again. From the look of it, it seemed someone had tried to smash their way in, but the door never broke, Kairu commented. I guess we are cutting our way in. Iris looked it over and agreed. Unfortunately that does seem to be the case. K interjected, I could try looking for another way in. May said, you do that, while Kairu and I get started on the cutting. This might take a while, I'll take a quick look around as well. See if I can't find some computer access said Iris. As Kairu and May started on cutting open the door, K and Iris started looking around. Each one had differing goals though. As it turned out, it took hours to cut through the door. No surprise there. It was a blast door after all. It was designed to be hard to breach, and the only cutting tool they brought along was their own wrist cannons. Technically the pistol could do it too, but it was decidedly less powerful, and therefore didn't count. Not in Kairu's mind anyway. K was unable to find a second way into the room. K did find a maintenance path that came close. Unfortunately at some point, part of that crawl space had collapsed. If there had been a second entrance there, it was out of their reach. Much easier and safer to just keep cutting through the door, than to risk trying to unbury that path. Iris on the other hand, did manage to find a local computer node, in an office several doors down to the aft. Unfortunately it didn't have access to the main database or anything important. What it did have was a cargo manifest, and quite a few records on past cargo runs. Apparently, it was the office of the ship's chief logistics officer, who kept meticulous records on a secure non-networked computer protected by multiple layers of security, including a memory wipe protocol. Iris had just finished telling Kairu how she managed to get past that one, when the door finally fell open. Kairu, hoping for something more interesting asked, about that manifest you found, anything interesting on it? Iris frowned, for the most part no, at least until I gave it a second look, most of the cargo they carried was typical organic cargo for planet seeding, there is, however, mention of an artifact being stowed in the secure bay, apparently at their last stop they picked up a Hishari artifact, but other than being Hishari there is no mention of what it was, in fact the lack of detail is what makes the lion item stand out. Kairu cocked her head to the side. One near rising, Hishari? Who in the cursed abyss are they? Iris sighed. Can't really tell you. I don't know much more myself. K interjected. Just open a down link with the constellation. The ship's library likely has full info on them. Iris shifted. Her eyes seemed to flash, and then her face widened. Interesting. All right. It seems the Hisari were the oldest race known to the Empire. The Solian people made first contact with them in the year 8882 SDE, when one of their scouts was found spying on the city ship, Berlin, and was promptly engaged by the cruiser Columbia's Vengeance. The ship was destroyed with all hands, despite being significantly more advanced than Alliance vessels of the age. Three weeks later that same fleet encountered one of their capital ships for the first time, a massive ship in its own right, 
and fairly powerful as well. Communications were actually exchanged then, but so were hostilities. In an ensuing battle the Hisari vessel was disabled and boarded, but not before she sank 12 cruisers, and a battleship. The Alliance pilfered quite a bit of advanced technology from that ship, and learned that the Hisari had thought the one ship sufficient to sink their entire fleet, if need be. However, they had underestimated Solian abilities because the Solian power signatures were quite low, and Solian armor is very unique. In addition, it had been a very long time since they had encountered anyone with powers that rivaled their own. That loss must have scared them as well, since there were no further encounters for the Alliance anyway. The Solian Empire would later encounter them when they returned to the region first charted by the Berlin and her escorts. That third encounter was also where hostilities resumed. Iris paused, and headed into the security room. Kairu took a look around, there was damage everywhere, but the consoles appeared to be mostly intact. Thankfully there weren't any turrets shooting at them. There was a turret in the room, but it was apparently dead. Not damaged, just dead. Iris cursed when she reached the console. Power's dead, she reported. K said, it might be a severed power conduit, I'll take a look, and see if I can't fix it. Kairi looked towards Iris, guess we have time. What happened with that third encounter? When the Solians entered the region of space for the second time, they sent the city ships, Tokyo Washington, Empress, and Paris as their vanguard. The first city ship to arrive was Tokyo escorted by the super dreadnoughts ISS Spain of Fools, and ISS Columbia's Crusader. She had been in that galaxy for barely a week, when twelve Hisari capital ships with escorts arrived. The Hisari apparently remembered the Solian people and weren't happy to see them back. They tried, and failed to drive the Tokyo off. Their ships were more powerful than the ones encountered all those millennia ago by the Berlin, but were no match for either Imperial Dreadnought. As it would later be learned, the Hisari Empire was in decline. That time they knew their ships might not be enough, but they had no more to spare. The rest of their fleet was busy protecting key worlds from encroaching vultures local to their own galaxy. The arrival of the Solian Empire was the last straw. In the remarkably short period of a mere ten years, the Solian Empire would conquer the Hisari Empire, and bring stability back to the region. So I take it that the Hisari are now another member species of the Empire? Iris shook her head, I'm afraid not. You see there was a reason their empire was declining. The Hisari race was dying when they were conquered. Dying? Huh? Some kind of plague? Iris gave her a look, and said, unfortunately no. The Hisari made extensive use of cloning, it isn't clear as to how, but at some point they stopped reproducing naturally and ended up reproducing solely through cloning. Unlike the Solians however, they never solved the problem of replicative fading. The Empire already had the solution for that at the time, but it was too late for the Hisari, they had been cloning themselves too long. However, that isn't to say the Empire couldn't help the Hisari people. They did. Imperial techniques bought them another hundred thousand years, but eventually the end came. In other words, an entire race went extinct due to an over-reliance on cloning, basically. However, they didn't stay extinct. In the year 2,891,243, the Empire found one of their colony ships. A malfunction in its navigation system had sent the ship into deep space, but it had millions of specimens from before their cloning program became irreversible in stasis. Not all of them survived the eras, but enough were intact for the Empire to reseed their species. At that moment the console came to life, but thankfully the dead turrets stayed dead. K came back, found the short. I was able to restore power without reactivating the turret. Iris smiled, good work. Let's see if we can't shut down the security grid. Moments later, Iris looked up from the console. All right security grid is down. I was also able to access the internal sensors. I've updated our tactical systems with a full map of the ship, and points of interest. Found something interesting as well. Interesting? What kind of interesting? Asked Kairu. May glanced at the console, clearly curious, and looked inquisitive. This ship has a full military-grade AI core. Same grade as the one on the constellation. According to internal sensors however, it's currently in hibernation mode. That sounded interesting alright, and it sounded like they just found a new objective, a core like that would need to be recovered. Thankfully it wouldn't be much of a detour, but Kairu figured it would be a good idea to update Megumi on their progress. 69 Special the Factions The Solian Intergalactic Empire Solian Empire Faction Type Precursor Empire Governmental Structure Dual Branched Oligarchy Government Branch A, Elder Council, Government Branch B, 
The protectorate, culture type, semi-nomadic authoritarians, specialties, areas the Solians excel in as follows. Specialty 1, Starship Engineering. Specialty 2, Plasma Technologies. Specialty 3, Hyperspatial Technologies. Specialty 4, Biotechnology. Specialty 5, Power Dharma Design. Specialty 6, AI, and Drone Development. Specialty 7, Stealth and Sensor Technologies. Specialty 8, Transcendent Shinix. Unique Technologies, Omega Energy, Transcendent Shinnik AI, Solian Energy Conversion and Absorption Techniques Notes, the Solian people are old, with at least several million years of development. Their empire at its height controlled over 2,000 galaxies, they ruled over countless worlds from their mighty city ships and built the vast Stargate network enabling unparalleled interstellar and intergalactic trade. The Empire also possessed unparalleled military might and technological supremacy making it the most powerful of the precursor races. Necu Interstellar Imperium, Faction Type, Subverted Young Empire, Original Governmental Structure, Imperial, Subverted Governmental Structure, Shadow Council, Culture Type, Pacifistic Authoritarians, Subverted Culture Type, Militarist Expansionists, FDL Type, Hyperdrive, Specialties, Areas of Excellence as follows. Specialty 1. Plasma Weaponry Specialty 2, Hyperspace Shielding Specialty 3, Planetary Engineering Specialty 4, Hyperspace Tracking Unique Technologies, Unknown Note, the Neku people were a peaceful if young culture until recently gifted with advanced weaponry and shields, they have suddenly begun a series of military campaigns against their neighbors. Little is known about what prompted this shift in stance. Eerily Confederated Systems, Faction Type, Young Federation, Governmental Structure, Federated Oligarchy, Government Note, Each planet is its own country, with its own rulers, joined together in a loose alliance that answers to the greater governmental body on the home world. Each colony is entitled to one representative on the home world. Culture Type, Passionate Explorers, Matriarchal, FDL Type, Jump Drive, Specialties, Areas of Excellence, as follows, Specialty 1. Particle Weaponry Specialty 2, Graviton Technologies Specialty 3, Sublight Propulsion Design Specialty 4, Biomedicine Specialty 5, Subspace Communications Unique Technologies, Jump Gates Notes, the Irali are a relatively young civilization ruled over by a Grand Republic Highly matriarchal, the majority of their leaders are female Early females tend to wear less the higher their rank in society. In recent years the matriarchy has loosened its grip and allowed each world to become its own country. Altian Directorate, Faction Type, Precursor Science Directorate, Governmental Structure, Science Council, Culture Type, Passionate Researchers, FDL Type, Hyperdrive, Hyperflux Drive, Specialties, Areas of Excellence, as follows, Specialty 1, Shields, Specialty 2, Drones, Specialty 3, Hyperstatial Engine Design, Specialty 4, Crystal-Based Computing, Specialty 5, Zero Point Energy, Specialty 6, Schnuck Ascendance, Specialty 7, Planetary Engineering, Unique Technologies, Zero Point Weaponry, Notes, An ancient people with no known home world, that excel in the sciences, they constantly seek to expand their knowledge of the universe and understand its fundamental principles. Ludo Confederacy, Faction Type, Elder Confederacy, Governmental Structure, Federated Republic, Culture Type, Benevolent Defenders, FDL Type, Warp Drive, Specialties, Specialty 1, Antimatter Weaponry, Specialty 2, Graviton Shields, Specialty 3, Hypercomputing, Specialty 4, Plantentary Engineering, Specialty 5, Advanced Cruiser Design, Specialty 6, Phased Flux Fields. Unique Technologies, Unknown Notes, the Ludal is one of the older races in the galaxies, and see themselves as the defenders of the younger races, they often also fancy themselves as dragon hunters, and their cruisers have often been seen engaged with dragons, results of these dragon hunts are often mixed. In recent years their activities have mostly been constrained by their war with the Vorani. Vorani Interstellar Realm, Faction Type, Eldar Empire, Governmental Structure, Imperial, Culture Type, Secretive and Militaristic, FDL Type, Warp Drive, Specialities, Specialty 1, Plasma Weaponry, Specialty 2, Antimatter Weaponry, Specialty 3, Armor and Hull Integrity, Specialty 4, Cloaking, Specialty 5, Starship Engineering, Specialty 6, Hyperspatial Power Systems, Unique Technologies, Unknown, Notes, The Vorani are not well known, 
as few have survived an encounter with them. Their ships are powerful and can strike unseen. In recent years they have been fighting a war with the Ludo. It is widely believed that they guard a vault filled with precursor technology that guides their development. But these rumors were never confirmed. Nagari Stark lands, faction type, elder matriarchy, governmental structure, matriarchal monarchy, culture type, militaristic, devoted, party lovers, FDL type, star drives, specialties, specialty 1, subspace technologies, specialty 2, hyperspatial weaponry, specialty 3, bioscience, specialty 4, shinix, specialty 5, bioship engineering, specialty 6, draconic culture studies, unique technology, Dragon proof cloaking devices. Notes The Nakari are a matriarchal race that developed in close proximity to several ancient dragon nests. As such, it is perhaps not unusual that they once worshipped the star dragons. Today, their culture contains remnants of such dragon worship and reverence. They have also developed unique cloaking devices that allow them to avoid detection from the psychic scans of dragons. A device they use both for defense, and to study dragons. At least so long as they don't give the dragons a reason to look for them. Of the younger and elder races, they are the foremost experts on dragons. Nagari vessels and technology is highly organic in nature. Unfortunately, their race is most well known for their mistake of cracking open a Solian shield world. Eris A Directive, Faction Type, Eldar Research Directive, Governmental Structure, Cybernetic Collective, Culture Type, Isolationist Researchers, FDL Type, Inversion Drive, Specialties, Specialty 1, Bioscience, Specialty 2, Starship Engineering, Specialty 3, Subspace Fields, Specialty 4, Mind Manipulation Techniques, Specialty 5, A and Drone Development, Specialty 6, Drone Weaponry, Unique Technologies, Mimetic cloning notes. The Erise is a cybernetic collective born from a research AI created by the Erise people centuries ago. Its creators were wiped out by a devastating plague, one that originated from a nearby shield world, one whose shield failed after the orbiting star went supernova. The shield, unfortunately, preserved the planet allowing the sentient plague it kept contained to spread. The plague was ultimately contained and destroyed but not before the Erise people were rendered extinct. In the centuries that followed the ancient AI has dutifully maintained their empire, often to the exclusion of all else, as its chief focus since has been to recreate its creators. One item of particular note is that the Erise in their prime discovered an ancient cache of precursor drone weapons, a cache the Erise Directive inherited and utilized in its own research of drone weaponry. Eridex Collective, Faction Type, Precursor Machine Intelligence, Governmental Structure, Cybernetic Collective, Culture Type, Militaristic Assimilators, FDL Type, Hyperwap, Specialties, Specialty 1, Phased Energy, Weapons, Specialty 2, Cybernetics, Specialty 3, Microcomputing, Specialty 4, Bioengineering, Specialty 5, Bioscience, Specialty 6, Biodrone Replication, Unique Technologies, Adaptive Cloning, Notes. The Eridex are an unusual cybernetic collective, they are most famed for their use of biologicals as drones, but what is less well known is the process by which they achieve this. Captured biologicals are taken to specialized chambers where the brain is completely removed and then replaced with a computer. Special devices are used to keep the subject calm during this process. The newly minted drone is then augmented and put to work. The collective also artificially produces new drones, who have their brains removed and replaced soon after emerging from their growth pods. Because of their rather creepy use of biologicals, it is perhaps not surprising that the collective is constantly at war. Most races don't like seeing their loved ones used as puppets. The brain removal process however prevents subjects from being restored. However, the Solian Empire has successfully reversed the process. It is important to note that the restored individuals have no memory of who they were. Well, not a complete one. The Solians have a complicated process that has succeeded in partially restoring this. The particulars of this process however are a secret known only to them. There, subverters, faction type, young escaped sentient bio appen governmental structure, shadow council, culture type, mind controlling puppeteers, FTL type, specialties. Specialty 1, Mass Mind Manipulation Techniques. Specialty 2, Bioscience. Unique Technologies, Unknown. Notes, Very little is known about the subverters, only that they exist. Nothing else is truly known about them, not even a name. 40. Chapter 36 Treasures of a Crashed Precursor Freighter. Megumi processed the update from the squad she had sent to the wreck she had found. 
The mention of a Hisari artifact and a military AI core were very interesting to her. The artifact might actually have played a role in the ship being attacked in the first place, and therefore might have indirectly been the cause of the crash. If the artifact was still there it would almost certainly be something of value, cultural value more than anything else. While the Hisari were technologically skilled, the Empire acquired all of their most valuable technologies when they conquered them tens of thousands of years ago. There had been a few things of interest but there were also a few things that were just dead ends. In any case, while it had little practical value to her, to anyone else it could very well be a major find. Honestly, the AI Corps was likely the most valuable thing there to her. While she could use it for a new ship, it would also represent a new companion for her, something she was quite interested in. There was nothing quite like talking with one of her own kind. Still the mortals around her were interesting, especially Kairu. Megumi really liked Kairu, and there was also something about Milia. Erisa was cute, but a bit of an irritant. At least she hadn't bothered her lately. Megumi looked in on her the moment she thought about her. What she saw actually explained it. It seems she had gone back to the toy that she accidentally tortured herself with. Looks like she figured it out, and has reduced herself to a spasming drooling mess. Megumi redirected her attention. Nothing interesting there. Not to mention she wasn't a fan of watching others masturbate. It was far more fun to be actively participating and exchanging pleasure with a partner than to just watch. She never understood those that simply enjoyed watching. Putting that aside, she considered her short-term plans. She was about finished setting up this outpost, and once her team was back she was going to set course for the Neki home world. Neuri. It was time to start looking into the puppet master. She had finished her preparations already. Kairi listened to their updated orders. In addition to downloading the memory, they were to recover the ship's AI core, and if possible locate and acquire the Hisari artifact. Apparently the ship said it was likely useless, but if it was still here it could be dangerous in the wrong hands. Depending on what it is, that is, they could not be sure how dangerous it was until they knew what the artifact in question was. As it could be anything, before she could think much on the orders, commented. I think we can get the main objective and core recovery done pretty easily. The core is down four decks, and to the aft. Eris nodded, and now that we have an internal map of the ship we can get there in minutes instead of hours. May interjected, we could get done faster if we split up, Kairu concurred. Definitely, Eris will need to go with the core recovery group, so who is going with her? K interjected, we will need three people to move the core, so what you are really asking is who isn't going? Three people? Why three? AI cores aren't tiny. They are actually quite large, but thankfully we don't need the entire module, just the central core, which is a crystal sphere set in a special housing. That core and housing are the size of a small shuttle, and weigh twice as much. Thankfully, the housing is designed to be moved, and carries integrated anti-graph generators. They don't totally negate the weight though. In fact they were intentionally designed that way. The triangular base housing has three grip points for us to move it with. Kairu frowned. If it's that big, how are we getting it out? There is a sealed shaft into the computer module. That's how the core would have been brought into the ship in the first place. Based on the day two Eris recovered it's still intact, if a bit damaged, we should be able to maneuver the core up and out via that shaft. As for getting back to the ship, it should fit in the Star Wolf's aft bay, barely. At that point May said, I'll go look into that artifact, it shouldn't take long. Then I will come and help move the core. A little more discussion followed, but they soon split. K Kairu and Eris went on the core recovery errand, while May moved off in a different direction to look into the artifact. None of them were worried about running into hostile resistance. The grid was down, and there was no one else here. Well, apart from the slimes, but they hadn't seen any inside the wreck, not to mention they had already proven to be non-hostile. Reaching the core proved to be as easy as they expected. With the grid down and a map, it proved easy to navigate to the core. Kairi looked around the core room as Eris accessed a terminal. It was a massive chamber easily twice the size of her old bridge more than big enough to house the command center of a ship. The walls were lined with precursor crystal compute racks. The strange crystals were pale blue plates with glowing purple lines running through them. In the center of the chamber was a massive floating triangular housing holding a dimly glowing crystal sphere. The crystal of the sphere seemed to meld seamlessly with the housing and the sphere itself wasn't just crystal but also smooth glass and polished metal, all of which melded seamlessly together. What she noticed most were the purple lines that seemed to form three-dimensional shapes within the crystal. Also of note were a number of conduits running in and out of the housing, 
There were a dozen of them hooked to the underside of the housing, and each one glowed purple. There were two conduits however that glowed blue and they hooked into the housing from above. There were also a number of alien computer consoles scattered around the room, including three built right into the core housing. It was one of those Santa consoles that Eris moved to access. Then mentioned, might as well make yourself comfortable. Eris might be a while. She nodded. That made perfect sense. It would take time to find and copy the database. She sat down to wait. It might be a little boring, but she knew from experience that was a good thing. It meant things were going well. It's when things stopped going according to plan or started getting exciting that you needed to be worried. Thankfully she didn't have to wait too long before Eris looked up from the console. Found out what led to the crash. You did? Yeah, the ship has a full combat log of the encounter. Long story short was that they ran into a drive disruptor field that knocked her out of warp. Where she was promptly intercepted by multiple pirate-owned cruisers. Most of them aren't worth mention, but the flag of this pirate fleet was a Sol Fire class cruiser. Those aren't often found in the hands of pirate groups, but they're quite popular with bounty hunters and regional police forces. As for pirates, most of them are too poor to actually purchase one. And as for stealing one, that is easier said than done. Kyra nodded. Yeah police ships rarely end up as pirate vessels. Anyway, they were. Well after the interception, naturally a battle followed, and a boarding action as well. The fighting was fierce. And this ship wasn't alone. She had four escorts, all of which were destroyed during the battle. But the pirates didn't take them unscathed. Several of their ships were sunk as well. As for what ended the battle, the pirate Sol Fire was forced to retreat when a Category 12 Iron Storm appeared on sensors. They had taken too many hits, and their armor was compromised, rendering them unable to risk taking the storm. This ship was in the same state. But while the field was down she couldn't make the shift to warp speed. In the fighting she had taken multiple hits to her engines and was left adrift. And the storm was what dumped her in orbit of this moon. Where she later crashed. Any mention of the final fate of the crew? Unfortunately, yes. Those that survived the battle were killed when the storm hit. May suddenly interjected from the doorway. More importantly, the pirates didn't leave with the prize. Kairu and the others looked over, to see Mei holding a small oval object with a silvery surface, and several oval bumps on the one side. I take it that would be the artifact? Kairu asked. Mei nodded. Yep. Turns out it was an old Hisari holopad. Very old. K glanced at the device, and commented, at least it will be easy to transport. Curious to know what is on it, though. Mei smiled. I gave it a cursory look. It appears to be someone's personal journal, but not just anyone's journal. This belonged to one of the more influential scientists during the height of their empire. They logged everything in here. From their day-to-day -day life to every project idea they had. Eris quipped, that explains why the pirates might have been interested in it. The cruiser also paints a bigger picture. Someone paid them to steal it. Kairu frowned. Why? Didn't the empire obtain all the knowledge of the Hisari when they conquered them? Not quite. They obtained everything the Hisari people remembered. But like any great power there is always knowledge once known but lost to time. Replied Eris. May interjected. That is especially true of secrets that were made lost. The Solian first lords made much of their knowledge lost to the empire for example. The Hisari did the same with some of their knowledge when they became faced with their race dying. Secrets they deemed too dangerous to risk being stolen. This journal was written before they did that, and may contain insights into their lost secrets. Kairu suddenly realized how dangerous that innocent looking pad was. At least it wasn't her problem to worry about. What was her problem was moving that large core. That was going to be a pain, she just knew it. Then Eris said, Well, anyway I finished downloading what remains of the ship's database, so now we get to move the core. What followed was a surprisingly straightforward, if exhausting task. They had to stop a couple times to open damaged doors, but there were no other hiccups. As such, as the day was coming to an end they loaded the core and artifact into the shuttle. Getting it into the shuttle proved to be the simplest part of the whole process. It fit snugly into the rear bay, and was easily secured with specialized docking hooks. Kairu inquired about them, and learned that Eris had thoughtfully ordered the shuttle to reconfigure its rear bay for core transport. Apparently, Solian shuttles were just as capable of self-reconfiguration as their capital ships were. It just took a while to do, but there was more than enough time for a minor reconfiguration like this to occur while they were extracting the core. With the core loaded, and the artifact secured, 
before Biomax settled into the forward compartment where the shuttle soon took off. Kairu, feeling tired, felt like taking a nap, but knew it wouldn't be that long before they rendezvoused with the constellation. She could hold out long enough to make it to her quarters aboard the ship, none of them, however, noticed their stowaway. 63 Chapter 37 Megari The Neki Home World The shuttle landed gently in the bay. Kairu stepped off and was promptly greeted by Megumi's hologram materializing before her. Welcome aboard. Don't worry about unloading the shuttle. I have some drones on the way to do that for you. Tiredly, she thanked Megumi, who replied, You four deserve a nice rest. I'll wake you when we reach Neuri. She nodded, and the four tiredly scrambled out of the shuttle bay. At the same moment, the ship came about, breaking orbit. In a few minutes, she would be underway to the planet Neuri. Hours later, the ship silently came out of warp over a lovely world. Second from her sun, with four moons. One of which also had an atmosphere. Neuri had nine continents, but one of those nine was a supercontinent. It was a massive world but its core wasn't very dense giving Neuri a gravity of 2.07. However, while the home world was mineralogically poor, one of its moons, specifically the one with an atmosphere, was rather rich in minerals and featured a gravity of 2.3. Megumi discreetly took several scans of the alien worlds and noted that between the planet, and the habitable moon, the system had a population of 23 billion Neku. She did however notice a sizable number of life signs that were not Neku, exactly what they were, she knew not. As no entity in her database was an exact match, the closest she could find in the database was 73% genetic match. She made a note to acquire a specimen. They might prove interesting to study at the very least. But given someone was manipulating the Neku from the shadows, these unknowns might very well be that party. At the very least they were likely to be connected to the issue in some fashion. While making plans to acquire a specimen, she began focusing her senses on the ocean floor. The depths of Neguri's vast oceans could reach crushing pressures, and there were regions no Neku had visited before. They lacked the technology to plunge to those depths. As such, the ocean floor would make a great place to hide a Stargate complex. She already had a few more criteria in mind for that. It needed to be a certain depth, and she wanted it in a geologically stable region. Thankfully, she had sensors that could easily scan the ocean depths without disrupting her cloak or revealing her position to the locals. It helped that she had toys and tricks at her disposal beyond the current understanding of the Neku. The Neku couldn't even detect the Shinnick sweeps she was using, or any of the other sensors she was currently using to actively scan their planet. In fact, it was a bit of a rush to know that she was silently hovering over their world with the entire populace none the wiser to her presence. If any of them knew she was here, there would be mass panic, no doubt or argument about it. Her arsenal contained countless weapons with which she could annihilate the civilization below, not to mention as a battleship. She was designed to evoke that kind of fear. Megumi stretched, and her avatar slipped out of the command chair on the bridge. It was technically ship's night, but it was almost morning. She had timed her arrival so that it would be close to ship's morning. Giving her a little time to conduct scans before her growing crew started to wake. She glanced around her bridge. Solian bridge design had changed little in the millennia since they first reached the stars. Like any traditional Solian bridge it was split into two levels. The upper command level overlooked the lower control level. Banks of consoles were arranged around the lower level which was circular in shape. The walls of the dome-shaped bridge made up a single massive view screen that provided a panoramic view of everything around the ship with the exception of below the ship, but the screen could be flipped to show that. There was also a strategic display in the center of the bridge. It occurred to her, now that it was rebuilt, she should probably train a few bridge officers. While she could operate without a crew, there were benefits to having a trained crew. She pushed the thought to the back of her priority list. As she made her way down to wake Kairu personally, her mind wandered to another subject. Neguri's defenses. From her perspective, they were nothing to write home about. The planet and moon colony were both protected by planetary shields, but their strength left quite a bit to be desired. Although it would take a significant fleet at the same tech level as the Neku or the Eroli to breach those shields. For her. However, those shields weren't going to hold up for very long. Although they would last longer than any ship shield. Having access to the planetary power grid and the massive amount of space a planet could provide meant that the shields wouldn't fail from a single hit from her guns. However, they wouldn't exactly block the beams either, only reduce the yield. Slightly, 
Negeri was also protected by a number of orbital bases, floating gun platforms, a large garrison of patrolling warships, and planetary ground-to-space batteries. It made her well fortified like any major world would be expected to be. However, those defenses meant little to her and her plans. That didn't mean she was ignoring them entirely. Already she had a subroutine dedicated to remotely hacking the defense network, while another was hacking the civil net, and a third was hacking into the communications grid every computer system she could find. She had a subroutine already dedicated to hacking into it. In fact, she already had low-level access to every system on the planet. She could have had full access already, but she was trying to be low-key about it. Regardless she expected to have full access within the next minute at the most. Their systems just weren't equipped to really stop a computer as powerful as she was. Of course, even with their primitive computer hardware, there were computers she could not break into. But that was because of the simple fact that they were completely isolated from the networks. It was a remarkably simple method of security but one that worked quite well. Technically she could hack into it regardless, but that was tricky. Not to mention quite detectable. Doing so wouldn't reveal her position, but it would alert anyone looking that someone was hacking into their secure computers. As for why, well that method was well known for seriously disrupting any targeted computing systems and every computer system nearby. Of course, nearby being relative, it would be a 5 km radius. Naturally, it would be quieter if a physical asset went down there and stealthy created a downlink, something she was going to do eventually as she wanted to know what was on the secure planetary servers. While most of what data was stored on those servers was likely to be junk. I.e. useless to her, some of it might be interesting. Not to mention those servers likely would contain the most useful hints on what was going on here. Assuming the puppeteers allowed anything of interest to be stored on a computer, she already knew from her captured neck here that they were quite through with their memory wiping. While they didn't wipe everything, key memories were thoroughly obliterated. She couldn't even recover them as there was nothing to recover, as for why, she had a couple of theories based on the evidence, she just wasn't going to speculate, as it served no purpose, Megumi's attention was quickly drawn back to the planet as her subroutines started to process new data from the planetary data net, her subroutines had achieved full access to the data net and were now sifting through exabytes of data, the civilian net alone would take her a while to go through and analyze. Since she was going through it all with a fine tooth comb so to speak, her subroutines weren't going to be done until tomorrow at the earliest. The preliminary data wasn't all that interesting, at least on the civilian net. As for the defense net, that was a little more interesting, but nothing groundbreaking, yet. Another subroutine report drew her attention elsewhere on the planet. Her scans had located a perfect site for a new Stargate complex. Megumi started launching the specialized drones and noted the site. It was deep, very deep in the darkest depths of Neuri's ocean, where the crushing pressures were the greatest dangers. It was too deep for all but the strangest life forms to live. To be specific, the site was just over 16,000 meters below sea level. Despite the significant depth, it wasn't the deepest region of the planet's oceans. It was however geologically stable with a very thick and rocky sea floor. It was deep enough that any necu submersible would be crushed trying to reach the site, but her own craft could easily withstand those pressures. Shield or no shield, modern Solian ships had the structural integrity to withstand immense pressures far in excess of what that ocean could subject. Her mind then switched tracks to consider what style of gate complex she wanted to build. The most common and mundane style was the pressure dome style complex. It had its advantages, and was the lowest tech solution to the intense pressures exerted by the sheer weight of the water at that depth, especially given the planetary gravity levels. However that style did present a few drawbacks, and forced certain limitations. A more advanced style was the Atlantis style. This style got rid of the pressure dome entirely in favor of an energy shield projected around the complex. The use of a shield over physical matter removed most of the limitations and would let her build pretty much however she wanted. However that shield did require a continuous supply of energy, and was harder to conceal. Not impossible to conceal, just harder. She was honestly leaning towards Atlantis style. A massive central structure, connected to five docking hubs was soon projected into her mind's eye. She added lodgings, storage areas, vehicle repair bays, automated factories. Each of the six hubs was given its own shield generator in addition to the primary shield generator in the central hub, 
She added a series of phased plasma batteries for defense, along with drone launches. By the time she was done setting up her template she had what amounted to a small underwater city. The architecture she had chosen was distinctly Terran, but that style was common for Solian use as well. With its construction already underway, and everything she needed taken care of, she finally reached her destination, Kairu's quarters. As Megumi's biomech avatar approached the door, it automatically opened to reveal a scene she hadn't quite been expecting. Then again she had not been paying any attention to these quarters. Megumi wasn't sure what to do, and called up the surveillance footage for the quarters. Her significant processing power allowing her to review it in mere seconds. Now that she knew what happened, the question became what does she do about it? 68, Chapter 38 A slimy visitor, Kairu moaned a bit as she felt the slime tentacle go deeper into her body. Above her, she could see the slimy female body of her partner moving. Out of sight, she could hear May moaning as another set of tentacles pounded her needy body. The tentacle inside of her tickled and teased her folds as it moved deeper into her body. Sending fiery sparks of pleasure rippling up her spine, she could feel herself about to come again, but she wasn't sure how many that would make. Kairu had come more times than she could count since this little threesome had begun. Not that she was sure how that had happened anymore. All her mind could think about at the moment was the raging pleasure, a storm of passion that she was very much enjoying. The tentacle slammed into her womb and she felt a rush of liquid pulse into her womb at the same moment her vision went white. The fiery hot pleasure in her belly exploded into fireworks, and her muscles spasmed. It was an amazing thrilling rush for her. As the high came down moments later, she noticed a familiar face above her. Not even thinking she grabbed the girl and pulled her into a kiss. One that was almost instantly returned. Their tongues dueled, creating little sparks of pleasure, while slimy hands suddenly pressed against her breasts. The cool slime felt great against her heated breasts, and when it started to knead the malleable flesh, sparks of pleasure rippled from the sensitive mounds. She moaned. Idly she considered how great having sex with this slime girl was. It was better than she thought. The pleasure ruled her mind, but she was still idly aware of what was going on. The slime girl was currently riding her, while Megumi was now pressed against her side, the two of them sharing a passionate kiss. While Mei was behind the slime with her legs spread, and enjoying the attentions of several tentacles, a tug on one of her nipples by slimy hands sent a burst of pleasure rippling through her flesh, but failed to stop her from noticing a new set of tentacles moving towards Megumi's avatar. Her pleasure-addled mind never considered why Megumi was here. Not until later, with a wet pop Megumi broke their kiss, and she gasped. At the same moment, she felt a spike of heat and a surge of sensation as someone's fingers found her clit. The probing fingers pressed against her clit delicately, stroking the nub with just enough force to feel good, but not painful. Each teasing stroke shot through her like lightning. Suddenly, like the crack of thunder she heard the loud moaning cries of May as the other girl went through an orgasm. She didn't let the pleasure distract her too much, as her own fingers soon found the lightly dressed breast, and slipped under the fabric, stroking the sensitive flesh of her partner. While at the same moment, the slime girl intensified her assault on Kairu's own boobs, Kairu moaned in response, greatly enjoying the attention. Her vision suddenly turned white when slimy hands tweaked her nipples seconds later, while down below the assault on her clit accelerated. Lightning shot through her mind, and she once again lost track of what was going on. Megumi rolled over. Her internal clock told her that several hours had passed since she got pulled into the orgy. It was quite enjoyable for her actually. The others were asleep, and her bioma cavitar had also needed to recharge for a bit, but her other instances had kept working on the plan. Base construction was on schedule, and in another room one of her holograms was giving Malia a lecture on Shinnik theory. That wasn't the only lecture she was giving. She was also lecturing a group of scientists on Solian emergency protocols. It was the standard lecture that covered the basic procedures of what to do in an emergency. She was even covering how to find and use the escape pods if needed. That thought reminded her that Kairu didn't know how to use those. It wasn't of high priority, but still something she might need to know. Chances are she never will use one. Hell, back during the war with the Dark Asians those pods were not often used. The fact that most capital ships like her had a gate meant that the crew usually evacuated via gate, not to mention. The Solians themselves didn't really need the pods, they were mainly for non-Solians who couldn't reach the gate or the shuttles. Well, mature Solians didn't need them anyway. Solians under 500 years weren't yet able to survive in the vacuum of space, but as a warship, she wouldn't have anyone that young aboard. A stirring beside her broke that line of thought. 
and she turned to see Kairu and Mei waking up, the slime girl whose name she didn't yet know was still quite passed out. She looked kind of cute, half melted into a puddle like that. Megumi did have a couple of questions for the little stowaway, but they weren't quite so urgent. Good morning, well afternoon. Sleep well? Kairu's eyes widened, and then she turned a bright red, if she was any redder, and this was an anime she might have had steam coming out of her ears, it was kind of cute. She stammered almost unintelligibly, but Megumi did catch enough, enough to know what she was trying to say, she ignored it, and prompted Kairu to check her notifications, Megumi already knew that Kairu had one from her implants, one of the kind that had also notified her, since it was a matter that would require her attention as well. Although Kairu might find that a little embarrassing, but it was her own fault it happened in the first place. Kairu froze the instant she looked at the notification. It seemed she had crashed. Megumi looked towards Mei, and while waiting for Kairu to mentally reboot said, We arrived at Neri a few hours ago. Get ready, and gather your sisters. I want you all going over the data as it comes in and working out our infill plan. I already have one, but I would like to see what you come up with. Consider it a test, and don't wait for me or Kairu. We will catch up in a bit. Mei nodded and hurried out. Not even bothering to get dressed, Megumi understood that nudity was quite acceptable socially, but she should have put on her uniform. She made a note to have a discussion with the girl later. She looked over at the still sleeping slime, and wondered briefly what she was going to do with her. When suddenly Kairu uttered one word, a question. How? While most wouldn't have been able to answer her, Megumi thankfully already knew the underlying context and could answer that, has to do with how the system works. And how slimes work, the system works by protecting your eggs. It does this by encasing them in a unique biopolymer derived from the Solian reproductive system, while simultaneously suppressing ovulation. The combination is overly redundant, but works very well. Slime seeding, however, doesn't work through both partners. You could be completely sterile, and the slime would still be successful with the seeding. The reason for this is because all of the genetic material comes from the mother slime. Kairu frowned. Can't the implant have done something to stop that? Megumi sighed. It did. It put them in biostasis, and alerted both you and me. Now I have some drones already setting up the medical bay for the removal procedure. Before you ask it's very quick and painless. Almost eagerly she said. You can remove them? How? Right now it's very easy. Your womb is filled with a slime compound designed to keep the fertilized slime eggs in there. I can inject your uterus with a simple compound designed to break it down. Then we simply open your cervix and drain the womb. It won't take more than 20 minutes. Your implants simplify the part where we open the cervix as they already connected to that little part of your body. As for the slime eggs, they won't be harmed by the procedure. I can easily transfer them into another host or a growth pod and allow them to mature. Although, alternatively, we could release the stasis and let them mature in your womb. It won't take very long. Only about a month before they are ready to leave your womb. Kairu turned red, and shook her head. I don't exactly want to be a mother, right now. Especially not for someone else's kids. I didn't think you would. Follow me said Megumi just as the door opened to admit a pair of security drones. Who promptly collected the sleeping slime. She had already arranged quarters for the unexpected guest, and the drones were to transfer her there. Kairu walked down the corridor. It occurred to her that the last time she had walked down this corridor following Megumi, it was for what Megumi had called a simple procedure. One that ended with her getting a full body modification, in addition to having her conditioning undone. Now she was once again following the ship's avatar to the medical bay for a simple procedure. This time though there was no armed guard, and she was actually in a state where she could consent to the procedure. Honestly, she was a bit unsure about this, but at least she had an idea of what the ship was going to do to her. Not that it made this time any better, it was her fault though. If she had known this might happen, she might have been a bit more cautious in regards to joining in with Mei and the slime girl she was having fun with. She did not know when the slime got to their quarters, but she remembered waking up to Mei and the slime going at it. It was honestly kind of hot, and she may have started playing with herself while watching. Then at some point, Mei noticed and invited her to join in, and by that point, she wasn't thinking straight anyway. Kairu in hindsight cursed herself for being stupid. It occurred to her that if she had thought to ask more about slimes and her implants that she would have known this could happen. Her eyes widened at that thought, she just realized that she had again failed to ask things she should have earlier. At least this time it wasn't too late. So Kairu found little reason to berate herself for not asking those questions. Instead, 
She opened her mouth and asked Megumi a question. 63 Chapter 39 Kairu's Day Kairu stepped out of the medical bay looking a little flushed. She had just finished having her womb drained of slime seeds. She had to agree with the ship that it was a simple procedure, but it certainly wasn't one she would have cared to repeat. The procedure really had only taken 20 minutes, and the first part wasn't so bad. The ship simply had her sit on a special chair. The Solian version of a gynecologist's chair. Strangely it wasn't all that different from the Nekia version. After she was settled, an injector was used to deliver the special fluid meant to break down the slime. It barely even stung. The part she didn't care to repeat was actually the part where her womb was drained. The how was simple and logical, but it was hellishly embarrassing as well. She didn't think any girl would be okay with having a thick tube inserted into their vagina, and used to pump bluish slimy eggs out. She certainly wasn't. Kairu made a mental note to be very careful with slime sex in the future. As fun as that had been, it just wasn't worth the regret and embarrassment that followed. Megumi stepped out of the medical bay at that moment, and pulled her into a hug. She felt herself relax into it. Especially once Megumi started stroking her head. After a moment or two Megumi calmly asked, Feeling better now? Her only answer was to push against Megumi. She didn't want to say this, but she felt like she needed the attention after that. It certainly made it easier to forget what she just went through. Still didn't change her newfound stance on slime sex though. Megumi must have read her like a book, because she responded, In that case, how about joining your classmates? They are currently working on our infiltration plan. Kairi let out a breath, and nodded. It wasn't what she was inclined to do right this minute. However her sense of duty prevailed, and it very much did need to be done. Yeah, let's get that out of the way. We can have fun later, she replied while stretching suggestively against Megumi. Megumi just giggled. Moments later the two were walking down the corridor. Today was going to be busy, and Kairu had a feeling that the following days would be as well. There was a lot to do before they infiltrated the world below. Although her mind already had a few questions that she hoped the meeting would answer, Kairu stepped through the door and found her classmates already discussing the infiltration plan. Although they seemed to be a few steps ahead of what she expected, as they were already discussing who would go where and do what after getting into the capital. Kairu frowned. Exactly how are you planning to get into the cities undetected? Megumi shook her head. The real trick is to get in without arousing suspicion. While a cloak can get us in undetected, it would be very suspicious if you just appeared in the middle of the city. Suddenly she manifested a second avatar, and that avatar gestured to herself. The very technology that allows for my holographic avatars does. However, suggest an answer. She blinked. You mean we are just going to walk into the city? Sail in actually. The gate complex is at the bottom of an ocean. With a bit of hacking and some holographic trickery, our transport can sail right into the harbor, and drop off our infiltrators. All while playing the role of an expected passenger liner, no one will think twice about it, and that will allow you and your classmates to simply slip into town without any undue attention. That made a certain amount of sense. She had to admit that much, but it did bring up a rather obvious issue. Passenger ships are expected to pick up passengers. True, but not on every voyage. Kyra nodded. That was true, although most of the time they were moving passengers. Then she thought of something else, as the ship wasn't her problem. Anyway, I think we will need some place to train. I doubt they really know how to fit in, especially considering what May thought was appropriate. I still don't know what she was thinking, painting herself like that. Megumi chuckled. Yes that was rather risky. Not really the norm, either. Not even among my creators who aren't known for being modest about their bodies. Then again, given their abilities, that isn't all that surprising. Both shapeshifters and telepaths are known to be less modest, but they are both. Speaking of them, I have heard a bit about them, and they seem to come off as a bit of a super race. And you are wondering if that is natural? The answer is sort of. Sort of? What does that mean? That is a rather long story but to make it short the Solians weren't born a spacefaring race. They were created, but not on purpose, millions of years ago. The proto-Solian people were an advanced single system culture that had not yet discovered the secrets of faster than light travel when they made first contact with an aggressive alien culture. What followed was a war they ultimately lost, and their home world was ravaged. A few ships survived, most importantly, three of them were outfitted with the first generation of warp drives. 
They left in search of a new home but faced a hostile galaxy. A few years later they were swallowed by a Hyperion storm and faced death due to its deadly radiation. To survive the Solian people turned to genetic engineering, but doing so also caused a number of unintended effects, a series of rapid mutations that ultimately resulted in the Solian people. Anyway, that isn't all that important, no, it isn't all that important right now, agreed Kairu. Now you mentioned training. And you are right. I have something to show you. It's on the list of things I plan to show you, but haven't yet. What's this about a list? Megumi smiled. Well for one, I haven't yet taught you about the ship's escape pods. While we shouldn't need them, an ancient piece of wisdom says that you should always be prepared, just in case the unexpected happens. Kairu had to agree with that wisdom. There was even a similar saying among the Neku. I guess that is true, although I can't imagine ever actually needing one of your escape pods. Megumi chuckled, you can't, but I can, I may be a match for any ship in the quadrant, but I am not invincible, nothing is. Even the vaunted Excaliburs aren't invincible, even if they are widely believed to be. Yes, those mighty super dreadnoughts are nearly impossible to destroy, but there are weapons that can penetrate their incredible shields, and carve through their armor. Kairu wasn't familiar with the Excalibur class super dreadnought, but it didn't seem important. Instead she agreed with the sentiment. She knew of several ships that were touted to be unsinkable or some such, and inevitably they eventually sank. Anyway, the escape pods and what else? Megumi smiled. The simulators. They employ a neural interface, and immerse the user in a full virtual environment. They have a few obvious training advantages. Kairu frowned. Why didn't we use them earlier? Because they are no substitute for intensive physical training. Again the reasons for that are obvious. Before you start asking a million questions, I am going to tell you a bit about them. Kairu stepped into the room with the simulators, and looked at the row of pods. Her mind was still considering what she had been told. Some of it should have been obvious. The pods were designed to maintain the user's body for long-term sessions. Without them, the user would face a number of health risks. Risks that were often associated with coma patients since they were factors known to occur with long-term immobility. It was well known after all that the body would deteriorate without a minimal level of exercise. The pod slowed that down significantly by putting the user in a form of biometric stasis. Of course being in a virtual environment, she had been wondering about an accelerated temporal rate. Unfortunately that turned out to be something not really recommended. Apparently producing a virtual environment with an accelerated temporal speed came with its own set of health risks. Not that she was entirely clear on what those were. Much of what Megumi had to say on the matter was beyond her. What she did understand was that brain damage and several mental disorders could be caused. Most of them are apparently associated with either prolonged or frequent use of a time-accelerated virtual environment. Sometimes both. Those thoughts quickly drifted to what else the ship had mentioned. She had apparently prepared a scenario to demonstrate the simulator. One she thought Kairu might appreciate. She was curious about that. Kairu made her way to the open pod. Megumi said that it would activate the moment she was in, and since this wasn't a long-term session, the stasis feature wasn't going to be activated. She slipped into the pod, and moments later the world turned dark. Within seconds she found herself in a small ship's cabin. There was a desk to her left, and on the monitor was what looked to be a brief. On April 13, 1471 SDE, the city ship Tokyo received an unusual distress call. Investigation of that distress call has brought the 17th fleet to a planet a mere 12 light years away from its previous position. It was the fourth planet in its system, and home to an indigenous culture. One that had not yet split the atom, and was in the midst of a global war. The source of that distress call was traced to an isolated lab in the middle of a besieged nation. A lab that contained a crashed alien ship. Soldier. You have been selected to be inserted into the area. Fleet Command does not want the locals to know of our presence, and as such you will not be issued any advanced weapons. Unfortunately we don't know much about their weaponry, and as such you must acquire weapons on the ground. Doing so will be important since the lab is under attack. Once you have a weapon, you are to determine the situation on the ground, and investigate the lab. Refrain from action with the locals where possible. The Alliance has no desire to get involved in a planetary war, especially with such a young culture. There was more, but it was merely to elaborate on her objectives. Kairu commented to herself, interesting. It's sounding like this is a historical simulation. There was no response to the comment. Not that she was expecting one. Megumi had said that she wasn't going to interact with her during the scenario. 
Now she just had to get to the shuttle bay. According to the brief, the mission starts as soon as she boards the shuttle. Thankfully, there was a map of the ship on the desk. She took a moment to memorize it, and left the room. She had a shuttle to catch, and she was curious where this was going to go. 58. Interlude playing with simulators. Kairu stepped into the simulated shuttle bay. Her mind went over the information she had just read. Much of it was on the information she needed on her objectives for this simulated mission. However, there was also a page on the character she was playing, and how to use her abilities. She was a Solian soldier nearly 800 years old in this scenario. The requirement of going unarmed wasn't too much of a hindrance. There was quite a bit written to give her an idea on what she could do. Apparently, Solian physiology was remarkably similar to that of a star dragon. Both species have the natural ability of star flight. And in addition to talons that can carve through modern ship armor, they also had the ability to breathe out plasma and discharge powerful bolts of electricity. Of course, in addition to those potent natural weapons, there was also their most powerful weapon, their magic. Honestly, magic was just mental powers so strong that they could bend reality itself to their will, not without cost mind you, as it took energy to effect a change. The bigger the change the more energy would be required, given the point in history. It came as no surprise that in this scenario her character was trained in ancestral magic, it was the oldest form of magic use, and more akin to a martial art than anything else. The ancestral arts as they are more commonly called focus on channeling the energy around the user into potent elemental attacks, the art also shields the user against the element they are channeling, and the art becomes more potent the longer the user is channeling. The arts were, simply put, focused on absorbing and redirecting energy. Unlike later magics, the ancestral arts didn't have spells, as for why it was no surprise her character knew ancestral magic. Well, apparently at that time the Solian people only trained in ancestral magic, hence the name. Kairu appreciated having that bit of history outlined in the available reading. On another note, she also noticed the only other form of magic known to the Solian people of that time was primal magic, which also didn't use spells. That note also said that the Solian breath attack was a form of primal magic. Although it didn't elaborate on the how and why that was, she was curious, but she guessed it wasn't important. What was important were a few of the little skills she noted that she had access to, and how they were used. In her mind the Solian shape-shifting abilities would be most key to the mission. The tricky part was getting what she needed to use them. Solians were apparently part of a group of shapeshifters called genetic shapeshifters. What that meant was that she actually needed DNA pertaining to a shape in order to assume that shape. Although she could make a few cosmetic changes without any DNA, so long as those changes were allowed by whatever genetic code she was using for her current form. As for how that DNA would be obtained, prolonged physical contact with a target was typically required. That contact need not be sexual, but contact of such a nature was noted to be faster. That meant to her, that as soon as she was on the ground, she would need to find a local, and somehow achieve prolonged physical contact with them. Not having a weapon, and likely being clearly alien would complicate that. Thankfully Solian mental abilities should compensate, their telepathy alone should be her most potent tool. Not just for the obvious either. It could also be a potent shield with which to hide her presence. She put aside those thoughts, and approached the shuttle, the one ready to take her below to the surface. It was of a design she was not familiar with, and she hadn't found any notes on Solian equipment of this age, nor anything of use on the locals below. It made sense though, she didn't need to know anything about the Solian equipment, and as for the locals she wouldn't have known anything about them that the Solians didn't know then. The shuttle itself looked a little old, and clearly needed a fresh coat of paint. Its hull was littered with scratches, scorch marks, and other signs of past battles. Someone clearly hadn't bothered to do much to clean the damage either. Kairu had to wonder why she was being sent down on a shuttle that looked like that. As she approached an officer spotted her, and greeted her before saying, I'm surprised that we still had one of these. Although she is in good shape, considering she has been mothballed for the last six centuries mothballed. I hope she is in working order then, but why dig a ship out of mothballs? I would think we have plenty of shuttles not in mothballs to send. We do, but Fleet felt this ship was best for the job. This particular variant of the retired 1205 series assault shuttles was outfitted with a modified cloak and engine scheme for stealth atmosphere insertions. None of our modern shuttles have that equipment, and it would take too long to refit them. We were able to get this one ready for the mission in a day. That she understood. Right ship for the job thing. 
It also kind of said that this was not something they did often, especially since the ship with the needed equipment had been in mothballs for six centuries apparently. I see. I trust she won't break while I am in her will she? The officer shook her head. No, she didn't need much work. And we triple checked all her systems. Everything is in working order. Although it helps that our ships require very little maintenance in the first place. Anyway she is mission ready. Kyra nodded, exchanged a few more words and then boarded the shuttle. It was time to see where this simulated mission was going to go. Moments later the shuttle left the bay. Given the nature of the mission, she was the only passenger. She found a seat in the cockpit and enjoyed the view. Not long after slipping out of the bay, she was greeted with the sight of a Solian cruiser. The hull, while not the same as the constellations, did share a few distinctive elements, including a dark paint job that made it much harder to make out. Rather, it would have, if it was in deep space, but here in a planetary orbit with the backdrop of a planet, and the strong light of the central star of this system, the ship was revealed in stark relief. What drew her attention was not the color or shape of the ship, but rather the features that pockmarked the hull mainly since they clearly didn't belong. The hull was riddled with scorch marks, furrows, craters, and other signs of battle damage. None of the damage appeared to be anything more than superficial. She shifted her line of sight, and soon spotted a second cruiser. Her hull similarly battle-scarred. Before long a third, and then a fourth vessel came into view. All of them battle-scarred. She said nothing. Kairu figured the fleet must have been in a battle recently, and not yet taken the time to do more than patch the hull. Then again her shuttle looked much the same way. Maybe the Solians were poor or something and that forced them to let slide battle damage if it wasn't something that would compromise the hull. However Kairu did not see it as important enough to ask about. Not right away anyway. When she was done, she made a mental note to ask Megumi about it. Little did she realize that the answer would surprise her. Before long the shuttle sat down quietly in a clearing not far from the lab she was tasked to investigate. The trees blocked line of sight, and the area was devoid of people. Kyrie looked around at the alien foliage. She wasn't really looking at it, but rather looking for anything that might be out of place. While the scanners had confirmed no one was here, that didn't mean that people wouldn't show up, or hadn't been in the area. While she didn't see anything, she could hear the sounds of fighting in the distance. Although, it did sound a little different from what she was used to, but not entirely unfamiliar. It took her but moments to recognize the sounds of explosions a sound common to battlefields of the modern era, but the other sounds were harder to place. It took her a moment to realize that she was hearing the sounds of kinetic weapons fires. With the sound in the distance as a guide, she slipped into the trees. Behind her the aged shuttle that had brought her down to the surface slipped into the air. Kairu didn't see it go, but knew it had. She wasn't worried about that, as she did have a method of contacting the fleet when her mission was completed. They would range extraction after that. In the meantime, her immediate concern was to locate a local, and a weapon, the first for information, and DNA. She needed the second in order to use her shape-shifting powers. As for the weapon, she would need that for defense. Moving from tree to tree, it wasn't long before she came across signs of fighting. Fallen trees, fires, burned out wrecks, and scattered corpses littered the terrain before her. Thankfully from her vantage point in the trees, she noted that there were no locals in sight. The fighting must have moved elsewhere. From the sounds, she could guess where. Somewhere to the north, closer to the lab that was her objective. A groaning sound suddenly drew her attention. It sounded close. Kairu had a feeling that she just found her local. She dropped from her vantage point, and began to search the area for the source of the groaning. She came across the blood, before she even saw the injured young man that was the source of the groans. He was a large bipedal creature at least two meters tall, muscular with thick powerful limbs. A long thin tail spread out behind him, and ended in a sharp triangular blade. His skull was crowned with a series of bony ridges, and two black horns. She had to admit that he looked fairly intimidating. But that was only if you ignored the clearly fatal wounds he had sustained. Kairu had no need to be an expert on his physiology to know that the man didn't have much longer to live. He was bleeding heavily. His one leg was clearly broken, and mangled with bones sticking out in all the wrong places. Most damning was the stomach wound. His belly had been split open, and if not for him holding the wound closed his guts may have spilled out. Saving him would be out of the question, as she didn't have the tools for it, and they were too far from a local hospital. Assuming she could find one, not to mention her other problem, Kairu instead decided to do the only thing she could think to do for the young man. 
She reached out with her mind and slipped into his. With a thought, she pulled him from reality and into dreamland. There she showed him paradise and shielded him from the pain. Kairu was pleasantly pleased with how easily the simulated world made using these strange powers. Telepathy was quite the potent tool as well. Not only was she able to give him a form of peace as he slowly slipped away, but she was also able to learn a bit about what was going on. The young man was a member of Varmalj, the military of one of the local superpowers. She was in the middle of their country, the country of Varmishar. The lab was actually one of their facilities, and that made the young man here one of the defenders. Although it was clear that the defense wasn't going all that well, his memories confirmed it and gave her a bit of background information. Even better, he had been in the lab, and knew a bit about what was going on, but knew nothing of the spaceship. Apparently, the country of Varmishha had been a defeated power who had been occupied and were being run into the ground by their neighbor, Polka. As Polka was after their vast natural resources, at least, they were until Polka's king had been assassinated twelve years ago. The resulting chaos started several small wars, and allowed Varmishha to throw off the yoke. Within two years, they had rebuilt, and they built this lab here around then. Not long after that, a number of wonder weapons began pouring out of the lab every few months. She had a feeling that it was about then that the ship crashed, and then the lab was built around it. What she did also note was that those weapons along with their natural resources had allowed them to quickly grow to dominance in the region. It also eventually led to the current situation. Kairu suspected that the attackers likely knew something about the lab, at least enough to detail its importance. She also knew who they were but it didn't seem to matter to her. Her objective was the lab, nothing more. Knowing the history was helpful, however, before she could learn much more. However the young man finally expired. Kairu took a moment to give him the proper respect, and then collected his weapons. She also took a moment to press her hand into his blood. After a few moments, that blood vanished, and she felt herself change into a female version of his species. It was an interesting sensation. Changed, she looked over what she had found from him. A rifle with two spare clips, and half of a third loaded. From his memory, she knew he had carried a few more, so they must have been spent in the fighting. She also found a few grenades, but no sidearm. At least now she was armed. That meant she would not need to use her special abilities to defend herself. Although she would have liked more ammo, however, she felt it more important to make for the lab, than waste time searching the nearby battlefield. It had been several hours since she left the young man, and she had finally made it to the lab. Darkness had fallen, and the fighting seemed to have ebbed with the setting sun. There was still some activity, patrols around the lab, and bunkers. She had even slipped past some armor about an hour ago, as they patrolled the roads. In front of her at the moment, was a barbed fence, a minor obstacle that she needed to slip past in order to get into the lab undetected. Going in through the main entrance likely wouldn't work too well. She didn't exactly have clearance, nor did she really know who did, not to mention, there were too many guards for her to influence with her telepathy. Thankfully security on this side of the building wasn't too tight, there were a few watchtowers, but she had already slipped past the spotlights. All that remained was getting past the fence, it was intact, and she didn't have cutters, but Kairu didn't need them. The Solian abilities she was blessed with in this simulated mission would get her past. She switched her stance and began following the mental instructions she had been given for ancestral arts. In moments, blue-green flames whirled around her forearm, and when she punched forward a blast of flame streamed into the fencing. She let the flames dissipate, and surveyed her handiwork. The flames had burned a hole in the fencing, one large enough for her to slip through, and into the base. Kairu stepped through, keeping to the shadows. She needed to get into the main building, already she was lining up a few mental objectives, the fleet was mainly interested in the wreck, and what it was doing here, they also wanted an assessment of its impact on the locals. Although she was already getting the picture, it had already accelerated technological development and fueled the rise of a superpower, they likely weren't using the wreck to its full potential, but their crude understanding of its technologies was already dangerous enough, Kairu was reminded of a debate she had often heard back home. It was of general consensus that pre-FDL cultures were generally not worth interacting with. It wasn't that they didn't have resources, but they tended to be lacking in things to offer. Although, there was a bit of interest in observing them from orbit. As for the debate, it was mainly over what to do with them. There was the exploitation camp that wanted to go down there and use the populace as cheap labor. 
The problem with that was not only was it morally frowned upon, but it was expensive to occupy a whole planet and enforce the kind of labor laws needed. Worse, tacked onto that would be the required education programs, especially for the more primitive pre-FDL cultures. It's why the relevant camp never got anywhere. Everyone else saw it as too expensive of an investment to be worth the limited gains, or simply didn't approve of that. As for the other camp, they wanted to uplift those cultures, feeling it was their moral imperative to aid these cultures. Again, it was an expensive endeavor. There also was the fact that the camp was also heavily opposed by a third camp. That one thought such cultures should be allowed to develop on their own. Not everyone agreed with them. Even if honestly the debate always ended up going their way. But that was only because everyone agreed that interference was just too costly for too little gain. She put the old argument aside as it didn't seem too important to the mission. She had found a side entrance into the main building of the lab. It seemed to be the perfect entry point, and no one was nearby. There were only two people in sight, and they were looking out away from the base. None of them were expecting a lone infiltrator. They were more worried about the hostile army practically on their doorstep. She tried the door. Well, almost, just as she was about to turn the latch, the door swung open on its own and she found herself face to face with an alien male. She reacted, her training kicking in. A loud thud resounded in her ears, as his body hit the floor hard. She returned the rifle she had been holding to its original position, and then went inside, briefly slinging the rifle to drag him in. She found the closet not too far down the hall and shoved him in there. It seemed like a good place to leave him. As she left, she briefly considered breaking his neck, but decided against it. Kyra knew he wasn't going to wake any time soon, and planned to be long gone by the time he did. As a just-in-case measure, she melted the lock as she was leaving. It occurred to her that he was a mind to interrogate, but unfortunately he was now unconscious. That was going to prove an obstacle even with telepathy. Might be easier to find someone else. Kyra tried to pay better attention to her simulated telepathic senses, however they were honestly a bit hard to get used to. She was starting to miss her senses. It had only been a few hours too, it thankfully didn't take her long before she found a young female alien bent over a desk in an office just down the hall. The young woman didn't even notice Kairu when she walked in, as she was too engrossed in her work. Kairu reached out with her mind, and found no real resistance. It took mere moments to learn what she knew, and Kairu left with the alien unaware that she had been telepathically interrogated. Kairu had to admit that the Solian telepathic abilities were useful for interrogation. Using the bit of knowledge she had discreetly pillaged, she made her way deeper into the facility. She now knew where to find the hangar. Kairu had also gleaned the best route as well. One that would give her minimal contacts on the way to the hangar. She also had an idea about an escape route after she was done in the hangar. A few hours later she was slipping out of the base, after a successful stint in the hangar. Some alarms blared behind her, as she had not been able to completely avoid contact with the locals. She had been forced to shoot a couple of guards. The kick of the rifle was not something she had been prepared for. She might have missed that first shot, if she hadn't been aiming center mass. She thanked her training for that. Kairu had been trained to shoot center mass, since that was a much larger target, not to mention there were quite a few vital organs packed there. In other words you were more likely to hit your target, and shots there are more lethal. At the moment she didn't seem to have any pursuers, so she may have given them a clean slip. She had managed to assess the ship these aliens had possession of. The ship was a few centuries ahead of the locals, but they had been able to glean some knowledge. Most notable were advances in rocketry, but they had also learned other concepts their own crude understanding of the technologies involved were the main limiters, they weren't really ready to take full advantage of what they had, she had already sent a report to the fleet, so far they hadn't responded, Kairu glanced over her shoulder, and saw no signs of any pursuers, not yet anyway, it might take them a little more time to realize she was gone, and where, suddenly, she felt another mind connect, the mind relayed some coordinates, and then said, Fleet has determined that we cannot allow that wreck to remain here. Long range sensors have picked up three small fleets approaching the planet. They will be here within the hour. We want you to reach that extraction point in the next 30 minutes. Good luck, Kairu read between the lines, and mentally exclaimed, they wouldn't. A moment later she muttered, would they? She didn't have to wait long before her question was answered. Just as she reached the extraction site, she looked back. It was just in time to witness a beam of blue-green energy strike the edge of the lab complex. An instant later she heard the roar of high-intensity energy weapons fire, a sound reminiscent of, but distinctly different from that of thunder, 
The tower structured the beam struck exploded in a shower of fiery plasma and chunks of melted metal and concrete. Seconds later, a second, then a third beam struck. Each strike announced itself with a thunderous roar, but not each strike was accompanied with an explosion. It was a sight she had never seen from the ground before, but she recognized it nonetheless. A precision orbital bombardment using a ship's beam weapons. After about a minute, she noticed the beams had stopped. Three bright blue stars however could be seen streaking right for the ruined complex, they struck with immense force, and exploded, the very ground beneath her feet shook, and a wave of fire rippled over her position, only to be stopped by an energy screen, behind her someone spoke, okay that should be enough, get aboard, we are getting out of here, Kairu turned around and boarded the shuttle that had just appeared, an act that promptly ended the simulation, and she found her VR pod opening, and Megumi was there to greet her, 50. Chapter 40 Distant Worlds and Preparation The young girl ran through the thick woods, sure-footed and swift. Her hair fluttered a bit in the breeze, she shifted to the left with the sure-footed grace of a dancer. An arrow sailed past her head and sank into a tree. She muttered a single word and pointed her palm flat towards the shooter behind her. An electrified shockwave rippled from her palm, hitting not just the shooter but anyone unfortunate enough to be in the path of her spell. She picked up the pace, certain that she could lose the zealots pursuing her in these woods. The young girl knew not what madness had caused this, but these woods were her home. She had lived and wandered the hills and forests of this land for decades. A sudden snap of wood alerted her to someone in her path. She dodged aside, avoiding a wild swing of a blade, from a man diving out from behind a tree. She muttered another word, and the sky erupted as lightning rained down around her. She had other elements at her disposal, but she dared not use fire or she would risk burning down her beloved woods. The zealot that had tried to slash her, shouted, Your foul tricks won't save you, witch. We will avenge your foul blasphemy against the gods. She suppressed the urge to sigh. These people had gone nuts. She wasn't even a witch, she was an archmage, and her only so-called blasphemy was that she was a true practitioner of magic and not a dragon channeler. These fools had turned their backs on the true gods, the Sky Lords and worshipped dragons. She didn't stick around to say anything, but instead took off. There was a safe house not far from here, she would be safe against this army of fools and zealots there. As she rounded yet another tree she caught sight of her safe house, but it seemed a few zealots had beaten her there. It would have been baffling how they managed that, if not for the flying mounts she spotted near them. It seemed she would have to fight her way in. She readied a spell but had to quickly switch to a shield, as a dragon channeling priest unleashed a stream of fire upon her. Apparently, these zealots had no qualms about burning the forest just to get to her. The young girl could see the shocked look of the priest through the flames that her shield was holding against his so-called divine flames. Likely many a lesser mage had died at his hands. Contracting with a dragon did grant powerful magic, but it paled when compared against the power gained by those who learned magic the right way. She had not taken any shortcuts and spent decades mastering the Sky Lord's gift to the races. Magic. Suddenly several more priests joined in, to barrage her shields with fire, lightning, earth, water, wind, nature, light, darkness, and even void. Forcing her to put all her effort into maintaining her barrier. This was a losing position, especially with the pursuers surely catching up. Her lightning storm should have faded by now and they would not be far behind. She had to think of something fast. The young girl heard the clink of armor just as a sword was thrust at her from behind. They had caught up already. The blade was aimed to kill her, but just before it made contact, her eyes started to glow blue, and her shield flared. The blade disintegrated, and then with a snap of her fingers chains of light shot up, and ensnared all present. The dragon magic stopped, and she had her breather. With a glare, she looked at the high priest of this mockery. Enough. You dragon clans, have gone too far, he screamed, what trickery is this witch? She scoffed, you call me witch, but know not what I truly am, the dragons are not the true gods, I am, you have hunted my mortal vessel and attempted to kill her, for that, the penalty is death, true death, there will be no next life for you, none of you. With another snap of her fingers, lightning rained down upon them all with unerring accuracy, in moments they were all gone, then she glanced at the flames and blinked. They were gone, and then the trees returned to the way they were. In moments there was no sign a battle had ever taken place. Muttering to herself, she said, Fools, guess I better do something more permanent about them before they disturb my slumber again. Perhaps a wall would do. Then she looked up, the glow in her eyes intensifying. <laughs> Interesting, 
Perhaps, I should do something else as well. Before I go back to sleep, Kairu stepped out of the pod. That session had been quite interesting, and it made her wonder what else Megumi had in her library. It was quite the unique experience, and informative in many ways. She already had a dozen things she wanted to ask about the pods, and what she could do with them. Megumi was standing nearby with an odd expression on her face. Kairu had been about to ask her questions, but instead, she asked, something happened? Megumi looked at her, more like something weird, I just received a telepathic hail, nothing too weird about that, except it's for you, and it's point of origin, a call for me, that does seem weird, replied Kairu confused, she had no idea who could possibly want to talk to her and that would know she was here, and was also able to communicate in such a manner, after a moment she asked, who is it from, and where? As she remembered the point of origin comment, the edge of known space somewhere in the Galt and Nivolt sector, in the galaxy of Valga, as for who, I am not entirely sure, they identified themselves as Ava Country, High Archmage of the Kingdom of Camisoli, I think it's an alias, but I am not sure who they really are, I have a few ideas, and I am pretty sure they are a member of the Countryman Clan, the ruling clan of the Solian Empire. Kairu had no idea who they were or why they would want to talk to her, but there was only one way to find out. She sighed, and said, put her through then. Only way we will figure any of this out is to talk with this Ava. Seconds later the figure of a young woman appeared in the middle of the room. The first thing Kairu noticed about her was her glowing eyes. They glowed a brilliant blue that seemed to speak of power untold. She was short, perhaps 130 centimeters tall, and very pretty, with smooth creamy skin and soft features. Her dark almost black hair was kept braided, and she was wrapped in medieval style scholar's robes. Megumi mentioned that you wanted to talk to me. Why? I've never met you before. Kairu was sure of that. She had never seen this woman before. She had a very memorable appearance. The woman, presumably Ava, smiled. No, we have not met before. Unfortunately our time is limited, and I have much to tell you. Both of you. Now young Kairu. I'm not sure you quite realized it, but during that simulation you almost actually channeled ancestral magics. Huh? What are you talking about? Megumi frowned. I do recall picking up strange shinnik readings in here, but I would remember seeing something like that. Ava giggled, that is because I interfered, don't count on me doing so again, though. Anyway, Kairu, while your potential as a modern mage is crap, as Megumi is no doubt aware, you have great potential for ancestral magic, which is something Megumi likely never tested for. The reason for this has something to do with your race more than anything else. Megumi sighed. Yeah, I didn't. Usually if you can't do modern magic you can't do any magic. Then she looked right at Ava. However, why are you mentioning this? It's honestly the lesser reason for why I am here. I am now uploading a few files to your core. It's nothing much, and won't help your immediate problem. I do. However, suggest you take a look at them. Kairu was a little surprised. You, Ava interrupted. Yes, I am fully aware of the subversion of the Neku Imperium, and who is behind it. However, I have other more pressing concerns. Among the files I just gave to Megumi is some information relevant to that. I didn't give you everything, though. Where would the fun be, if I did that? She paused for a moment, but before either could reply, she finished. I best be going. My time here is about up. Megumi, do complete the mission I uploaded to your core at the earliest convenience, and for the duration of that mission, Protocol 37A is suspended. Megumi frowned. Authorization is required for that. So it is. The necessary authorization protocols are already included. She glanced to the side, and said, Enact Code 17, Authorization Omega 47 Alpha Enable. She vanished, and then suddenly Kairu's vision was flooded with strange Solian text. It cleared after a moment, and she looked towards Megumi. What she saw was an expression she could only describe as a mixture of fear, respect, and something else. Concern. What was that? I think I know who she is now, or more accurately who she used to be. Only one person can authorize Code 17, and she used both of the needed verbal and psychic authorization protocols for it. Who? They are known by many names, many titles. We best not ignore whatever mission she gave me though. The last time she was ignored, Megumi trailed off. Kairu had a feeling it was bad though. 64, Chapter 41 A Briefing, and on to business. Kairu scratched her head, and after a moment asked, That sounds dire but who exactly are we talking about? That Ava girl used to be Supreme Protector Junthera Countryman, founder and ruler of the Solian Empire. 
I know not why she was pretending to be that girl, though. Anyway as I said she would best not be ignored. Last time she was ignored about dire portents. The Dark Asian menace struck, and by then it was too late to easily deal with them. Yeah that sounds dire, what does she want you to do anyway? Don't know yet. Haven't opened the files yet. Kairu shifted. Well let me know if it's something I'll have to worry about. She paused. Wait, what exactly was code 17? And what was protocol? Protocol 37A? It's a subsection of Protocol 37. Each section governs restrictions on the use of certain weapons. Section A specifically deals with Category B weapons of mass destruction such as my ASC weapon system. As for Code 17 it's an encryption protocol for classified information, one we both must abide by. Our entire conversation with Ava and anything related were ordered classified. Kairu frowned. Need I be worried? Not really, although the code will prevent you from speaking about what was discussed. In fact, until she ordered us coded, I couldn't even talk about the protocol itself. That sounds. She trailed off, and then after a moment, I'll go check on May. She turned to leave, when suddenly a second set of hollow projectors activated, creating an image of an office, with Ava leaning over the desk facing them. Kairu blinked, and Megumi commented, I opened the file, and you're sharing it with me? Before Megumi could respond, Ava began speaking, it has been a while since I have done one of these, so I will get straight to the point. Megumi, the constellation is currently the only ship available for the mission, and as such I am lifting the restrictions on your ASC weapons system. For the duration of the mission you may ignore protocol 37A authorization. I have also uploaded several different coordinates into your navigational subcomputer, along with tagging information. I have also included the locations of two ancient shipyards dating back to the Fallen War. The equipment would be somewhat dated, and they are in a state of disrepair, although they may prove useful for you. Of more immediate use to you, is the location of an unmanned outpost in the Varmark sector. You will need the security access codes, and I have already uploaded those to your core. You will find them in the next file. Review them at your earliest opportunity. Now, on to the mission itself. As soon as you conclude your business in the Neku Imperium you are to proceed to the nearest sector in the Galaxy of Tem. The sooner you get there the better, which is why in the list of coordinates added to your navigational subcomputer, I have included the location of two classified intergalactic stargates that I had constructed secretly. The needed dialing codes have been included. Do not reveal the existence of these gates to anyone below access code level Omega 47. Now you may be wondering why I mentioned this with Kairu in the room, and I will get to that in a moment. On to the mission itself. One of the local races of Tem was recently experimenting with hyperspatial physics, attempting to create a new form of FDL drive. Their experiment didn't go as planned, and they opened a rift into a parallel dimension. An alternate universe if you will. This rift must be closed. In addition, Megami, I need you to eliminate the machines that came through the rift. They are a rogue assimilator type of cybernetic machine civilization. They constantly seek out new technology and life forms to incorporate them into themselves. At the moment they are of little threat, but naturally if not nipped in the bud, they will become a problem. Although that will take a while, as their ships and technology is roughly equivalent to our own in the 5th century SDE. Now Kairu I have an offer for you. I have observed your futures, and while there is little I am willing to reveal. I have seen your potential. As such I am opening a path for you. If you accept, Megami will begin training you in Imperial tactics and technology. For what I am offering is the position of Captain of the Constellation. The current Captain Malia is not a true partner for Megami, and honestly she is a researcher at heart. She will gladly step aside if given the option, and lock herself in a room to pursue whatever project strikes her fancy. In fact, I think she would be happier if given the option. Right now you are the best alternative, but you are not ready for the command either. Hence the training I mentioned. Once completed, and Megami deems you ready, you will take command, assuming you accept my offer. However, do note that this means you might spend a great deal of time away from your beloved Imperium. Nor will you be serving in the Imperium's fleet again if you take it. Although you should also note that going back to the Imperium would mean giving up the gifts Megami has given you. Kairu was speechless, and didn't know what to say, not only that she wasn't sure what to think about the offer, the holograms cut out, and Megumi commented, I'll start devising a training program for you, she blinked, huh, why, isn't that premature, not necessarily, said Megumi with an odd grin, as if she knew something she was not saying, something about it made Kairu uncomfortable, 
so she quickly changed the subject about that mission of yours. She was cut off before she could finish. I don't think it will be a problem unless they happen to assimilate something a good deal more advanced than what they have now. Although I don't think Ava would have mentioned the other things unless she thought we would need them. You mean there is a good chance they will assimilate something advanced enough to make them a threat? Megumi nodded. Unfortunately yes, we will see how much later. But first we have to take care of business here in the Imperium. She ordered me to finish our business here first, and there must have been a reason for that. I'm glad she did though, as honestly I really do want to know what is going on down there. So do I. I have a few ideas, but nothing really concrete. Kairu remembered. Yeah we really need to get down there, further speculation on the matter won't help. We need more info before we can make any conclusions. Can't say the same about this other mission. Like about those shipyards. Think they will be of any use? Megumi scratched her cheek. <laughs> Maybe. I have no doubt they will need retooling first. But as long as the framework is intact that won't be too big of a deal. How much effort I need to spend on the retooling. However, depends on when the automated repair systems failed. So Solian yards of that era had self-repair systems? Megumi laughed. With rare exceptions the Solian people don't really build shipyards. Ship construction is typically done by city ships and yard ships. Yard ships being industrial vessels specifically designed for repairing and constructing ships on the move. In other words, mobile shipyards. In all likelihood the yards Zava shared are of Terran origin, since most sedentary yards in the Empire are built and maintained by the Terran people. As for those of Solian origin, the only one I know of is the Imperial Central Shipyards. It's where I was built. Now to answer the original question. All Imperial Yards regardless of race of origin have had self-repair systems since the founding of the Empire. Autonomous regeneration technology is not all that difficult to implement, especially on a shipyard, which is not all that complex. Self-repairing ships are a good deal more complicated. Due to the higher degree of complexity involved with starships. Only one? That sounds kind of weird. But given the nomadic past of the Solians I guess that makes sense. The Empire has only ever needed the one yard. The Imperial Central shipyards are massive, and very productive. Responsible for over half the Empire's yearly ship construction, and nearly 90% of all Imperial Heavy Capital ships are built in those yards. Although their exact location has always been a closely guarded state secret. One that I am programmed to protect at all costs. So don't ask me where they are. I wasn't interested. Then she glanced back at the simulator pods. I think I'll go check on May now. Then perhaps we can come back and practice our infiltration plan. Sounds like a good plan to me. Do keep in mind that I have an extensive library you can use if you get bored as well. Those pods can let you experience just about anything you can imagine. I'll keep that in mind, said Kairu as she slipped out the door. She was fully intending to make good use of these toys now that she knew of them. 56. Chapter 42 The Plan First Phase Kairu walked down the corridor. Today was finally the day they were going to infiltrate the capital. Over the last few days she had been practicing the mission in a simulator with her classmates. They had made some refinements to the plans, mostly on the boat that would be delivering them to the town. It was registered as a passenger liner. One that was placed as up for sale, and was being bid on by several interested parties. One of which already won, and this was going to be the last cruise it made before going private. As for the buyer. It was naturally Megumi, and all the parties were her as well. One thing they were going to do shortly after getting into town was to secure new routes for getting more infiltrators down to the surface undetected. There was a lot to investigate after all, and they could only get so far with just a handful. The more agents they could get into key positions the faster they could get the information they desired. Infiltration practice and planning wasn't the only thing she had done over the last few days. She had also gotten herself familiar with the VR pods and what they could do. Simply put, they could do anything she could imagine and more. They allowed the user to experience virtually anything imaginable, even things she had never considered or thought possible. Although she had a feeling she had only scratched the surface of what they could do. During her free time she had been exploring the astounding games it had to offer. They had proven interesting to play, some more fun than others. It was a shame she would not be able to play for a while. She put those thoughts aside as she stepped into the gate room, where Megumi was waiting. Surprisingly, also in the room was Melia, who was staring at the gate with interest. Megumi noticed her gaze, and commented. Melia simply wanted to see a Stargate in operation. I, on the other hand, have a few things to say before you leave. First may I ask if you have made a decision about Ava's offer, 
Kairu shook her head. She had thought about it, but it was a big decision. One part of her very much wanted to take command of a ship like this. It tickled her girlhood senses, but the prospect of not seeing her home or serving her people left her with trepidation. As such she was left adrift, with no idea which she should pick. Megumi sighed. I was afraid you would say that. Then she pulled something out, although, just in case, it might be best that we start on your education now. In many respects it's lacking by Solian standards, but that isn't your fault. I've loaded up an accelerated schooling program on this portable VR headset, appropriate for your general level of education and ability. Although, since I am not familiar with NECU schooling practices, I modeled the program after a Solian school. As for use, merely put it on before going to bed. It has been set to interact with your sleeping mind. For you, it will feel like a very vivid dream. Kairu gave her a look, and then glanced at the headset. Questions already blazing in her mind. Something about this felt weird. Hesitantly she took the proffered headset, and asked, Don't you? Megumi interrupted, evidently having anticipated what she was going to ask. Have access to a number of your brethren to ask? Yes, did I? Not really. While I did use a neural interface to interrogate them. I didn't just look at everything they know, I tried to respect their privacy where I could. I avoided early memories like schooling entirely. That actually made a certain amount of sense. I see. She glanced back at the set, I think this might be useful. Although little did Kairu realize that she would later regret not asking more about the program, instead she chose to change the subject. Anyway, you said Milia is here to observe. What part of gate operation is she interested in? Megumi shrugged, not really sure. I think she mainly wanted to see one in use, although to be fair I didn't ask. Why not? Her reasons for being here aren't all that important. Anyway you need to get going. We have a schedule to keep. Kyra nodded, and said, yes, right, bye, catch up later. Then she rushed along to join her classmates, just in time for the gate to activate. A swirling portal of blue-green energy that would instantly deliver her to its counterpart gate on the planet below. Kairu stepped through the gate with her closest friends May, and K she counted them among the good things that happened to her after encountering Megumi. Kairu did have to admit there was also something between her and Megumi. Although she wasn't sure what that was. Not quite yet. Kairu still hadn't quite figured out what had led to them having sex that one time. The mere thought of that encounter got her a little hot. And if she was honest, she would have admitted not minding having another one. Not that one would be happening soon. Perhaps when she got back, her thoughts on that came to an abrupt halt when she noted her surroundings. The architecture was familiar, but what had drawn her attention wasn't the structure. No, it was the view outside the window. The gate room was located at the top of a central tower that had a single glass dome for walls and roof. This provided her with a fantastic view of what could only be described as a city. It had a large central hub, and several attached outer hubs. Flowing metal structures gleamed under the light of a shimmering blue dome of energy that dome being what caught her attention the most. It covered the entire city, and it was clearly holding back the weight of the lightless oceans above. Keeping the city dry, and safe for those here, it was a rather fantastic sight. K suddenly said, an impressive sight isn't it? She nodded, and then a thought occurred to her. What if the shield fails? If the main generator fails, a backup would engage. A system that important naturally has multiple layers of redundancy, replied K May nodded, not to mention that each section of the city here would have its own shields as well. So even if the main shield did somehow fail, we should still be safe as long as the secondary shields hold. I guess that makes sense. Out of curiosity, would you two know what would happen if, by some chance, both the main and secondary shields failed? Automatic systems would deploy a hard pressure dome around the city in the event that imminent shield failure was detected. The Empire values safety and reliability after all. Not to mention it was specified in the outpost plans that Megumi made available to us. Did you not at least peruse them? Said K sheepishly she shook her head. I was. Preoccupied with other things. May nodded. Yeah you seemed really in love with the simulators. Every time we looked you were playing with them. K sighed. Yeah you were spending perhaps a bit too much time in the simulators. Then again those things are known to be addictive. Maybe being away from the ship for a while would be good for you. Kairu gave them both a look. You two are making it sound like I'm addicted to them or something. K gestured towards the door, and they started walking. While May interjected, well, they're known to be addictive. K just nodded. She found herself letting out a breath, 
but she didn't feel like arguing with her friends, especially when they already seemed convinced she was an addict. No amount of words was going to change their minds, she was sure of that. Kairu figured it would pass. It never occurred to her that they were merely teasing her. Besides, they had to get to the city's port in time to catch their ship, while it could technically wait for them. They had a schedule to keep, one that had already been made, and it was best to stick to it. They soon were talking about other things on their way to the city's port where the transport that Megumi had arranged was waiting. The change in topic was very much a relief for Kairu. Instead much of the conversation was on the short sail into the capital. Something Kairu was very much looking forward to. It wasn't long before they reached the harbor. Kairu couldn't help but stop and look around. Gawking like a tourist, but in many respects she very much was a tourist. Not to mention the harbor had this out of place feeling. Especially when you considered the fact that the city was at the bottom of an ocean. Yet its port looked not unlike those of any port town on the surface. It even had water where a few ships floated, docked to the piers. One ship in particular caught her eye because it looked like a typical Neko passenger liner. Naturally she knew it was not. In fact she already knew it was holographic trickery, and the ship was more akin to a sub. Although since the projectors were active Kairu was unable to determine what it actually looked like. Everything she knew about it was what little Megumi shared. Admittedly that wasn't much. She knew it had shields and a strong hull, but knew nothing of its engine configuration or weaponry. In fact she didn't even know if it was armed. Although if things went to plan they wouldn't need any weapons. She didn't have long to look, and at the prompting of she rushed to board the ship. Once aboard she would have time to ask a few questions, and look around. They wouldn't be arriving for a few hours anyway. But they did need to be aboard so the ship could depart on schedule. 52. Chapter 43 First Day in the City Kairu stretched as she stepped off the boat. It had been a long and mostly uneventful trip. She had spent most of the trip playing games with Mei and K. They had played a few rounds of card games and a couple of board games. Even tried out a couple of video games. A few of the games had been quite interesting, but eventually they got bored of games. After the games, Kairu had curled up with a data pad and started reading. She had picked one of the historical novels that Megumi had recommended. She was learning quite a bit about early Solian history. Some of what was covered she already knew, such as the fact they were nomadic, and lost their original home world. The novels however revealed more to her. Not much of real note but there were a few highlights. She had recently been reading about the Solian interactions with a race known as the Scytha. The Solians first encountered them early in the year 313 SDE. Although these were minor encounters, it wasn't until the following year that any notable interactions occurred, as a number of skirmishes occurred between the two species in that year. At the time, the Solian fleet was still largely reliant on updated versions of the aging 1204 Starfighter, a space superiority fighter that was over 300 years old. Despite its age, the 1204 was a very effective craft and performed many roles in the Solian fleet. It was used heavily for escorting raiders and protecting their ships from hostile light craft. Its modular design allowed it to be outfitted for a variety of roles, and it could even mount a very effective micro-torpedo launcher that was effective against small starships such as corvettes and frigates. Against the Scytha however, the aging 1204 proved inadequate. The Scytha specialized in fighter craft, and had designed several very effective starfighters that could outperform or at least match Solian equivalents including the 1204, their mainstay fighter. The Xanthos, was a particularly tough, and much newer fighter. The craft was often equipped with high-energy pulse tetrapasic particle cannons, and multiphasic torpedoes. The hull was well armored. In addition, the craft was also shielded with high-powered fighter shields, and it employed a reactionless main drive. In contrast, the 1204 had no shields, was equipped with high-energy phased particle cannons commonly referred to as phase lances and miniaturized AMF plasma torpedoes or photon torpedoes. It too featured a reactionless main drive, but unlike the Xanthos, it also had FDL capability. Both fighters had the ability to mount light missiles for use against other fighters and were equipped with countermeasures for missiles. In battle the two craft actually performed very similarly, with the 1204 having a slight edge due to its ability to warp. This however was wholly unacceptable for the Solians, as their nomadic nature made it much more difficult for them to replace fighter losses, a fact the Solians became very concerned about after a few disastrous skirmishes with the Scytha over the course of the year 314 SDE. 
The Solian response was to naturally look at improving current fighter designs to compete with the more numerous Xanthos fighters employed by the Scytha. The natural first place they looked for improvement was their armor. Solian armor in that era was really good, but the tetrapasic particle weapons employed by the Scytha were able to penetrate it. Kairu didn't know why though since she wasn't familiar with tetrapasic particle weapons, or Solian armor. The book had just been about to explain that bit, when they had pulled into port. Pushing those thoughts aside, she looked around the port. It seemed normal enough at first glance, nothing seemed out of place, and the few conversations she could hear sounded normal. The nearby docks were all dedicated to passengers, and their ship wasn't the only ship offloading passengers. The only thing she noted as odd was that everyone getting off the boat was female. She hadn't seen any men, in fact she didn't see any among the workers either. It seemed odd to her, she quietly pointed that Ataku was standing next to her, Kr replied in a low tone of voice, I noticed, it does help us blend in a bit, though, she nodded, it does, our party being all female would have stuck out if there were more men around, there wasn't much more to say, not in public anyway, but she took a moment to look over the women they passed as they headed out of the port, nothing seemed out of place, but then again, she didn't know any of them, so there was no way to tell if little things about them had changed. Perhaps they would see something more interesting, in the city, rather than here in the port? Kairu had a rather strong feeling that they would find something in the city. She doubted an empire-wide brainwashing force would be completely invisible. It wasn't long after they left the port that she spotted an oddity. The oddity wasn't with her fellow Neku but rather with the people in the streets. She had noticed an alien she was not familiar with, one she had never seen before. That alone wasn't enough to consider the alien an oddity. Aliens were not common in the capital, but a few tourists could be spotted here and there. Some of these tourists might even be attached to diplomatic entourages, but the diplomats themselves typically stuck to the embassy district closer to the city center. As such, most aliens in the capital were either at the embassy district or near the starports. The alien she spotted was bipedal and stood around 150 centimeters tall. It was female, and entirely naked. The weird part was that people were treating that as normal. Its skin was a pale green, except on the belly and face where it transitioned to a creamy white. She had large expressive purple eyes, and a round heart-shaped face framed by shoulder-length dark hair. The only hair on her body in fact. Her ears were pointed and prominently featured, reminiscent of early ears but larger. One feature that Kairu really noted was that she had six tentacle-like appendages stretching out of her back, and no arms. Also of note was that she had four pairs of breasts, although the lower pairs on her belly were less prominent, barely more than little bumps, while the upper pairs were more developed. Overall she had a lithe figure, and her legs looked like those of a fellow runner. Kairu had an urge to challenge the girl to a foot race. Naturally she would have to limit herself to natural necky limits if she did, Kairu wasn't going to though. Another thing Kairu noted was that the alien seemed young, but she moved with power and grace. There was an aura of confidence presented with her every step, and she looked upon those around her as if they were beneath her. As they drew closer, Kairu noticed as the alien approached a young woman and her daughter, the alien smiled, and knelt. She said something then, but Kairu couldn't hear what was said. It seemed friendly though as the mother seemed pleased with what was said, as for the girl, she seemed happy as well. She said something back, and a few more words were exchanged. Then something really odd happened, not with the alien, but the bear. The mother suddenly began stripping her daughter down, and the girl cooperated, helping her mother remove her clothes. The weirdest part was that no one stopped. They simply walked past the bizarre scene as if nothing was happening. As soon as the girl was naked, the alien grabbed her hand with one of its tentacle arms, smiled, and said something to her mother. Her mother nodded, said something back, then proceeded to pack away her daughter's clothes in her handbag. At the same time, the alien led the girl away. Kairu decided to follow. She restrained her desire to dash off immediately, and signaled her intentions to her friends. They had also seen this strange sight and were inclined to follow as well. However they had other objectives to complete in the city, K told her, go ahead, we are also curious about that, we'll catch up later. She knew what those other objectives were, they had to secure lodging, and scout out a few spots of interest in the town, so Kairu wished them luck, and split away to follow the alien, the stand naked alien, and the young girl she had in tow had already slipped out of sight in the crowd, for Kairu however, that was not a problem, her internal senses were already keeping track of the bear. Kairu navigated the crowd following after, 
but keeping out of sight. She didn't want them to know she was following them. She would have considered cloaking so she could follow them at a closer range. But there were too many people. Someone would be bound to notice her cloak in the middle of this crowd. It didn't help that they had arrived during the busiest hours of the day. On the other hand, this large number of people served to hide her quite well from her target. Kairu followed the odd pair through several crowded streets, until finally the pair turned down an alleyway. The alley was reasonably clean and well-maintained indicating a more well-off region of the city, but there were very few people in sight. The only souls in sight were the odd bear, and one person dumping trash into a dumpster. She saw the bear halfway down the alley. When she entered, Kairu glanced around and noticed no one looking her way. She cloaked as the enhanced Nekya knew that this alley represented a much higher chance of being noticed than the crowded streets. It was just in time too, as the alien female looked back, her bright purple eyes sweeping over the alley. A strange expression appeared on her face. The girl shook her head, and then continued on her way. Kairu didn't know what to make of that, and followed after her. The alien and the young girl she was towing along continued across the alley, and entered another street. One less busy than the one they entered the alley from. There were still a fair number of people around, but the street wasn't packed. This made progress easier. She closed the gap, while remaining careful to avoid bumping into people. She still brushed against a few people as she passed, but nobody seemed to realize that they had just brushed against an invisible girl. The pair she was following finally stopped in front of a small building. It was a clinic a perfectly ordinary looking clinic, with a few people going in, and some leaving, there were a number of people that could be seen waiting inside the reception room, the pair entered the building, and Kairu followed them in, inside Kairu noticed that the receptionist was another naked alien of the same species that she was following, the alien signaled the receptionist, who smiled and nodded, she excused herself from the woman she was talking to before, and proceeded to a small door which she opened, the pair headed through, and Kairu followed them closely, slipping in just before the door was closed. Already she was wondering what the alien was planning to do with the little girl she had with her, and was also wondering why her mother had let the alien take her. Before she could get her answer, the alien stopped and looked towards her. She swept the area, and that same odd expression from earlier showed up on her face. It looked kind of cute honestly. The alien sighed, I must be going crazy. 55. Chapter 44 May's Observations, and Kairu's Experience in the Strange Clinic While Kairu was following the strange bear, May had followed the young girl's mother. The woman at first just went about her business as normal, as if she hadn't just let a strange woman take off with her naked daughter. May took the time to observe the crowds while the woman was taking care of her shopping. Just like at the port, May noted a distinct lack of men that seemed like an important oddity to her, and raised an intriguing question. Where are all the men? Now that she was looking for them, she also occasionally spotted members of the same species that had taken the daughter of the woman she was following. Some of them were alone, but others were often leading a naked girl along. Some of these naked girls were children, others were older. A sight that raised more questions. Both the aliens and the girls they were taking were always naked, yet no one in the crowd seemed to pay any real attention to this. May had her suspicions on how and why they were ignoring this. They had even ignored that rather bold kidnapping and the mother was acting normal. It was weird, but at least she hadn't observed another one. Just evidence that more may be happening elsewhere. She stuck to following the woman though, seeing as Kairu was already following one of these kidnapping aliens. May had a feeling that something interesting would happen. A feeling that was rewarded when the woman finally went home. May cloaked herself when the opportunity presented itself and followed her inside. She started by putting her shopping away, and then she suddenly pulled a few large boxes out, and a pen. She set them up in the main room and labeled them. One box was labeled for donation, the second for sale, and the third for storage. May then watched the woman head to a bedroom. With a mere glance, she could tell it was her daughter's bedroom. The woman headed straight for the closet and began pulling out the clothes. Most of them were promptly dumped in the for sale box, but some of the clothes were dumped in the donation box. Once the closet was empty, she went for the dresses, emptying them out into the boxes. None of the clothing went into the storage box. It was all either the for sale box or the donation box. Finally, the woman pulled her daughter's earlier outfit out of her handbag and dumped the entire outfit into the for sale box. May watched the whole thing, and found it odd. It seemed she had found an answer to one question. Why did the alien have the mother take the outfit? It seemed that the mother was disposing of anything the alien didn't want. She was also doing the at-home cleanup with clothes out of the way. The mother moved on to bedding, 
dumping that into the storage box, followed by toys, all of which ended up in the donation box. Then she started collecting things that seemed personal, photos, art projects, and knickknacks all of which were promptly packed into the storage box. It seemed to May that the woman wasn't expecting her daughter to come back, at least not anytime soon. When she was done, the woman headed to the house com terminal and contacted someone. May found this particularly interesting, as the figure that appeared on the com screen belonged to one of those suspicious naked aliens. The woman spoke first saying, I've finished packing up my daughter's stuff. The lady said to contact you when I was done. The woman glanced at something, and then said, good, someone will be by shortly to collect it, wait by the door until they arrive, and leave it open, the woman nodded, ended the call, and headed for the door, May glanced at the companel and noted that she had also sent her address and a fair amount of personal information to the alien, it had been included in a text packet sent with the opening of the call, she then glanced at the front door, the woman was already standing by the door, and she had it wide open, Nothing else seemed to be happening, but May decided to stick around. She wanted to see what would happen when this person they were sending came by to collect. Would it be one of the aliens or someone else? The answer to the question was one she didn't have to wait too long for. A large truck landed about half an hour after the woman had contacted the alien. A young neck you female came out of the vehicle, entirely naked. Well, save for a single belt with a small pouch on it, along with a few tools. She sauntered up to the door, and glanced at the mother. Then she looked at the boxes, the the stuff, the mother nodded, and the girl replied, All right then I'll load it up, stay right here until I am done. We will send you the location for the storage. In a few days, along with the service bill, the girl walked up to the storage box first, and sealed it. She added a label to it and then activated its anti-graph. It was the first item taken out the door, and the mother stood by the door like she was told. May read the label as the girl pushed it past her cloaked form. It contained all the personal information she had seen sent, and included instructions. The donation box was next. She simply sealed it. No label was added to it. The for sale box was last. The girl first looked through its contents before neatly folding them back in. She was remarkably quick about it. Then she sealed it, and added a label, before taking it back to the truck. As she passed the mother she said, We'll contact you when we've finished selling this stuff for you. The woman nodded, while the girl just loaded it onto the truck. When she was done, she came back to the door. That is everything right? The woman nodded again, and the girl happily replied, The Anaira I thank you for your cooperation in this matter, and ask that you don't think of your daughter until we tell you otherwise. She will be fine in our care. You may go back to your normal life, and forget this happened. May slipped out the door as the woman said, I'll do just that. She slipped into the house, and it was the naked necky woman who closed the door. Before heading over to the truck, May watched her climb into the cockpit, and the vehicle lifted off. She had considered following her or joining her in the cabin. Instead, she had merely tagged the vehicle and the girl with cloaked tags. This was a lead they could follow up on later. May went her own way. She needed to rendezvous with Knau. She was close to a point of interest though, so she figured she would scout that first, and then meet K at whatever lodgings she had arranged. With those words, the alien turned back and led the girl down the hall. Kyrie let out a breath. It seemed the alien was somehow aware of her, but couldn't actually find her. With a thought as Kairu followed down the hall, she opened a cam channel with the ship. A holographic image of Megumi was projected in the upper right corner of her HUD, a window expanding to cover the graphic that detailed her defensive armament. Normally it would either cover her sensor display in the lower left corner or take up her full vision, but she had overridden the default. She was using the sensor display at the moment, but not her weapons. If she needed to use a weapon that would mean she had messed up, Megumi listened to her quick report. She frowned and replied, it is possible that she is sensing you, your personal cloak protects you from all normal senses, but if she has shinnok ability she may have shinnok senses that are picking you up, can something be done to hide me from those, preferably right now, she asked while following the alien up a floor, Megumi sighed, without a specimen, not really, I would need to know exactly what shinnok senses they have, and their frequency range in order to produce a proper shinnik shield for you. Your cloak and implants already include general shinnik protection. I could attempt to adjust them but that is a risky proposition. Kairu replied, I see, I'll just deal with it as is then. She had understood the subtext there, the general protection was likely the reason why the alien hadn't found her already, it knew she was here, but couldn't find her, if the shielding was adjusted, however, 
it might help or if Megumi's guess was wrong she might end up more visible to the alien's psychic senses. She closed the channel just as the alien opened the door, it revealed a small room with a bed, a bookcase, and a small table with a pair of chairs. The alien ushered the young girl into the room with a smile on her face. Wait here, there is a box of kid toys under the bed in case you get bored. Someone will come by to get you when we are ready for you. This seemed interesting to Kairu. She watched as the girl headed straight for the bed, and pulled out two boxes, a large box clearly labeled in large block lettering kid toys the other smaller box was labeled in same block lettering adult toys. Naturally, the girl opened the small box first. As she pulled out a modestly sized egg-shaped device with a frown the alien giggled. Try the other box. I think those toys will be more to your liking. The girl dropped the egg, closed the box, and went right for the other box. Kairi watched her rifle through the box. Her expression was one of joy. The alien stood at the door a moment longer watching her and then closed the door. Kairu didn't see what toy she ultimately picked. The alien walked down the corridor seeming rather pleased. Kairu glanced at the door, and then followed the alien. The alien headed straight to a strange room. It was dominated by a strange chair in the middle of the room. Another young girl was currently strapped into the chair. Various sensors were hooked up to her body. She was surrounded by several other aliens. One of them was inserting a new probe into her, while another had its tentacles wrapped around her head. Kairu had no idea what she was seeing. The alien spoke. I found another young one with potential. I just left her in room 237. How are things going with this one? The one with her tentacles wrapped around the girl said. She is responding well. We should be done in a few minutes. We can look at your catch then. This sounded very interesting. It seemed she had found something of real interest all right. She still had many questions, and this was opening new ones as well. Kairi moved around the room, careful to keep her distance from the aliens while observing what they were doing. She didn't know what they were doing to the girl, but she didn't think it was good. A few moments later they seemed to finish, and a couple of them began to unhook the sensors. While a third removed the probes they had inserted, some of which were rather strange. Kairu didn't know what to make of what she was seeing, but perhaps Megumi would. Once all the devices had been removed from the girl's naked body, the aliens released the restraints, and the alien wrapping her head let go of her. The girl slipped out of the chair, and stretched a bit. Then one of the aliens said, go to your assigned room. One of us will visit you later for some tests. The girl nodded and complied, slipping out of the room. Kairu had no doubt that she was going to do exactly what she was told, as the aliens seemed confident that she would as well, and from what she had seen they had every reason to. As the door closed behind the girl, the first alien that Kairu had followed swept the room with her gaze again. That odd expression on her face again. One of the others gave her a look, and she looked back. Kairu had a strange feeling that they were communicating. The first alien frowned, sighed and then aloud commented. I think this is stupid, but is anyone there? Kairu stayed silent. That was an obvious baiting. And she wasn't going to reply. There was no reason to speak. She had questions that she would love to ask them. But now wasn't the time. In fact she was burning to act on what she was seeing, but held herself back. Again she knew that it was not yet time to act. They needed to know more before they made their move. Not to mention she had every confidence that Megumi could undo whatever it is they were doing to these girls. After a moment the first aloud, said, I told you it was stupid. The one she directed the statement shouted back. Well I don't believe anyone is in the room in the first place. I sure don't sense anyone. Do you three? The other three shook their heads. Kairu found this little conversation quite illuminating. It seemed the general shielding was working quite well. Perhaps the first one was just more powerful than the others and could therefore sense her. Whereas for the rest, she was completely invisible. She glanced at the door. It seemed she had learned enough already, but at the moment she couldn't leave. Kairu found a clear spot in the corner and watched the aliens argue. It was certainly entertaining, especially when objects started floating around the room. It seemed Megumi was right. These aliens were shinically gifted. Now she just wondered if they would answer any of her other questions, like what exactly they were taking these girls for. The first alien had mentioned something about potential but potential for what was the question. It seemed to factor into why they took her, but without knowing more she couldn't guess. 50. Chapter 45 More clues at the strange clinic, after a while the five aliens finally stopped arguing. The first alien that she had followed seemed to be pouting. It was honestly kind of cute. Kairu had an urge to tease her but pushed it down. She was well aware that now wasn't the time for that kind of thing. Instead, she merely observed them from the corner. 
the second alien that had effectively started the argument, and seemed to be the leader of this small group, looked at one of the others. She signaled to that one, and she slipped out the door. Kairu would have followed, but there wasn't an opportunity. Thankfully that alien was back before long, and to Kairu's interest. They had brought with them the young girl whose blatant kidnapping had prompted Kairu to follow the alien here. She was led to the chair, and ordered to sit down. She did without a word, and the alien started hooking sensors up to her body. Several were attached to her head, a few to her chest and belly, along with a couple on her arms and legs. Once the sensors were secure, the aliens activated a monitor. The second alien muttered, let's see what her potential is. This seemed promising. Maybe she would be able to learn what they meant by potential. If she does, it would have made this little detour very productive indeed, as it would give them a major lead on what exactly these aliens were doing in the Imperium. Nothing good. She could tell that much, but there was a lot they didn't know. That lack of information was why they were here though. As things were, this was the best place to find out. In fact they had barely been here a day, and they were already finding clues and new leads to explore. She was quite happy with what she had learned already. After a moment the second alien turned to the first who was still pouting. Well you may be delusional, but at least you are doing your job right. This girl has rather high potential. It will take a few sessions to properly awaken it. The pouting alien shot her a glare. I'm not delusional. I'm certain of it. Someone is watching us. The second alien laughed, and said in response. Tell me again. Who could possibly be watching us here of all places? She was silent. Kyra knew why, because she didn't know. The young alien female may have been able to sense her, but she had no idea who she was, nor did she know anything about who she might be connected to. You can't answer that, can you? That's because no one is watching us, she pouted. Believe what you want then. Anyway, what are her affinities? The second alien pointed at a few data sets on the monitor. She has a fairly high potential for lightning and fire. She also has a moderate potential for earth. The first alien smiled. I found a good one then, Kairu blinked, she finally had an idea about what they were looking for, she had been on the constellation long enough, and had enough conversations and reading on the subject, they were discussing Shinnik potential and her capacity for magic, the question now became why, why were they hunting down women with Shinnik potential, a number of other questions she had were still unanswered, but she now had one more answer, well, I'm going to log the results of her assessment, why don't you start on her programming? The first alien nodded and approached the girl, wrapping her tentacle-like appendages around the girl's head. Kairu had seen this before, and based on what was said, had a feeling that this was somehow related to how they were brainwashing people. Perhaps something like this had happened to her? There were enough blank spots in her memory for it to be possible. Kairu could only guess what they had done, and were planning to do to her though. In some ways, she owed Megumi for rescuing her from whatever fate these mind-controlling aliens had planned for her. While idly wondering about what the aliens had done to her and might have been planning she also noticed as the three silent ones moved in near the first, entwining their tentacles with the first aliens. That seemed interesting, Kyra noted it as something likely to be important, and added it to the report she was already writing. Having implants was so very useful. They certainly made her life easier, she could cloak if she wanted to, and could even walk through force fields. Having a computer in her head also allowed her to take notes in the field, without having to bring along a pad or sacrifice a hand for the task. It occurred to her at that moment that if she was given a choice of going back to being merely Neku, she would not take it. She very much liked her enhanced capabilities. Nothing more of note happened in the room. A few minutes later the aliens unwrapped their tentacles from the girl. Then they unhooked the sensors, and let her out of the chair. Then one of them escorted her out of the room. The first alien also left the room, and Kairu followed her. She had already proven interesting, and she knew that she was the one most likely to eventually head outside. As it turned out, she wasn't going anywhere else in the clinic. Kairu ended up following her right out the door. Kairu had already learned quite a bit, and didn't think there was more to be gained from following her on the street. Not at the moment anyway. Instead, she used a tool on her belt to tag the alien she had been following with a cloaked tag. She fully planned on checking up on this particular alien again at a later date. Kairu also figured she would be a prime target for acquiring a specimen. One of their objectives down here was to capture one of these aliens, alive. They needed them alive for a number of reasons. In the meantime, she had to meet back up with May, and K while the others had been out cracking on the first leads of the day, K had gone to secure their lodgings, they were going to need a place to stay in the city after all. 
Thankfully she was only responsible for herself, Kairu, and Mei. The others that came on the boat were responsible for their own groups. In her hunt for lodgings spoke to a number of young women on the street. Like Mei she too noticed the distinct lack of men everywhere she went in the city. That raised an interesting question but one she didn't need to pursue right this instant. Her hunt took her to an area not too far from the port. This part of the city had several inns, and apartments, and was also not too far from a major market in the city. The locals had good things to say about this part of the city, and at first glance she had to agree. The streets looked well maintained, the storefronts were immaculate, and the buildings pristine. The area was clearly well off, but it wasn't a high class area either. This meant that the lodgings around here were more affordable. Megumi had given them a sizable account, but it was by no means huge. It was enough to get them lodgings, and supplies for a few weeks. An area like this was perfect as the living would be comfortable, and there were a number of points of interest nearby, including the strange clinic Kairu was investigating. Not that knew that, the building soon found herself looking it was a modest apartment building. It was a four-story building with several available apartments to pick from, and they offered a few amenities. Figured they could make use of those as an excuse to mingle with the residents, and maybe learn a bit of what is going on in the capital. Kairu might complain about a lack of space to run with, but there was only so much she could do on that front. At least the building had a gym with its own track, so there was something for Kairu. Kid arrived at the building around noon, where she had been greeted by the receptionist. A friendly enough necker lady who got her in touch with someone to give her a tour of the building, and the apartments that were currently available. There had been several to pick from, but she eventually settled on a three-bedroom apartment on the third floor. It was the largest available apartment, and she had a hard time passing it up. It would be comfortable for them, and even provide them some privacy if they needed it. Not to mention she felt Kairu would like it. It might make up for the lack of real space to run in the area. After that, she spent most of the afternoon working out the details with the apartment manager down in an office on the first floor. When she was finally finished she had messages waiting from both May and Kairu stepped out of the office for the manager, and stowed the rental agreement for their new apartment in her bag. She had managed to get a decent deal on it, and it was now paid for till the end of the month. Her ability to put down a sizable amount of credits had allowed her to get it cheaper than she would have otherwise. Although it had taken a while of negotiating with the manager. Checking her cum log, she found messages from Kairu and K with a thought. She sent them details on the lodgings she had secured and told them to meet her at the apartment. Then she headed on up, planning to wait for them in the apartment. But as she stepped into the elevator, she noticed a naked neck you girl in the elevator. She had seen a few already, but every time before they had been accompanied by one of the aliens. This one was on her own, and to further set her apart was that she was holding a clipboard, and wearing a belt with a few tools, and a small pouch. It was the only thing she was wearing though, nothing else. Her presence perked X curiosity. Even better when the elevator opened on the third floor the naked girl stepped out. Since this was also her stop she followed. Although she was going to do that anyway, and the fact that she was on her own floor was a bonus. The girl made her way to the right and down the hall. K followed a discreet distance, and when she turned the corner followed after, the naked girl went to an open door where a necky woman was waiting. K found a spot hidden from view, and cloaked. Then closed the distance so she could eavesdrop. The girl pulled a paper from the clipboard, and handed it to the woman. Thank you for waiting. Here is your hard copy of our bill, and your storage location. Again the Anira thank you for your cooperation. Save this for your records, and follow the payment instructions. The woman took the paper, smiled and thanked her for it. Then the girl said, the Anira have also arranged an appointment for you. She pulled another paper, don't be late. The woman nodded, I'll be there. Good. You may go back to your normal routine and forget about this encounter. Just remember to pay and show up for your appointment. The woman nodded, and the girl left. K was left standing nearby thinking that was a very odd meeting. She didn't follow the weird courier, but she did tag her before making for her own apartment. 51. Interlude Solian Armor the Solians and their two cousin races possess some of the most effective and unique armor in the known universe. This highly effective armor also played into the early Solian mentality to dismiss shields as a viable defensive mechanism. It didn't help that they were also quite talented at defeating energy shields. Another factor that played into the dismissal of energy shielding and perhaps the most important was their reliance on stealth technology. All Solian ships of that era possessed cloaking technology, and the Solians were very good with cloaking technology. 
Most tracers could fire torpedoes while cloaked, but the Solians were also able to fire their energy weapons without disrupting their cloak. This led to a tendency for them to engage opponents while cloaked during that era. This tendency also meant they couldn't really use shields. Cloaks and shields were fundamentally incompatible. This meant that if an opponent could see through their cloak, and they were hit, it would be their armor that absorbed the hit. As such good armor was very important to the Solian people. Now then you may be wondering what makes Solian armor so special? The answer is in how it operates. The armor itself is a multi-layered construct of floating plates and shock absorbing gel integrated with advanced circuitry. This circuitry allows an energy field to be run through the plating, a field that drastically strengthens the integrity of the armor, and also absorbs some of the energy directed at the hull. In addition, a number of special devices called energy absorbers are embedded in the plates. They absorb some of the energy from incoming weapons fire and shunt that energy directly into the armor integrity field often shortened to the eighth. Those factors alone make their armor very impressive. But in addition to that a dispersion field is also projected around the hull. This field acts on incoming weapons fire and attempts to disperse it. Concentrated energy bolts traveling through the field often end up hitting the hull in a much wider area than they would have otherwise because of this field. Forcing incoming fire to hit a wider area has the benefit of not only weakening the penetrating force of incoming energy bolts but also allowing more energy to be absorbed by the energy absorbers and the A field. This makes the armor very effective at stopping energy weapons fire, especially pulsed energy weapons. Projectile weapons can bypass the dispersion field, however that is where the shock gel layer comes into play. When a kinetic impact hits the plating, the energy of that impact is dispersed through the gel over the surface of the hull, thereby allowing more absorbers to act on the impact than if the gel wasn't present. The gel also absorbs a significant chunk of the impact on its own. The same deal happens with the explosive burst of a missile or torpedo. The energy of the shockwaves would be absorbed and dispersed by the combination of the gel and absorbers. While the AF ensures the hull maintains integrity and even absorbs a chunk of the blast itself. As such Solian armor is highly resilient and able to withstand phenomenal amounts of weapons fire before failing. 41. Chapter 46 The first pieces of the puzzle. Kairu stepped into the apartment that K had secured for them. May was right behind her, and the pair looked over the entry room. The foyer was set up as a sitting room, with several sofas and chairs arranged around a large screen. That screen was part of the com terminal, but it could also be used to view news broadcasts or for entertainment. They would likely have to set it up though, it would need to be linked to their own com IDs, and then they would have to subscribe to any streaming services that they want as well. Although they were likely going to be too busy to bother subscribing to any of those, not to mention it would save them on credits as well. Kairu settled into a nearby chair, and May did the same. K was already seated facing them. Kairu leaned forward a bit, and said I guess first things first. We should share our experiences with today. With that they began to relay their own experiences. They had all had busy days, and all seen things. As such they all held different pieces of the puzzle. Not enough to form a complete picture, but together they had a more complete picture than any of the locals likely had. What with them being brainwashed and all. It was obvious that these brainwashing aliens were controlling the flow of information in the city. When they were done relaying their days to each other, Kyrie leaned back and stretched a bit. Then she said, Glad you followed the mother, May. That helps a bit actually, and based on what K said she saw we can guess those naked neck you girls serve as the couriers and agents of these irony. May nodded. Yes we can. It's a good thing we both tagged a courier too. We should likely tag as many as we can find, and keep an eye on the couriers at all times. It will allow us to gather more information on what the irony are up to. K nodded. We do need to keep an eye on them. I think we should also keep some eyes on that clinic that Kairu visited. It seems very important, Kairu concurred. Yeah my brief visit there answered a few questions but also raised others. However, I think we should be careful about future visits. May nodded. Yes. You were lucky you didn't run into more irony able to sense you, I know, and following her around was risky in the first place. It paid off, but I don't plan to take another risk like that soon. K shifted in her seat. That's probably for the best. Anyway, it's getting late. We can spin theories and plan out our next moves in the morning. Kyra nodded. She wanted a look around the apartment. Glancing around at the furniture she could guess that it came with the apartment. It was of a rather neutral style. Kairu made a mental note to get better furniture at a future date. Yeah we can do that, 
I'd like to take a look around the apartment before we call it a night as well. Even as she said that her mind was already thinking up theories trying to work out just exactly what these aliens the Irony were up to, already she had enough information that she was beginning to form a picture of these Irony. What they did to that mother spoke of several things. She had a bit of an idea on that, but she wanted to talk it out with Megumi. The ship seemed to know a thing or two about mind control after all. Together the group toured the apartment, while Kairu was thinking. The foyer, sitting room was designed as the main room of the apartment. Overall it was small, with a small kitchen, three modest bedrooms, and only one bathroom. Kairu found the layout reasonable. Kairu entered her bedroom. After touring the new place they had decided who took which room. It wasn't too hard, since the rooms were fairly similar. It was a modest bedroom, pre-furnished with a small desk, a single chair, a dresser, and a bed. There was a closet that was empty at the moment, so she stowed her bag in there. It had everything she had brought with her from the ship, which amounted to very little. A few grenades, the VR set, two changes of clothes, a data pad, and a pistol. The pistol was a common Necoplasma Pulse pistol that Megumi had optimized. Kairu had brought it since it had a stun setting, and since it was a Necu design, it would not look too out of place. Oh yes, she had also brought some cards along. Kairu tested the bed and found it reasonably comfortable. She'd slept on worse in the past. Although her bunk back on the constellation was much better, she made a mental note to get a better mattress. She probably didn't need it with her enhanced body, but she was sure she would sleep better with a more comfortable mattress. As she slipped into the bed her mind thought of that VR set that Megumi had given her just before she left. She sighed, and muttered, maybe I should at least try it? Kairu went to her bag, retrieved it, and slipped back into bed. She remembered what Megumi had said about how to use it. All she had to do was put it on, and from the sound of it go to bed as normal. So she slipped it on, and laid back. She was asleep almost as soon as her head hit the pillow. Kairu found herself being greeted by a barely dressed young woman. She was wearing a short top that barely concealed her chest, and a fairly short skirt. She smiled, good morning, glad you could make it on time for your first day. That was merely the beginning of this strange and rather vivid world. What followed after that was a quick tour of her new school before being introduced to her class. A class that turned out to be very young. It was at that very moment that Megumi's voice ran through her head. I've loaded up an accelerated schooling program on this portable VR headset, appropriate for your general level of education and ability. She hadn't thought of it at the time, but suddenly now she realized how lacking her education was by Solian standards. But why? Why did Megumi have to make her simulated schooling program an elementary school? Even worse, she was apparently in the second grade. Her first impulse was to try to end the program right then and there. Instead, she was met with a flashing box that told her that feature was currently unavailable. The moment she saw that box, she felt her legs give out under her, and she slumped to the floor. She ended up sitting through the class, where she found the subjects to be more advanced than she would have expected, especially for the second grade. Although she only noticed when she started paying attention. When morning came Kyra removed the set from her head, and instantly contacted Megumi. As soon as she saw Megumi's holographic face projected into her vision she started to vent. Megumi shook her head, and sighed. Sorry I didn't tell you about that. I just had a feeling that you would fail to try it if I told you how undereducated most neck you are by Solian standards. Would it help if I told you that you are in the advanced class? The advanced class? Megumi nodded. For talented individuals. Those kids who are ahead of their peers. Also you aren't just in the second grade. It's second grade fourth year. You forgot how long Solians live, and their schooling system reflects a longer lifespan. Each year is also more information dense than you are probably used to as well, especially in the accelerated advanced classes. She sighed, not sure what to say. She thought back to the class. And yeah those weren't subjects she had back in elementary school. The math lesson had covered complex calculus for example, and she hadn't even gotten into that until high school previously. Megumi said. Just give it a few more days. If you can't take it as is, I can make a few changes. Kyra nodded. She wasn't sure she wanted to give it a second chance, but time was wasting away, and she did have things to do for the day. They had a lot to do today. Before she could close the channel however Megumi had one last thing to say. Oh, one more thing. I read your reports. I am going to be sending some cloaked drones down to keep an eye on the clinic. That reminded her of something, and she asked a question to which Megumi replied. Wondering about that are we? 
I suspect that they have an easier time manipulating the minds of people when they are in direct contact with a person. It's not all that unusual a trait among telepaths. I could tell you more if I have a specimen to examine, Kairu sighed. Yet keeps coming to that, doesn't it? Naturally, examining a live subject is invaluable. I could learn a great deal both from the potential interrogation and from examining an IRI physiology. I'll take your word for it. In the meantime, I need to get up. The others are likely to already be waiting for me. They signed off, and she got ready for her day. There was a lot they needed to do. Not only was there a lot to do in regards to gathering information on the Inairai, there was other stuff they needed to do. They were newcomers to the city, and while they now had an apartment they needed a living, not to mention stuff to make the place more personal. Kairu saw a lot of busy days in her future. Malia closed the book she was reading. Magic was rather complicated, it turned out, at its simplest. It was the power to bend reality to your will using your mind. Yet there was so much more to it than just that. The possibilities it presented were endless. It could take lifetimes to truly explore its depths. She had only just scratched the surface of what the Solians knew, but already she was wondering if they even knew everything there was to know about it. With a sigh, she leaned back and tossed the datapad she was holding onto the side table. Thanks to her link with the ship she knew that she was needed elsewhere right now. There was often something going on that needed her attention. A part of her often wished that wasn't so. She wanted nothing more than a chance to hole up in a lab somewhere and study the endless possibilities this magic provided. Yet her duties currently prevented that. Reluctantly she slipped out of the chair, heading for the door. Thankfully this interruption sounded like something that wouldn't take much time. Apparently one of her fellow early scientists had made a request. They wanted approval to use one of the ship's drones for some experiment. She wasn't sure what. But that was mainly since Megumi didn't care to really deal with it. She merely logged the request and told her to deal with it. 51. Chapter 47 Gathering Clues Walked down the hall of the apartment building. It had been a few days since they first arrived. Mei was currently checking back on a mother she had observed on day one. While Kairu was out tracking down another courier, they had been spending the last few days locating and tagging the couriers so that they could track their movements. Those movements themselves would show a pattern and patterns would reveal points of interest. Points of interest would lead to more clues on what the NRI were up to. Speaking of the couriers, the one that she had personally tagged in this building on day one had come back. Right now she was in the elevator, and Kwa was heading for the apartment she had visited that day. As Kwa had a feeling that she was heading there at the moment. The woman who lived there was also someone they were monitoring. Her appointment that the irony had arranged had been just two days ago, and it had been at the very same strange clinic that Kairu had found. Since it was at the clinic they had not been able to personally visit, but a cloaked drone had observed her visit to the clinic. It had been a rather strange visit. The initial arrival part had been normal, right up to meeting with the Anairi receptionist. It was after that it got weird as she was led into a waiting room and requested to remove her clothes. A bin was provided for them. Once she was completely naked she was allowed to sit in a chair until the Anairi doctor was ready for her. The waiting room was not set up like the waiting area in reception which was designed to look normal. It had a bunch of chairs for people to sit on, but nothing was provided for people to do. It seemed that the Anairi really did just expect the people there to simply wait until they were ready for them. When the doctor was ready for her, she had been led to a small room not unlike the one that Kairu had seen those two girls being examined and brainwashed further in. It even had the same strange chair. The woman was ordered to sit down and had sensors attached to her for an assessment. It had apparently been deemed that she was lacking in potential. After that, she had a programming session and was then ordered to come back for another appointment next month. The woman was to check in with reception for the details on when. She was also ordered to forget all details of the appointment, and to think it was merely an ordinary checkup. Then she was let out. The woman promptly headed down to the receptionist still naked, and relayed that her appointment was finished. She also reported that the doctor said for her to come back in a month. The receptionist smiled, and handed her a paper saying that it contained details on her next appointment. Then she produced the bin with the woman's clothes. Before she let the woman go, she informed her that they would be sending her a bill in a couple of days. K turned the corner, and noticed the woman in question standing in her open door. Just as she had expected to see, she was waiting for the courier. This seemed to be a pattern with them. K closed the distance to the door, not worried about being seen. She had taken the opportunity to cloak earlier when she was out of sight. 
A moment later the familiar sight of the naked Nekikuria slipped into view. Once again holding her clipboard, she smiled as she stepped up near the woman. Thank you for waiting, the woman said nothing. As the courier produced a sheet of paper, here is the bill for your last appointment. She paused, pulled out a second, and said, Also we have finished selling those items you had us sell for you. As the woman took the papers, K peeked at them. The medical bill wasn't all that big. It seemed like an ordinary charge. The strange part about it was the instructions written on it. As for the other item, it listed a long list of mostly girls' clothing. Shirts, dresses, skirts, socks, panties, bras, and shoes were all listed. Also in the list were a few girls' toys. Next to each item in the list was its sale price. Down at the bottom was the total sale, and more instructions. The courier reached into her pouch, and pulled out a credit transfer chit. Here is your cut of the sale. The woman took the chit, and pocketed it. The courier smiled, and said, that is all I have for the day. You may return to your normal routine. The woman nodded, as the courier turned to leave. K then watched the woman turn to go back into her apartment. Already K had an idea of what she was going to be doing, and it wasn't returning to her normal routine. She was almost certainly going in to pay her new bill, and then she was going to the bank. The instructions on the clothing sale told her that she had a new account and its details. She was to transfer the chit there, and then she was to close all of her other existing accounts and transfer the money to that account. Once she was done transferring all her money there and closing her current accounts she was to then contact someone. The contact details were included. Quated by the door, she figured following the woman to the bank might be in order. This seemed like it might lead to something interesting. As it was, K was wondering what was up with these new instructions. May arrived at her destination just as a familiar truck was landing at the house. She wasn't too surprised since they had been tracking the truck. They had observed this particular courier in this neighborhood a few times over the last few days, and May had observed her doing collections a couple of times. Not every visit did she manage to spy on though. She was already cloaked, so she simply closed the distance to the house, and the open door. The mother she had followed and observed the other day was once again standing in her open door. It seemed the NRI were quite consistent with how these strange meetings played out. There was an advantage to that, but it also made their activities easier to find. Then again they probably didn't plan for cloaked spies. With their abilities, they could likely control what information the usual spies were getting and even spot them as they came in. She was almost to the open door, when the familiar naked courier she had tagged the other day clambered out of the vehicle. This time she had a clipboard with her, and like before she sauntered over to the door. She smiled, thanks for waiting, the woman didn't reply, and the courier pulled a paper from her clipboard. This here is your service bill hard copy, and your storage location. Again the Anirai thank you for your cooperation. Save this for your records and follow the payment instructions. May glanced at the paper. K hadn't done so when she observed a similar encounter, but May was curious about the storage location. There was also the question, were they actually storing those items? The paper itself really did include a bill for services rendered, along with payment instructions. As for a storage location, there was in fact one listed on it. Along with more instructions, they were telling her not to visit the location or to remove the items stored until instructed otherwise. She was allowed to send items there to be stored, however, it seemed it was a black box type of deal. Made sense. These were items they didn't want her to be able to view. Thinking back, she remembered how every photo that included her daughter had been packed into that storage box. They were removing memory triggers so that the woman wouldn't look for her daughter while they had her. But this indicated that they did eventually plan to return her. Then again they could still be destroying the items. But that also seemed to clash a bit with her own memory of the instructions slapped on the storage box. The woman thanked the courier, with a smile. The girl pulled another paper. The Anira have also arranged an appointment for you don't be late. Since she was well positioned May took a look at the paper, it detailed the appointment, telling her where it was, and when, naturally, it was once again that strange clinic, a number of leads kept going back there, so it was no surprise, the date was in three days, what was more interesting were the additional instructions here, it told her exactly when to arrive and that she was to wear an outfit that was easily removed, the mother nodded, I'll be there. The courier replied with, good, you may go back to your normal routine and forget this encounter. Just remember to pay your bill, and show up for your appointment. The woman nodded and turned back into her house. While the courier made for the truck, May smiled, spying on this meeting had allowed her to get the clues K had missed with her lucky break. 
Now she had a storage location to check out, she needed to visit it to confirm either theory on what they did with the stuff. As the truck lifted off, May started walking. The storage location wasn't too far, a bit long of a walk, but she had no problems with the exercise. She had a feeling this would be a helpful little side trip. The tail she had grown wagged behind her. It helped her blend in with the Neku as one of them. But sometimes she wondered how they dealt with them in the first place. In her opinion life was so much easier without one. She used her hand to still it, just so it wouldn't knock something over while she was cloaked. Announcement. Sorry about the delay. I was out, and unable to post for a while. Anyway, my birthday was just a couple of days ago. And it would be great if you joined my Patreon. You could even read ahead, as I have quite a few chapters stockpiled there. Right now. 49. Chapter 48 Glues at the Bank Followed the woman into the bank Just as she had expected the young woman had come back out of her apartment not long after the courier had left, and she had followed her straight to the local bank. As she entered the building with the woman, K noted the people around. The receptionists were all Neku, but she did note one irony in the building. K made a mental note to keep her distance from her in case she was one of the stronger ones. She closely followed the woman up to the counter to observe, not worried about being seen since she was still cloaked. K honestly enjoyed how much easier having a cloak made her job. It helped that the irony and the Neku both lacked proper defenses against cloaked spies. When the woman finally reached the receptionist, she said, I'm here to consolidate my accounts and to make a deposit, the receptionist smiled, certainly, what accounts are you closing, and where am I putting the money, the woman gave the receptionist the details, and she started working on the computer, after a moment, she looked up, the deposit please, the woman handed it over and told her which account to put it in, the receptionist took the credit chit, ran it, and did a few things on the computer, okay, I'm going to need you to come with me now to sign a few documents to finalize the closing and transfer of the money in your old accounts. The woman nodded. The receptionist stepped away from the counter and opened a small door near the counter, leading the woman into the back. K followed. They ended up in a small office. The woman was asked to sit, and the receptionist left for a moment. She came back with a stack of papers. What followed was the ordinary paperwork involved with closing the accounts. When the last document was signed, the receptionist smiled, all right we are done here, now then do you need anything else? The woman nodded, I do have a call I need to make. Can I make it here? The receptionist smiled, of course, there is a com terminal on the desk. I'll leave you alone while you make the call. The receptionist walked over to the desk in the small office and activated the com terminal. She then left the room. The woman walked over to the desk, and sat in front of it. Then she made the call. K noted that this was the contact she was instructed to contact. It seemed it was a very good thing she followed her in here. The familiar naked form of an irony appeared on the screen. The woman gave her details, and then said, I have finished closing my accounts and transferring all my money into the new account you have provided. Good. Thank you for cooperating. I'm sending you details on a second account. This will be your new spending account. As for the first account until instructed otherwise you will not touch the money deposited in the account. You will also be depositing all of your future wages into that account. Money may disappear from that account. Pay no attention to that. It's normal. Now about the spending account. You will be paying all your bills out of that account from now on. Make sure you pay them on time. You will also be submitting to us a log of all purchases you plan to make weekly for review and approval. You may not make any purchase with the account without our approval. The woman nodded. Understood. The NRI glanced at a screen. Also I would like you to make yourself available for an extended four-day weekend trip next week. Make sure all bills are paid for that period as well. A courier will come by to collect you for the trip. At 0500 Wednesday. Wait by the door. Wear nothing. Do not pack any bags, and remember to leave the door open for the courier. The woman nodded again. I understand. Good. Now I would like you to submit this week's plan purchases by the end of the day. We will have them reviewed, and the approved list sent to you by tomorrow morning. I understand. Thank you for your cooperation on this matter. You may forget this call. Just remember to follow your instructions. The woman nodded, and the call ended. K found watching this call rather informative. There was a lot to think about after this. She had considered the possibility that this was a precursor to the woman being disappeared. But it seemed that they only wanted her gone for four days. Not that long a period, but maybe they did this account thing with everyone. As she thought about it, there wasn't any reason for them not to take control of their money like this. The whole thing brought more questions, even as it answered others. 
The woman closed the terminal, and followed her out of the room where she was met by the receptionist. Done? The woman nodded. Great. This way please. With that the receptionist led her back out to the front, followed, and they headed right out of the building. Had a lot to think about, and glancing at the time, she had somewhere else to be soon. So once they were outside, she parted with the woman she was observing. May looked around the outside of the facility she had arrived at. Following the lead on the storage location had brought her here, at first glance, it was a storage facility alright, but she noticed an odd building among the collection of storage sheds and warehouses. Another oddity about the place was that there were a fair number of Neku about. All of them were naked. Many of them did have a belt though, but that was all they wore. If they were wearing anything at all, there was a fence around the perimeter of the facility. But that wasn't an obstacle for her. She was already cloaked, and it was designed to keep a normal Neku out, not her. She jumped it. As she entered, she noticed the large number of sensor clusters set up around the buildings. There were also a few force shield emitters. The fact that it was currently busy with trucks coming in and out was likely why the shield wasn't in place at the moment. It wouldn't have stopped her though, their being down simply made it easier to get in. Now that she was in, May started to poke around the facility. She knew better than to open doors with so many active sensors around, but that only made things a little harder. She headed toward a storage shed with a truck parked in front of it, and a couple of working NECU. When she got close, she noted them maneuvering several large boxes marked for storage with labels on them into the shed. Another NECU scanned the labels as they moved past her with her datapad. It seemed they weren't doing individual storage for the people they were brainwashing and taking this stuff from. As May noted the labels indicated the boxes came from different residences. Glancing over the shoulder of the girl with the datapad, she noted she was logging the boxes in their database, and their location. Then she noted something else. Each box also had a list of contents noted in the database, yet she didn't recall them going over that back at the house. Each item also had accompanying images. Her question was answered in a moment when a girl wearing a headband in addition to a belt pulled a new box out of the truck. She placed it down on the ground, unsealed it, and called out a box number. The woman with the datapad opened a new entry with that box number. The datapad girl signaled she was ready, and the girl at the box started going through it listing the items in it. She was very thorough and detailed about it, not to mention efficient. She not only gave detailed descriptions of each item be it photo, art, or knick-knack, but she gave these descriptions in clean precise phrases, doing it in seconds per item. As she did each item May noticed images being added to the file, and the datapad girl would attach them to each description. Despite the size of the box it only took her a few minutes to go through it, and to neatly pack the stuff back in. She resealed it, and then pushed it up, while a second girl was readying the next box to be gone through. May guessed the headband had an optical sensor pod on it. When it reached the girl with the datapad she scanned it, and May noted how the new box entry was updated with the scanned info from the label. It seemed that they did this often, but it surprised her little that they were going through what amounted to private stuff. They had a full system for it after all. It did look like they were actively storing the stuff though, yet this little sight did raise the question. Why were they taking so thorough an inventory of what each individual had stored? There was no reason to do that, although it made perfect sense if they planned to alter the contents of the storage box at a later date, there were a few possibilities of how they would be doing that. She didn't think the answers were here so she left the naked workers to their jobs, and moved on. May had a few other places in the facility she wanted to check out. That suspicious building she noted earlier might be a prime spot to check out, as a bonus she hadn't spotted any Anira yet so it might be safe. Then again they might be concentrated at that suspicious building. With nothing else seeming to be of interest, she headed straight for the most suspicious building in the facility. It wasn't too far of a walk, so it only took her a couple of minutes. Although she did take a bit of a shortcut to save time. After all the why go around several lines of storage sheds when you can easily go over them? The strange building was a large structure with its own fence, and checkpoints at the entrances. That fence and checkpoints were part of what made it suspicious. That, and it clearly wasn't an office complex or a warehouse. There was another building over by the main wall that she was pretty sure was the main office. She worked her way around the building, surveying the checkpoints. Most of them were closed, with a force field blocking entry, and a naked neck standing guard. As she was completing her external survey of the building, she neared one of the checkpoints and she noted it was open. A naked neck with a scanner was waving another nude neck into the building. The girl was pushing a cart of large boxes into the gate. Followed her in, 
and studied the boxes. They had labels indicating varying residences and box numbers. All of them however had been marked as for storage. She also noted that the registered addresses on the labels all seemed to be from the same area. That seemed curious to her. May followed the girl down the hall that the checkpoint led to. Already she figured the cart full of boxes might be going somewhere interesting. It turned out that she was right. After going past several doors, and a turn, the cart was brought to a large workroom filled with naked nephew. The worker hit a button on her graph cart, and it set gently on the floor. She then announced to the group, here is Lot. One of them walked over and thanked her. She left without the cart, and a second nephew was signaled to remove a box, which was promptly placed next to a work table, and unsealed. Someone brought a pad and began checking the items against an inventory as they were unpacked onto the table. Another box was dragged to a second table, but May stayed near the first to watch. They were quickly sorted, and then the knickknacks and art were placed back into the box carefully. Someone took the photos and started running each through a scanner. May moved closer wondering what they were doing, and watched as each photo was loaded onto a screen. A few of them started working on the digital copy that had been created. Elsewhere she noted the originals being run through a laser shredder reducing them to piles of ash. It seemed she was right about the inventory thing. In at least some cases they were going to alter the stuff later. The question was why were they altering these photos? She watched and noted that they were focusing on changing a specific individual in each photo. Removing her clothes in every instance, why they were doing that, she didn't know. It took them a while, but they had some rather powerful digital tools. Allowing them to alter a single photo completely in just a few minutes, it even looked natural, as if it had always been that way. As each altered photo was completed they printed it out, and repacked it into the box as it had been before. Then she noticed that in some of the photos they were also removing the clothes of the other individuals and not just at one girl. A quick glance at the dating watermark that was hidden in the frame of the photo showed that it was the more recent ones in which they were making everyone naked. It took the group of NECU a very short period of time to work through the box and repack it. They moved it aside and opened a second, continuing the same process. One thing she did note was they were again focusing on specific individuals, and like before it was the younger ones. The question was why were they altering these photos? Unfortunately merely watching these girls work wasn't going to answer that question. Perhaps there were answers elsewhere in the building. 45, Chapter 49 Oddities in the Suburbs Kyrie walked down the sidewalk. She was following a lead on a courier that had come all the way to the suburbs. She had tagged the courier outside a smaller house with only one occupant, delivering her cut of the items they sold for her, and a bill for her last medical appointment. It was a bit more than just that, but Kairu had already heard from K that she was going to be visiting the bank. K didn't specify why in her brief text over the com, but having seen the instructions in those papers Kairu could guess, she likely wanted to observe who another woman would contact. Kairu decided not to follow herself. Instead, she simply bugged the woman, as it would already take her a while to get back to the main parts of the city. She did have a part-time job to do. Thankfully, it was the evening shift. She planned to get a more important job later, when they knew more. She would have preferred to follow her in person though. As she turned a corner she spotted a familiar face. It was the irony girl she had spotted the other day. She was just stepping off a courier truck. A courier was helping her down as if she was a noble or princess from some story getting out of her carriage. Kairu wasn't cloaked but at the moment they were not looking her way. On impulse she cloaked and it was just in time. The Anairai in question turned her gaze in Kairu's direction, and looked over the area with that familiar odd expression. The Anairai girl sighed, and said, You are kind of shy aren't you? I'm pretty sure you showing up here just before an inspection is simply a coincidence. Although would it kill you to show your face? Kairu said nothing at all in response. She was being baited again and she wasn't going to fall for it. The Anairai clearly wasn't surprised as she said, Ah, figures you stay silent. Feel free to stay around, not like I can stop you. Just stay out of my way. It seemed this particular Anairai was feeling more talkative today. Since she was invited to stick around she decided to see what this inspection was about. It seemed like something different, since she didn't normally see an Anairai with a courier. Another thing she didn't see was doors standing open on the street with someone waiting. That was the typical norm of their observed activities. Often those people were waiting a while before they showed up. The Anairai girl turned to her courier. Go knock on the first door. The courier girl nodded and headed towards the door of the house nearest the truck. She rapped three times, and then waited. A moment later a young girl in her mid-teens answered the door. 
The Anirai girl spoke to her. Allow us in. This is an inspection. The girl nodded, and opened the door more fully. The courier and the Anirai girl walked in. The young girl was about to close it, but the Anirai said, Leave it open, it will be more convenient. Kairu followed them in. The Anirai sent the girl to fetch her family, and looked around the living room for a moment before turning towards her. I thought you would follow me in, but you know, if you are going to keep following a girl around, would it kill you to at least talk to me? She didn't answer again. The Anirai may know she was here, but she was the only one at the moment. It seemed the girl was trying a more aggressive baiting than last time, something she had thought was stupid the previous time. Although it seemed she must have expected that. I figured. Well make yourself comfortable. I'll be here for a while. I have several houses to visit after all. Then the young girl came back with three others. Her mother, her two sisters, the four Neku soon stood in front of the Anirai girl, who ordered them all to strip. As soon as they were naked, she began to physically inspect their bodies. After a moment she focused on the first girl, and said you are suitable, take her to the truck. Then she turned to a second girl who seemed to be her younger sister. You seem to have potential but aren't quite ready. Go with her. The two girls were led out by the courier while the Anirai focused on the third sister. Her tentacle focused on a nasty scar across her belly. Shame. If it weren't for this injury you would have been quite suitable. Well at least I got two out of this household. The girl stepped back, and then the Anirai girl said, All right, I want you two to start packing those two's things. Split them for sale, for donation, and for storage. I want anything that would remind you two of them, be it a photo, decoration, or school art project packed for storage. Also make sure to pack their bedding in for storage. You won't be needing it for a while. Pack their clothes in the boxes for sale, or donation, preferably for sale their toys. I want to be packed for donation unless you think they will fetch a good price on the market. Get to it. The two Neki nodded, and set to work. By the time the courier came back in without the girls, the two were already packing three large griff boxes as they had been ordered, just the way May had observed before. Kairu just watched, and silently considered what she was watching. These Anirai seemed to prefer making others do most of their work for them. What was happening here was definitely a reflection of that. This inspection also apparently seemed to be another way that they could get their foot in the door of an Eku household. The Anirai girl made her way to a sofa and sat down to watch them pack. After a moment she looked towards where she was standing and sighed. You know these inspections can get rather boring. It might be more interesting if you would at least talk to me. Kairu could see how this part might be a little boring, for the Anirai girl, especially if she had seen it a few times before, Kairu had been thinking, if this Anirai was feeling talkative it might be worth the risk of talking to her, yet she didn't really feel like speaking, so once again she decided not to answer, this didn't feel controlled enough either, the Anirai sighed and stretched, unlike before she did not say any more, the Anirai simply relaxed into the sofa and refocused on the two Nekya who were working, not long after, they finished the packing, the two came over to stand before the Anirai, and said, we are done, good, stand by the door, then she turned to the waiting courier, get those boxes ready for transport, and load them on the truck as well, the courier nodded, and made for the boxes, she started with the storage box, sealing it up, and adding a label to it, then she activated its anti gravs and proceeded to move it out of the house. She was only gone for a couple of moments before she came back and sealed the donation box. She sealed it but didn't label it. It was taken out in a moment. She was just as quick with the for sale box, giving it a cursory examination of its contents before labeling it, and heading outside with it. When she came back for the last time, she simply took up a position beside the Anirai girl, who was getting out of her chair. Kairu followed, and headed out the door. The Anirai girl stopped outside the door, and spoke to the pair. Thank you for your cooperation. A courier will be by in a few days with your bill, and storage location. I'll also have an appointment arranged for both of you. Don't be late. The Neki nodded, and the mother said, Understood. You may go back to your normal lives and forget this encounter, and until we tell you otherwise, you two are not to think about the two I am taking with me. They nodded, and headed back in. The courier closed the door behind them. The Anirai stretched. Well that is one done, go knock on the second door, the courier nodded, and headed to the house to the left of the door after leaving, Kairu followed along, she had already seen one, but she didn't quite feel like leaving yet, not long after the courier knocked on the next door, a woman answered the door, she peeked out the door, asking if she could help, the Anirai spoke, allow us in, and leave the door open, this is an inspection, the woman nodded, 
Opening the door wide, the courier and the Anira girl headed inside. Kairu followed them in again, but only to see how things would go. Again the woman was asked to gather her family. She only had two daughters. As soon as all three were standing before the Anirai, she had them strip before physically inspecting their bodies. After a couple of minutes she stepped back, and smiled. Oh lucky, everyone is suitable here. Well, except for the mother. She is too old. Take these two to the truck and put them with the other two. Then she turned towards the woman, and instructed her to start packing up her daughter's stuff, and things that would remind her of them. She nodded, and got to work. After that, things went similar to the last place, and before too long they were out the door. The Anirai seemed happy, and had her courier knock on a third door moving in the same direction as last time. This went much the same as the last one with her again taking the daughters and leaving the mother behind alone. At the fourth house. However, something different happened. The fourth house was just a younger mother and her twin daughters. After inspecting all three of them she seemed very happy, and took both daughters. Ordered mommy to pack, but unlike at the last few houses she wasn't ordered to pack just her daughter's stuff but most of her own. She was to leave only a few outfits to last her a few days and the essentials. As she went about that the Anirai girl said, It's not often that everyone in a household has this much potential. Unfortunately, we have to leave at least one behind to tie up some loose ends before we can take them in. I'll send someone for her later. Kairu blinked. She was a bit surprised to hear that. The Anirai girl hadn't said a word to her in a while, but that sounded important. It left her wondering why she shared that. Then the Anirai turned to the courier. Go fetch my mobile terminal. I have something I need to do. She nodded and headed off. The courier came back with a mobile terminal, which was a portable tablet with a COM node. It was basically a highly portable computer and could be used for all the same functions while also having a call function. The Anirai girl set the terminal on a table, and activated it. She soon went to work. Kairu moved over her shoulder and watched. It didn't take a genius to see that she was setting up a bank account. The Anirai girl said, watching me work just setting up the standard account for her early so we can get her out of here for an extended session with us i'd like her to consolidate her accounts and start getting things paid and squared by the end of the week especially since we will be bringing the family back here when they are ready it would be best if they still had the house to return to kairu took that in she was beginning to get an idea of what the anirai girl thought about her shadow well there was no point in breaking that delusion, it seemed to be working in her favor. She had just learned something interesting, more clues, so sticking around had worked in her favor. The Anirai girl spent the entire time setting things up on the terminal, including making a couple of calls to get it running. She finished setting the account up, just as the courier was finished loading the woman's packed stuff into the truck. She sighed, all right that's that, as she stood up. She had the courier write some stuff down, and then deactivated the terminal. The paper with the writing on it was given to the mother. I have set up a new account for you. Close all your current accounts and transfer the money into that account. When you are done I want you to contact us for further instruction. The woman nodded. The Anirai gave the terminal to the courier. And they left. The courier girl headed to put the terminal back in the truck on the Anirai girl's orders. Kairu stretched and checked the time. She still had some time before she had to leave in order to make it on time to her evening shift. If she wanted to run, she could wait even longer. She decided to stick around a bit longer, to see if the Anirai girl would let slip anything else interesting. 42. Chapter 50 Clues in the Suburbs The next few houses were rather the same as the first three. The Anirai girl went in, physically inspected everyone, and took the girls she deemed suitable, leaving the others behind. They were on the third to last house of the block when something new came up. Kairu had settled on the floor. The household this time was a mother and her two daughters, who were at the moment standing nude in front of the Anirai girl as she physically inspected their bodies. After a moment she stepped back. Her face held a look of utter disappointment. With a sigh she said, I guess a little bad has to balance the good. It's not often that I encounter a household where no one is suitable either. Kairu almost said something in reply to that. Instead she held her tongue. After a moment the Anirai girl said to the courier, Go fetch my terminal. I have a couple of calls to make. The courier nodded and ran off. As she left, the Anirai, seeming a bit sad, headed over to the sofa and sat down on it heavily. Personally I hate it when this happens, especially in a neighborhood. We have already selected. Unfortunately, we can't let them stay here. They aren't suitable. I'm going to have to arrange for them to be moved. Hopefully, we have an alternative available. 
This bit seemed interesting, something about the neighborhood, and selected, hopefully, she would shed more light as it might explain something more. Although she could infer that whatever she meant by selected likely plays into why they were inspecting every house on the block, from the sound of it they might be doing more than just this street, perhaps the suburbs required more attention than they previously thought. The courier came back with a terminal, and the Anira girl quickly took it, and made a call. Another Anira appeared on a screen seconds later. The first quickly relayed a few details, and then said, I am afraid the residents here are completely unsuitable at the moment. That might change at a later date, but likely not before this neighborhood is ready. We will need to move the household, got that? Go ahead and start instructing them. I'll start things moving here, and we can get them moving before the week is out. Ah, so we have an alternate available right now? The second Inairai nodded, yep, we do have an alternate available right now. Great you do that. I'll get them started on preparing for a move. Then I will work on preparing an account for them. With that they closed the call, and she turned to the group barking instructions. They were not the normal ones, they were being instructed to prepare for a move. Leaving only what they absolutely need unpacked. Once that was done she sighed. Now to make another account. At least I don't have to arrange for the second truck to move them out. She turned back to her terminal and started working. Once again she was clearly setting up another bank account. Kairu suspected that they were going to have her consolidate her accounts into one they control just like at the other house. It seemed to be something they eventually do with everyone. Moving them out seems to be another reason for them to speed that up apparently. Not that she was sure why they were doing it. The process went much like last time, with several calls involved. However the girls were still packing when the Anira stretched. Having finally finished with setting up the move for them, she then made one last call before having her courier write out the new account stuff, and information. Turning to the head of the household she then relayed further instructions. The instructions were mostly related to consolidating their accounts. Then once she was done with that, she told them, movers will be by in a couple of days to move your stuff to temporary storage. A courier will also arrive around then to purchase your place from you. Do not negotiate with her simply sign the purchase agreement. We want you ready to move by the end of the week. A courier will be by to pick you up around then, she will take you to your new place. With that the Anira girl headed for the door, and the courier followed. Naturally, they took nothing with them. Once outside the courier was sent to the next door, and knocked. After a moment a young woman answered, that house ended up going much like the others without anything interesting happening, and so did the next. Nothing else interesting happened until the end of the inspection. Kairu stretched as they left the last house on the block. It was about time for her to really go, but she had a feeling that the Anira wasn't going to stay much longer. Her truck was getting rather full, and the girls she had taken were now a little packed. The Anira girl stretched. Well that is the last house for the day. I'll be back here tomorrow for the next block. If you decide to show up for that as well, maybe you will actually talk with me? It was nice having some company, but I wish you weren't so shy. Well, I wish you a safe trip back to the city. With that she headed for the truck, and the courier helped her into her seat. The courier then hopped in and the truck gently rose into the air. Heading back towards the city center, Kairi watched it go for a moment, and when it was out of sight she started jogging in the same direction it went. Although for her a light jog was the same as a normal neck making a full sprint. Kairi managed to make it back a little before her shift. She stopped by the apartment to change, and make a quick report. Her mind was mostly considering the implications of the inspection. She wasn't sure if she should go back to keep an eye on the next block. Then again she still wasn't entirely sure what they were up to with that neighborhood. What had it even been selected for? What was their goal? More questions rebounded around what criteria were they using for suitable and how that led to being abducted. She wasn't even sure why they were uprooting a whole household just because it was unsuitable. That seemed a bit much in her mind. Then again there was so much she didn't know. Much of that mere observation wasn't going to answer. She could make theories all she wanted, but it wasn't going to answer her questions. With a mind full of questions, she headed off for her shift. It wasn't much of a job, merely waiting tables at one of the nicer restaurants in the area, and it was an easy walk from her apartment. Still it got her some credits to spend, and occasionally she overheard something interesting, although usually nothing of particular interest. Well, nothing to do with Inairai actions in the city anyway. The locals didn't really pay them any attention, and practically ignored anything they did. Although sometimes she did hear things that were interesting, and occasionally they got visitors from the strange clinic as they weren't too far from it either. Unfortunately, 
Those patrons rarely had something valuable to say. It didn't help that they never remembered their appointments. Worse, they, much like she used to before Megumi undid her brainwashing, thought it was normal. Kairu made it to her part-time work about five minutes before her shift was to begin. As was usual at the hour it wasn't particularly busy. But that was going to change soon enough, it would get busier in a few minutes. She simply reported to the boss, and then went right to work. It was easy enough work, nothing that really occupied the mind so she felt free to open a line to Megumi who responded after a moment. After greetings and a question, Megumi said, Yes, I have read your report. Something on your mind about it? Quite a few things actually. I'm not really sure how I feel about what I just watched happening in mass, nor do I really understand what they are doing at all. Megumi sighed. Well we have a rather incomplete picture on that. It doesn't help that at this stage all we can do is observe. No. It doesn't. That one Anaira said a few things, but without context I can't really be sure what she meant. Megumi nodded. Context is needed all right. I do have some good news. We've made some progress on creating an extraction route. I'll let you know when it is ready. In the meantime you can start making plans to capture a live subject if you haven't already. Kairu agreed that it was good news. A live Anaira really would be invaluable. A successful interrogation would do much to shed light on what was happening in the city. There was no end to the new questions they had, it would be a major step in the right direction. Maybe then she would be able to actually do something about what the Anari were up to. There were several questions they've had that observation simply had not been able to answer. The biggest and the most obvious being where are all the men? Answering that one seemed important. Although the locals didn't seem to be questioning the total lack of a male populace in the city, she had an idea of why. They even seemed to have cleared out anything that would make the locals question whether men were as she had not seen any photos that featured them either, despite visiting multiple homes. Then Kairu shifted the subject. So what do you think is up with them displacing that family they deemed unsuitable? Megumi sighed. I'm not sure. I have a few ideas, but I need more information to know for certain. That seems to always be the problem. Every time we answer one question ten more pop up and all we end up with is uncertainties. Don't be frustrated. We only just got here, I know, but I want to actually do something and not just watch. It's irking watching all these families get torn apart like that. I understand, but honestly these ironies seem mild compared to some of the shit the Empire has dealt with in the past. That was about when things started getting busy, so she was forced to end that chat rather than continue. It was now the busiest part of her shift, and she got lost in orders and tables. As the evening was coming to a close, and the bulk of the patrons had left Kairu found herself polishing a table by the entrance, there were only a handful of people left eating, and it would not be long before closing. She had made some good tips as well during the busy hour, and heard something that piqued her interest. It seemed a new fertility clinic was opening on the north side of the city, a few of the patrons were discussing it trying to decide if they wanted to check it out or not. Remembering what happened to her, Kairu was wondering if it was really a fertility clinic, or something else. It seemed more likely to be something other than what the locals thought with some nefarious purpose to her. Suddenly the entry door chimed. Someone was coming in. She didn't glance at the door as it wasn't her job to greet the patrons. But a moment later she was wishing she had. As she was suddenly caught quite off guard by a familiar voice. One that didn't belong to any of her friends. 41. Interlude Neku Gruff Boxes The Neku Gruff Box is a versatile cargo container common to many a household and even used heavily elsewhere. The Gruff Box completely replaced older packing solutions due to its ease of use, durability, and convenience. I'm sure you have noticed that many households have them on hand, and that is largely because they are highly reusable, so the standard practice among the Neku is to keep a few on hand in case the need for them arises. After all you never know when you might need to pack things away for storage. The Griff Box is collapsible for storage as well. It comes with its own anti graph that allows a single person to easily move even heavy cargo, largely removing weight as a factor in transport. That is not all. Internal micro-inertial dampers protect the contents of the box from shock and other shipping hazards. Since the box itself is also very sturdy, you can simply even pack fragile stuff without extra material with no worry of it being broken in transit. Griff boxes come in several different types and sizes depending on the market. The household use version uses a cheap polymer as the primary material of the shell, and are powered by a regenerative power cell that features wireless recharging. A feature common to many a NECU device, 
In addition these small cells can last for months without being recharged. Common practice however is for cargo trucks to feature a wireless charger system to ensure the boxes stay powered during transit. The NECU Gruff truck is a common vehicle in NECU cities, often used by any group that needs to move heavy loads or large amounts of cargo regularly. It is a large vehicle featuring heavy anti-gruff engines allowing not only the limited flight ability common to NECU ground vehicles but also the ability to transport heavy loads. The main cockpit of a typical Gruff truck supports a max crew of two, but some models seat four. The rear of the truck is the cargo cabin. Some models feature a secondary passenger cabin to allow more people to comfortably ride. The larger models typically feature inertial dampers, climb-controlled cargo cabins and full-flight Gruff engines. All models are designed with carrying loads of Gruff boxes in mind. The cargo cabin is designed to efficiently hold and stack roof boxes without wasted space. Some models are designed with free-floating cargo in mind as well. Custom models are often ordered by businesses to fit their exact needs. The NRI courier service is no different, and employs a larger custom-designed model for their own transport needs that can serve any scenario they may encounter while doing their jobs in the city. 30. Chapter 51 More Clues at the Storage Facility May poked into another room. She had left the alterations room behind a while ago, but it turned out to not be the only workroom on the floor. There had been a few others on the first floor of this suspicious building. She had also found a weird break room, a cafeteria, and she had even found the medical ward. They had a few beds for workers to rest on, and were well equipped. It made sense to have one nearby, in case of an accident as well. As for the break room, the floor was very soft and padded. It had a number of cushions scattered about to serve as seating, there were a few shelves, and drawers against the one wall, but she hadn't looked in them. At the time she found it, there was only a single neck you in there, she wasn't doing much but lying there on a cushion looking a bit flushed and exhausted, the weirdest part was the smell, she had since moved on from the first floor, and was now exploring the second, naturally, she was maintaining her cloak. The second floor had more workrooms up here. Not all of them were in use though. Some were currently empty, standing ready to be used when needed. This latest room she had found turned out to be a bathroom. She had found a few scattered around the building. After a quick glance around, she slipped back out. So far she hadn't heard or seen anything to answer her questions. There was nothing she had seen to explain why they were altering items. But she was not yet ready to give up on answers. She turned a corner and made her way down the hall. Suddenly she heard something. It was coming from her head. So May picked up her pace. The sounds grew louder, resolving into a familiar mix of sounds. She had a feeling about what she was going to see. She reached an open door, and she was greeted with the sight of two Nekia workers grinding against each other. Their heated bodies moaned in pleasure. They were sprawled on the floor of what looked to be an office. The terminals were still active, while they were embroiled in bringing each other to the heights of passion. May watched for a moment, as they continued to grind their genitals against each other, while the girl on top was also fondling the girl below. It took a moment, but she noticed that the girl below was using the tip of her finger to scratch at their pussies as they rubbed back and forth. Then suddenly she stopped and arched her back while fluid gushed from below, as the girl on top tugged at her nipple. May blinked. The sight gave her an idea about why the break room she saw earlier was the way it was. She stopped watching and turned to one of the active terminals, approaching them. She looked them over, only to find little of interest. It turned out to be nothing more than a schedule. It was a schedule for when certain boxes were to be retrieved for alterations. On the next terminal, she found a workroom rotation schedule. It didn't seem that she was going to find answers in this room. So she ignored the lovemaking pair and slipped out of the room. Planning to keep looking, searching the area, she found several offices around her. It seemed that most of the terminals were not active at the moment. Those that were only hidden consequential stuff that dealt with running the place. She did find a few documents in one office detailing instructions on new boxes to be altered, and how their contents were to be altered. A nearby terminal had someone's half-worked-out schedule for that showing on screen, but the worker had not been around at the time, as the hours were growing late. She finally made her way out of the facility. She had decided that it wasn't going to shed much more light on what they were doing. The place had brought as many questions as it answered. Unfortunately to really know what they were doing was going to require more than simply observing. Making her way past the other fence she checked the time, and realized that she was later than she thought she would be. 
Kairu should be about done with her shift around now, and she was going to be late getting back to the apartment unless she hurried. Cursing in her mind she hurried along, stepped out onto the street feeling good. At the moment Kairu was the only one who had a job in the city to worry about, but that might change soon. Her interview had run long, but she thought it went well. Even if it didn't, it was not going to be a huge loss. It wasn't much of a job really. The local grocer was apparently hiring and she had applied for a cashier position. There were a few other applicants as well that they were considering. The job would be part-time just like Kairu's, just different hours. It would also pay better, and she knew some people liked to talk to the clerks. She knew it was a stretch but maybe she would hear something interesting while she was there. Even if she didn't, they could use the credits. Sure Megumi could add some credits to their account if they really needed that, but knew that was not something to rely on. Unfortunately, their spy work did not put food on the table because of that. It was just a problem they had to deal with, but they did need to blend in. Having jobs would help with that. Glancing at the clock, she noted it was best to head back to the apartment. Kairu would be getting off soon, and then they would be sharing their days. Feeling good about her day, she headed off towards the apartment. After the bulk of the patrons had left, Kairu found herself polishing a table by the entrance as the evening was coming to a close. There were only a handful of people left eating, and it would not be long before closing. She had made some good tips as well during the busy hour, and heard something that piqued her interest. It seemed a new fertility clinic was opening on the north side of the city. A few of the patrons were discussing it, trying to decide if they wanted to check it out or not. Remembering what happened in her own past, Kairu wondered if it was really a fertility clinic or something else. It seemed to her it was more likely to be something other than what the locals thought, with some other nefarious purpose being served. Suddenly the entry door chimed. Someone was coming in. She didn't glance at the door as it wasn't her job to greet the patrons, but a moment later she was wishing she had, as she was suddenly caught quite off guard by a familiar voice, one that didn't belong to any of her friends. I thought I sensed you in here, so you're my shadow. That wasn't a question but a statement. Kairi looked up feeling a lump in her stomach to see that the very same Anairai that she had followed the first day, and had been with earlier today. Alarms rang in her head. This wasn't good. This was not good at all. Maybe if she had looked up she would have had a chance to disappear, but now that was no longer an option. Um, yes? She squeaked. So you can speak. I didn't realize you were a Neki though. She paused and looked her over. Although clearly not an ordinary one. So what are you doing waiting tables? My uh, job. She replied still not quite certain about what was going on. The Anari girl slipped into a chair, and gestured at the chair opposite with a tentacle. While using a second to flag over one of her co-workers, understanding the gesture she sat, her co-worker arrived a moment later, and the Anari said, We would like two of the chef's special. Her co-worker, acting as if nothing was strange about that, said certainly, And would you like anything to drink? The Anairai replied, just water. She nodded and went off to do as requested. Then the Anairai girl turned back to her, and said, I figure we might as well have this conversation over a meal. She didn't know what to say so said nothing. The Anairai shrugged, anyway we haven't been properly introduced now have we? I am Kelly, and you are? Kairu wasn't sure what she would have expected to happen after being found like this, but a casual conversation was certainly not it. Kairu, she replied quietly. Kelly smiled. Kairu, eh? Lovely name for a shy beauty like you. I am still wondering what you are doing here waiting tables. Someone like you could have surely found better employment elsewhere? Kairu was quiet for a moment not quite sure what to say. And then after a moment she let out a breath. Well, um, I only recently arrived in the city. This was the best I could find on short notice. I see, interesting, she replied just as their food arrived. A plate of fried fish served atop pasta with a red sauce. Her co-worker placed a plate down in front of each of them, and a glass of water. Kelly thanked the waitress, who left to deal with one of the other customers here at this hour. Kairu actually was honestly hungry, but she hesitated to actually touch the plate. Kelly immediately started by mixing her pasta and sauce, moving the fish to the side. Then she said, if you are worried about who is paying, don't. I am, consider it a treat, if you will. She blinked. You are paying? I don't see a credit chit with you though. Kelly giggled. I have one, she replied and produced it from seemingly nowhere. I see, she replied, and finally touched her offered food. The two ate in silence for a few moments before the Anirai girl, Kelly, spoke up. You mentioned you are new to the city, but you do seem to get around. Find me interesting or something? As she said that she moved in a way that seemed cute, 
Kairu didn't say anything, but Kelly must have noted something as she said, I'll take that as a yes. Anyway, you aren't like the other Neku I have met. Most I can read like an open book, but you not so much. Any idea why that is? Kairu frowned. Not going to drag me off to the clinic to find out? Kelly giggled. That would be boring. Nah, I'm sure I could figure it out on my own. Kairu took a bite, and after a moment she shrugged. Maybe. Kelly stretched a little. Anyway it's actually kind of nice to find someone I can't read. Those inspections as I said can also get quite boring. Yeah, I saw. Some of them did seem similar. Then with a bit of worry creeping into her tone from here, she wondered, so uh, what happens now? Kelly frowned. Your kind normally make my kind forget our encounters with you. She elaborated. Oh that. She replied. Yeah that is true of normal Neku, but we both know you aren't normal. Now Kairu really didn't know what to think about this encounter. Before she could really consider a response or figure out where this was going, Kelly said, stand up and take those off. I want to see you. She blinked. Um, ah. Uh. Kelly frowned. Please stand and take those off. Kairu sighed, still a bit confused. But she stood anyway, not sure where this was about to go, and began to take them off. She blushed. It just didn't seem right to be naked here. She set the waitress uniform aside neatly on the stool. Kelly stood and looked her over. After a moment she walked around her before coming back to the front. Yeah, I thought so. You said earlier that this was the best job you could find on short notice. Why don't you work for me? I could use someone that I can actually talk to during these inspections, and it will pay better than this shitty job. You won't have to wear any stupid clothing either, so it will be a much better job all around. Kairu froze. 44. Chapter 52 Kelly's Offer Why don't you work for me? I could use someone that I can actually talk to during these inspections, and it will pay better than this shitty job. You won't have to wear any stupid clothing either, so it will be a much better job all around. Those words echoed in her head. Kairu had expected many things, but a job offer was not one of them. Worse, Kairu just knew that Kelly's offer would lead to teasing. You won't have to wear any stupid clothing either. She had said that so seriously and with such a happy straight face that it was evident that she actually believed it was a good bonus. Then again her kind didn't seem to wear clothing. But seriously what kind of job offer was that? Her mind then started to actually consider the implications of the offer. She was doomed. Trapped and doomed. Curse Kelly for offering a job like this. She had almost no choice but to take it. Well maybe she could refuse, but that would likely be just as bad or worse than taking it. Then there was the fact that this job offer represented a groundbreaking chance to gain an understanding of what the NRI were after. Not only did it give them easy access to an Inairai that Megumi could study if they played their cards right, she would finally have someone who could actually answer her questions. Well, some of them at least. She doubted that this girl could answer every question, as she was starting to get the feeling that Kelly was quite young. In some ways Kelly reminded her of herself when she was still a schoolgirl. A thought that quickly darkened her mood when she remembered she was now taking a virtual class full of 12-year-olds. It just felt wrong. Brushing that little problem aside she realized that Kelly was waving a tentacle in her face. Saying Nairi to Kairu, Nairi to Kairu, you still there? She blinked, composed herself, and after a moment she reluctantly said, I am, I accept. It had been strangely hard to say those words, and it felt like she had just doomed herself. Kelly raised her tentacles, yay. Then suddenly she grinned and then said, hey by the way, can you tell me how you become invisible? It's a really cool trick. Kairu was caught off guard and took a step back. I, uh, don't know. I just do. Kelly pouted. Don't be like that. I want you to teach me. Kairu sighed. Even if she knew how to do that, there was no way she would teach her that. Looking Kelly right in the eye she said, I really don't know how I do it. Could you tell me how you sense me when I don't want to be seen? Kelly frowned. Ah, uh, no. I, uh, just do. I figured it's just like that with me. I just disappear when I feel a certain way. Kelly's face brightened. Oh, I see. Her expression shifted. I really was hoping you could teach me, but I think I will figure it out. I've always been good at figuring tricks out. Just you watch. Kairu sighed. She really is young. Sometimes she acts mature and then at times like this. It's like dealing with a kid. Kairu wondered how old this girl really was. She was about to ask but suddenly the girl switched moods. Okay then. I need to pay the bill and then we can go to my place and work out your official employment contract. I'll take care of your current employment while I pay. Wait here please. Then before Kairu could say a word, 
a tentacle snatched her uniform, and the girl ran off to the counter. Even from here, she could hear the excited girl asking for the boss, and requesting her check so she could pay, at the same time no less, it was a miracle anyone understood her, she let out a breath, and silently watched while sending a text to her friends, she kept it brief, just enough to let them know she was probably going to be late, and that she would update them later, then she settled back into her chair, already she had the sinking feeling she was going to be having an interesting night, a very interesting night by the looks of it, she started sipping at her water, idly as she waited, it wasn't like she had much choice, thankfully it didn't take very long before her boss came out to meet Kelly, Kairu could overhear snippets of the conversation, but for the most part Kelly was quieter by then, she had little doubt that Kelly would have her current job taken care of quickly, they seemed to be good at manipulation after all, after about a minute her boss took her uniform from Kelly, and headed into the back, she waited, Kairu wasn't sure why, as she had missed part of the conversation, however she didn't have to wait long before she had a clue, her boss came back with what was clearly a credit transfer chit, and handed it to Kelly. Kelly turned around clearly happy and ran back to the table, she presented the chit to her with her chest puffed out, and said proudly, I got you taken care of, here is your last wage, and she seemed to like you so she was very willing to give you the full severance pay as well, despite your short tenure, Kairu chuckled as the image before her seemed oddly comical, she took the chit, and reached out, giving in to an urge to pat her on the head, the Anirai girl seemed pleased and leaned into her hand, although she only allowed it for about a minute before suddenly grabbing Kairu's hand, and pulling her along, Kairu could have easily resisted but she followed along, as it turned out Kelly actually lived nearby in a larger apartment building closer to the strange clinic, and less than a block from the restaurant she had been working at, in fact Kelly's apartment was closer to the restaurant than Kairu's, it seemed that her being found there was actually inevitable, if she had known she might have chosen a different restaurant, or at the very least she would have been more cautious about people coming in the door. Kairu stepped through the door of Kelly's fifth floor apartment after Kelly, and closed the door since she was the last in. Before looking around, it too opened into a sitting area, but it was much more nicely furnished with very comfortable looking sofas, a much nicer cam terminal sat on the wall and the tables in the room looked to be made of rare wood. Kelly led her to the hall door and ushered her into a second room. It was clearly an office that her own apartment didn't have. There was a lovely wooden desk that was polished to a shine. On it sat a terminal, and a document printer. There was a lovely chair behind the desk. Kelly made for the chair, and then pointed at a closet. I have spare chairs in there. Kairu retrieved one, and unfolded it in front of the desk before settling into it. Kelly smiled and tapped on her terminal. She switched into business mode where she promptly began laying out the terms of employment she was offering. Okay as a waitress you would have been lucky to make out with 2000 credits in a given month. That is not really great pay at all. Couriers typically make a little over double that in a month, which allows them comfortable living arrangements. My job offer is a little different from the standard courier job contract though since you will be my personal courier and helper. I'm offering you 5000 credits a month. Does that sound fair? she blinked, that was actually a good income around here, that amount of credits a month would be of great help to them, and was honestly a bonus, she nodded, yes, that does sound fair, after that she moved on to what the job would entail, Kairu wasn't entirely happy with what was required, but she swallowed her discomfort, one of the big things was that the uniform for it was effectively nude, she thanked her lucky stars that she was blessed with an enhanced body that didn't need support, Kairu would be fine with that, the other bit that gave her discomfort was that she would be doing a courier's work, she would be personally tied to Kelly, and be delivering only her instructions and follow-ups, but still, then there was the fact that she was also required to drive for her, and load her truck for her as well, in the case of inspection that would include getting the girls, Kelly takes, settled in the vehicle, they spent a few hours working through it, and ultimately she signed the employment contract, she had kind of already agreed after all, this was simply making it official, she wasn't looking forward to telling her friends though, Kairu just knew what would happen when she did, sure it was friendly, but that didn't make it comfortable, Kelly smiled when her signature was added to the paper copy, great, we are finally done, then she glanced at the clock, although it is rather late, stay here with me, I have an extra bed, Kairu shifted, um, my home isn't that far from here, though, Kelly stood up and gave her a look, stay with me, it will be fun, Kairu sighed, she was likely going to be later than she thought, if she got home at all today, 
She went ahead and sent another update to the others right then and there, in the end she ended up agreeing to stay, it didn't help that it almost seemed Kelly would cry if she didn't, Kelly showed her around the place after she agreed to share, the apartment turned out to be smaller than her own, it had an office, a foyer, a small kitchen, a bathroom, and one bedroom, the bedroom was actually bigger than her own, the second bed turned out to be a foldable on the opposite wall from Kelly's. Kelly was quite proud to show it off, with a smile she turned away from the spot, and puffed her bare chest out as the bed unfolded itself from the wall. See, it's going to be just like those sleepovers neck you girls love, Kairu smiled wryly, that explained why she was so adamant about her staying the night. Kelly must have been wanting a sleepover for a while, I see Kairu said, I take it you've wanted a sleepover for a while? Kelly nodded. Yeah, I've tried before, but it didn't work out right. With Neku girls I can't really enjoy it when I constantly know what they are thinking. Why liar any girls? She trailed off. Kairu closed the distance and gave the girl a hug. She had a feeling that the irony girl needed it. Besides she wasn't too worried about her getting into her head. She had already been touched by the girl a few times. Kelly let her hold her a moment, and then rushed to her bed. It had been a long time since she had last had a sleepover, but she figured it wouldn't hurt to indulge the girl. A part of her was happy that her headset was back home, so she had an excuse not to use the program. Maybe it would be nice to have a normal dream for once. 44. Chapter 53 Answers and Inspections I, Kairu stretched a bit, as she slipped out of bed. A glance at the other bed revealed Kelly to still be fast asleep. Last night had definitely been interesting. Quietly she made for the door, while sending a more detailed update to her friends. She had no doubt that May and K would be a little worried about her. She wasn't looking forward to them finding out about her new job though. Especially with how Kelly had presented it. She turned red just thinking about what they would do. Reaching the bathroom, she went inside to take care of morning business. At the same moment, she opened a hail to the ship. She had something to talk about with Megumi. Her holographic face soon appeared in her head. Megumi smiled. I was waiting for you to call. You are one very lucky girl. You know that? That's one way to call it. So I've read your reports. Enjoy the sleepover? It was interesting. Kairu replied. That's good. You know this situation with Kelly represents a unique opportunity if we play our guards right. I'll let you know when I am ready, but at a future date I would like you to have another sleepover. I see. I suspect she might propose one on her own though. I'll let you know when she does. That works. Anyway, I wish you luck with a new job. With that, Megumi closed the channel. Kairu turned slightly red as she thought about it. She couldn't believe she actually agreed to a job that requires her to be naked. Kelly thought she was doing her a favor there too. Kairu turned on the shower, trying to distract herself with the act of cleaning her body. After her shower, Kelly woke up and took care of her own morning business. When Kelly was done she asked her, so what are the morning plans, and what about breakfast? She smiled, the maid will take care of that, she'll let herself in and cook it for me in a bit. Join me in the office. I have a couple of calls to make. We need to make sure the residents I'll be inspecting today followed instructions. Kairu replied, hm. followed instructions? Kelly nodded, yep. For inspection, they were asked to make sure all members stay home. That way we can get everyone inspected at once. Doesn't work well if they aren't all there. Now does it? She had to admit they seemed to rely on that. In fact, this little bit merely confirmed one of her previous suspicions, as she had been a little suspicious of everyone being present at all the houses they visited yesterday. That actually makes sense. I kind of suspected that might be the case. Kelly smiled. Well, it is the best way to get things done. Anyway, when the maid gets here, I'll ask her to get you a courier belt. She nodded and followed Kelly to the office, where she immediately settled behind the desk and started making calls. Each call was short and to the point so it only took her a few minutes to work through her list of people to make a call on. When she was done, she stretched. Looks like we are all good. Now we can go over today's schedule. Kyra nodded. It seemed Kelly was back in business mode. First on the order at the day is breakfast. Of course, she said while tapping on her terminal. Inspections don't start till noon, so we will have some time to kill. I plan to hit the local mall today. See if I can't find any young necker with potential. Kairu tried not to let her feelings on that show, she told herself that this was only temporary, that taking this job was a great way to learn what they were up to, what exactly they were doing, already it was answering questions, and confirming suspicions. She had no doubt a lot more questions would be answered by the end of the day. Kelly continued, if we find anyone, 
We will take them to the clinic while we are there. I ask that you stay close to me, and try to act normal. I don't want the others to try and poach you from me. Kairu didn't need her to tell her that. Although she was pretty sure that Kelly's idea of normal and hers were a little different. She nodded. Yeah, I figured. Kelly smiled. We'll be stopping at the vehicle yard to get my truck, and a little before noon. We can grab a second courier while we are there or do you think you will be okay on your own? Kairu had seen them do their work before. I think I can manage. I was watching yesterday. She nodded, and said, I thought so. Just then there was a knock on the office door. A second later, a young Nekia walked in. She smiled. Kairu guessed this must be the maid. Although she was completely naked. What would you like for breakfast today mistress? Kelly quickly gave out an order, and the girl nodded. Heading off to go cook for her, and to get a courier belt as Kelly wanted her to. While Kelly turned back to her terminal. Kairu was curious, so uh, Kelly what are you doing on the terminal anyway? She sighed. My bills. I am very busy most days so I like to do them in the morning. Then her expression shifted. Maybe you would like to do them for me? I don't really know anything about your financials though. Kelly nodded. Yeah that is a problem, and we have a busy day ahead of us. Maybe another time then. Before she knew it Kairu was at the mall with Kelly. There was a large one not too far from the apartment. Despite the early hour it was already fairly busy with many Neki prowling the various shops. As they entered the mall, Kelly watched people filter into a clothing store. She then commented, I'll never understand you Neku and your tendency to waste good credits on stupid clothes. Kyra replied, it's not a waste to them. Yes, it is. Especially with those Neku who buy an outfit or only wear it once. Kyra giggled, well yeah, that is a waste. I'll give you that. Kairu replied, at least you are sensible enough to see that. Kairu was silent after that, as she considered a reply. While Kelly led them to the clothing shop, as they entered Kairu decided no reply was best, mainly since she just had no idea how to explain the need for clothes to a girl that has never worn them and doesn't understand them. So instead she looked around the store, there were a number of young girls and women around from varying age groups. It was the middle of the week no less, and yet she saw girls of school age, and their mothers around. If you thought about it, that wasn't too surprising. The school age girls would likely disappear over the next couple of hours as the time for school drew near. As for the older women, they likely had free time now, but wouldn't later. It really depended on their schedules. Kelly was surveying the crowd and approached a younger girl with her mother. Mom was holding up a pink dress next to her, clearly trying to see how she might look in it. Kairu came up nearby. Kelly simply watched the girl for a moment, and then smiled. She commented to Kairu, I think we got lucky. First shop and already some potential. Kelly approached the girl, with a smile. Then she said, you have a lovely daughter here. I think she has potential. The woman nearby put the dress back, and said thank you. I'm going to take her, help her get her clothes off. The woman nodded, and the daughter cooperated as she was soon stripped naked. Kairu sighed. It seemed she was witnessing another bold kidnapping. Although this time she was actually close enough to hear what was being said, it was kind of odd to see the disconnect between what they were doing, and saying. Along with the expressions, as Kelly took the younger girl's hand, she turned to the mother, take the outfit with you and finish your business here, when you get home you are to start packing your daughter's things. Split them into for sale, for storage, and for donation. I want anything that would remind you of her be it a photo, school project or decoration packed for storage. Go ahead and pack her bedding in for storage as well, you won't be needing it for a while. As for her clothes pack them for either sale or donation, preferably for sale. Pack her toys for donation unless you think they will sell well in which case you pack them in for sale. When you are done I want you to contact us, and a courier will be dispatched to collect the stuff. Kelly pushed the girl's hand into Kairu's then, and said, since you are here, Lead her for me. Let's keep looking before we go back to the clinic. Kyra nodded, following Kelly deeper into the shop. It seemed Kelly was back in hunter mode. She did have a question though. So what exactly are we collecting these girls for? Kelly smiled. Many reasons actually. Neko with potential are very valuable. They can be put to a number of uses once they have been properly trained and conditioned that is. We also need to carefully nurture and awaken that potential. A process that can usually take months or sometimes years. It depends on the girl. Kairu frowned. Does that mean that this girl might not see her mother for several months? At the minimum, yes. She will be fine though, and much better off for it. It really depends on what we decide she would be best at. About that, 
What uses might she be put towards? Kelly didn't answer as she got distracted by another girl. She rushed over to her. This one was older and seemed to be on her own. She looked the teenager over for a moment then asked her. You here alone or something? Yeah, I am. What about it? Was her reply. Kelly gave her a bit of a glare. You're a bit rude. Let me guess you came here to skip school? The girl's mood shifted. I did. Kelly turned to Kairu. This girl here is a perfect example of that. Good girls would attend school like they are supposed to. Not go gallivanting at the mall. It's usually the mother's own inadequacy at disciplining her kids. You neck you can be too soft with your kids. Kairu sighed. She disagreed. This girl was likely just in her rebellious phase. Then there was the whole fact that the Anira had done something with the men. That was part of the parenting process. And they removed that whole option. Some children, especially teens, tend to rebel against their parents. It's a phase. She will grow out of it. Kelly just shook her head. That is no excuse for this. Then she focused on the girl looking her over thoroughly before saying, take those off, and go sell them to the shop. Then come back to me. The teenager nodded, and did just that. She stripped and then sold her own clothes at the counter before coming back over. Kairu was surprised at that. When the girl came back, Kelly told her, you are coming with me. I think you have some potential, and you are in dire need of training. The girl nodded. Joining their odd group, Kelly led the way out of the clothing shop, heading into a nearby toy shop for her next stop. Announcement. Anxious for more? I do have a Patreon, where you can read over 10 chapters ahead. If you enjoyed the chapter do drop a comment, as I love hearing from you. 42. Chapter 54 Answers and Inspections 2 As they stepped out of yet another shop with a number of naked girls in tow, Kairu asked a question that was on her mind. Maybe Kelly would answer it. Out of curiosity, why are we hunting in the mall? Wouldn't you find more girls if you visit a school? Kelly nodded. Yes, but I haven't been tasked with that, and as I said earlier, this is technically my free time. I do have a school inspection coming up in my schedule though. We start inspecting the schools around this time every year. That would explain why they hadn't seen an Anira inspecting a school yet. Between her cell's own recent arrival, and the apparent long intervals between Anira school inspections there had simply not been enough chances to cross paths with an inspection in progress, quite yet. It sounds like they might encounter one soon enough going by Kelly's comment. Although there was still the question of what they were doing with the girls. Unfortunately, Kelly hadn't provided a clear answer to that one quite yet. Her answers so far had worryingly indicated that these girls they were taking may be separated from their families for months, or even years. While who knows what was being done to them, undoing what the Anira had done to the Imperium was starting to look like a logistical nightmare. So many displaced and brainwashed young girls, separated families, and more. Fixing this mess was not a task she envied. At least Megumi was an AI. One she had every confidence could fix this problem. The problem was would she have enough time? Ava had mentioned some rogue assimilator. That sounded like a problem that would need to be nipped in the bud before it could become a threat. You do inspections every year? Kelly nodded. Yep we have been for a few years now. As new potentials emerge, people like me locate them so that they can be trained and awakened. Kairu blinked. Emerge? She was silent for a moment shifting on her feet a little. What do you mean by emerge? Kelly stopped in her tracks and turned around. Not every Nekya has potential. We have found a way which makes it so that almost every Nekya can be nudged into developing it. Don't ask me how, but we have been nudging the Nekya into developing potential. We hope that eventually the entire population will develop potential. Although that may take some years more. Kairi wanted to smile. That sounded like something very interesting, and something important. Unfortunately by the sound of it, Kelly wouldn't be able to tell her anything really interesting about this item. Still, she found it interesting that they were somehow nudging Neku into developing potential. Something her cell had determined to be related to Shinix. It still left unanswered exactly why they wanted Neku with potential. What exactly was being done to them was also left unanswered. She had tried asking, but Kelly had left that question unanswered. She sent an update to Megumi. Almost immediately she received a text. Interesting. That indicates a rather advanced knowledge of bioengineering. We will have to look into this. In the meantime continue to stay with Kelly. She has been quite helpful. After digesting the text, Kairu decided to try asking again. So she asked, I see, so what do you need so many neck with potential for? As I said before there are many uses. Maybe I'll give you more specifics later. Kairu sighed it seemed the girl was deliberately avoiding the question. Now that left her wondering why. 
Hopefully she would find out before too long. She didn't learn more at the mall, and the visit to the clinic afterwards was brief. She stayed close to Kelly, and didn't speak unless she had to while there. They simply delivered the girls and stayed long enough to see them assessed. Before she knew it, she was driving Kelly out to the neighborhood she had been inspecting yesterday. She landed the truck on a neighboring block as instructed, and helped Kelly out of the vehicle. Kelly smiled at her, and then said, Thanks Kairu, knock on the first door for me will you? Kairu sighed, she could scarcely believe she had actually agreed to do this. Once again she briefly wondered what she was thinking, taking a job like this. The cool breeze even reminded her of the fact that she was walking around practically naked. The only thing she was wearing was a courier's belt. It was hardly adequate clothing in her opinion. It only took a moment before her own training helped her put those feelings aside. She headed for the first door. She already knew which residences they were inspecting. As Kelly had gone over that on the way over, they were only doing this one block today. Last time the truck had been full after doing a block, and Kelly said there was a good chance of the same today. She knocked on the door, three times like she had seen the other courier do. After a moment a young girl answered the door, seeming a bit excited. Kairu was kind of hoping that she didn't have potential, as she was quite young. Kelly smiled at the little one, and said allow us in. This is an inspection, and leave the door open. The girl nodded, and stepped back as she had already opened the door wide in her excitement about someone being at the door. The pair headed in, and Kelly told the girl to fetch her family. Although her mother was already entering the room, the mother frowned at them entering. Can I help you too? Kelly nodded. Yes this is an inspection. The mother's frown vanished, and she nodded. Not long after, her little girl came back with her three older sisters. It seemed the first house of the day was a larger household. Kelly, looking at the little girl smiled and said thank you, sweetie. Now take those off, and go with Kairu dear. Kairu blinked, huh? You haven't. She's way too young to be checking for suitability. I already checked her potential. It's high. I'll get quite the bonus for one as young as her with that much potential. Kairu was now a little confused. It seemed there was more to this inspection than just looking for potential. The little one was already naked and had come over. So Kairu took her hand and led her out to the truck. She made sure the girl was comfortable. And after hesitating a moment headed back where she was promptly given two of the other sisters. She led them back to the truck and made them comfortable before coming back. Already she had questions about the little one. Do you know what will happen to her? Kelly said, depends on what the others decide. But since she is that young the others will take their time training her. It will be a few years before she sees her family again. Why ask? Don't you think it's a little cruel to be taking her from them so young? Kelly shook her head. Nah she'll be better off for it. Trust me. Besides, they won't miss each other. I'll make sure of that. Kairu sighed. She clearly wasn't getting through to her. Internally she made a note to make this right later, when she has the chance. As for Kelly's comment about not missing each other, that was only because they were being brainwashed to effectively forget each other. That was something she hadn't done to them quite yet, but she already had the remaining girls packing, clearing out clothes and mementos, practically sanitizing the home of the individuals being removed today. Kairu decided to ask something else. You said something about getting a bonus for her. What was that about? Kelly said, I get paid for every girl with potential I bring back. Younger girls with higher potential however are worth more. Kairu frowned, not sure what to think about that. After a moment she remembered something from yesterday. Yesterday you commented about this neighborhood being selected. Selected for what? Kelly lit up. Oh, you will quite like it when we are done. No one here will be wearing stupid clothes, and most of your silly taboos will have been drained out of you. We are making this into a district for us and enhanced Neku only. Normal Neku won't be allowed in this neighborhood. After all we can't trust them near our children, and quite a few of them will be running around this neighborhood soon enough. Kairu wasn't sure what to think about that. It implied a few things about what they were planning about this neighborhood. A few big questions had been added as a result however. What did she mean with this mention of enhanced Neku? Kairu guessed it had something to do with the girls they found suitable and were taking during these inspections. Then Kelly's mood shifted, anyway enough with the questions, let's talk about something else. Kyra nodded, ah, sure. What do you want to talk about? K was taking a walk, she was a little worried about Kairu since she hadn't seen her since yesterday, and she was being cryptic about what happened. At least she had heard from Kairu, which indicated that she was at least alright, but that didn't make her less worried. So to take her mind off the problem she decided to take a walk, especially since she had the free time for it. 
she felt some more fresh air would do her some good. She rounded the corner. Several houses came into view and down the road a school could be seen. It was one of the many public schools in the city. It was actually a fair distance from their apartment. She recalled on the map that there were a couple of schools closer to her apartment. Not that it mattered, it wasn't a point of interest. Not as far as they could tell anyway. It seemed no different from any other school. Her mind wandered back to what she had witnessed at the bank. Remembering how that woman had been asked to make herself available for a four-day weekend. She was honestly curious as to what they were planning with that. What was the purpose of that? Clearly they were going to do something to her. Was it just brainwashing or something more? Before she could linger on speculation however she noticed an Anira girl cross the street towards the school. Even from here she was quite noticeable since the streets near the school were nearly empty since it was midday. It would be a few hours yet before things get busy around here. However was wondering why she was heading to the school at this hour. Seeing no one looking her way, she cloaked. Then she approached. She was worried that this girl would be able to sense her through the cloak like the other girl that Kairu had followed, but she was too curious not to take the risk. She followed her into the building trying to keep her distance as much as possible. She did have to hurry though to get in the door before it closed. Announcement Sorry this was supposed to have dropped last week. To make up for that failure, you will have two chapters dropped today. Also if you are hungry for more you can always check out my Patreon where you can read up to chapter 71 in advance chapters all available in the first tier, 35, chapter 55, and the school inspection. Clocked around after coming in the door, she had never been to a school before. This clearly looked like the front office. There was a large reception counter nearby with a couple of bored looking women manning the counter. Behind the counter she could see a few more women milling about. From the look of it. They were all busy with office work. It seemed normal enough. She was still wondering what the Anira she had followed was doing here. Thankfully the answer was quick in arriving. The irony girl walked up to the counter. I'm here for the bi-yearly inspection. Is everything ready for me in the nurse's office? The woman at the counter nodded. Yes of course. The couriers arrived and set everything up already. They finished an hour ago. Good. I'll go take a look. Go ahead and call the first class up here from their checkup. The woman nodded, and the atmosphere of the office changed instantly. While the Anira turned from the counter and walked down the hall, followed her discreetly. So far it seemed she hadn't been noticed. That seemed good. Hopefully that luck would hold. The Anira, as it turned out, was heading straight for the nurse's office with the confidence of someone who had been here before. From the sound of it there was a good chance that she had indeed been here before. The nurse's office was a modest affair with a few beds, an office, and an exam room. There was even a waiting area. It was a modest one, with a few cheap chairs and nothing else. But a waiting area nonetheless existed. As for the exam area, the room was closed so she couldn't see inside. It was positioned on one side of the waiting area, and had a door on either side. The school apparently was big enough that they had two nurses, both young women, on duty when the Anira came into the room. K found an out-of-the-way spot in the room, while the Anira girl ordered the two nurses to strip. Once they were both naked, she smiled. There, much better. Just toss those in a cabinet or something, and get the clothes bins ready for the first class. They should be here soon. That statement proved true because not long after a gaggle of schoolgirls arrived, they were quickly lined up in the waiting area and made to strip out of their clothes tossing them into the provided bins before joining the line waiting in front of the exam room the anira girl looked over the group with clear satisfaction before slipping into the exam room K followed her closely unlike the rest of the office the exam room didn't quite look normal there was some strange equipment set up in the room a tray full of bizarre tools was set up next to a strange chair with straps. Alien hardware was set against one wall, and there were a number of monitors set up against a second. She barely had time to consider the equipment before the first girl walked in. The Anira immediately began to physically probe the girl with her tentacles. The Anira's touch was clearly professional and clinical. After a moment she stepped back, and then ordered the girl to sit in the chair. The moment the girl sat down she was strapped in. The Anira began hooking up various sensors to her body, occasionally employing those strange tools as well. It didn't take long to recognize what this was. It was a full biometric assessment, a very invasive one, but also more. The knowledge was born with allowed her to read the monitors. More importantly, they allowed her to recognize what the Anira was doing. She made note of what was being done as part of her future report. After a moment, the girl was released. The Anira smiled. All right we are done here. You may return to class, and forget what happened here. 
The girl nodded, and slipped out of the back door of the room. The Anari called for the next girl, so a second girl walked in. This exam started much the same with a physical inspection followed by being strapped into the chair, but this time there was only a very invasive full biometric assessment. The other procedure wasn't done with this girl. When she was let out the Anari smiled, we are done, you go wait by the beds for now. The girl nodded and exited the exam room as well, setting the tone for what followed. Most of the girls ended up having that extra procedure done to them and then they were told they could go back to class while being ordered to forget the exam. Others ended up being asked to wait. When the first class was done she called for a second. The Anira headed back out into the main part of the office, followed. Not long after, a pair of couriers arrived to shepherd the selected girls. The Anira told them to escort the girls to the trucks, and then come back to collect the next class, a class that arrived not long after the first class left, whose treatment largely followed the first. While watching she considered the mention of trucks. She had not seen any but she presumed they must be somewhere near the school, possibly where the students are dropped off by buses. She remembered seeing a few Griff buses picking up students every morning. Each girl was examined and then either operated on and sent back, or asked to wait. Once a full class was done the couriers would lead the waiting girls back to the vehicle, stuck around watching hoping for more answers, more clues. Yet the Anari girl was very professional and said nothing more than she needed to. Eventually the last class left the final selectees being escorted by couriers out of the room. It was at that moment that she suddenly received a surprise, one that she had not been expecting. She hadn't any warning it was coming at all. The Anari girl closed the door behind the last students, and turned to face Wick was standing, her expression giving nothing away. You can come out now, I know you are there. Kuk gulped, but said nothing. She didn't decloak either, but it seemed that this Anari could sense her. This wasn't good. Not good at all and she had just closed the door, maybe she should not have followed, the Anari crossed her uppermost pair of tentacles, quite the shy one, now aren't we, K kept silent, she felt that it was best, the Anari girl was baiting her, she was sure of it, even so, her mind was already working through her options, most of which would simply confirm that she had been there, she wasn't worried about being caught, as she could get out of this, the question was could she get out without alerting the entire Anairai population to the presence of cloaked spies, the Anairai's expression shifted, fine be that way, just stay there, K felt a bit of relief surge through her as the Anairai girl turned to the two nurses, that was the last group, yes, the two nodded, good, tell the principal to arrange a general assembly of all students and staff, I have to talk to them all after all, they headed out, K tried to follow, but before she could get to the door her path was blocked, the Anari closed the door behind them with a tentacle, and glared in her direction. I didn't say you could leave, perhaps it was too soon for relief. This one seemed rather troublesome, how was she going to get out of this? May stepped out of the apartment, she didn't have any leads to follow up at the moment. K was off on a walk, and she had barely heard from Kairu since she didn't come back yesterday. She was a little worried, but she felt Kairu was going to be alright. Although she knew K was more worried than she let on. It was why had gone to take a walk. Honestly she was getting a little bored herself. There was nothing to do all alone in that apartment. May figured she could find something to do, and she remembered what had mentioned about the bank. She decided that since it was previously a point of interest she might be able to find more clues there that had missed. Then there was always going back to the storage facility. Although she had the feeling that she would need to actually interrogate someone to learn more about what was happening there. No. What she was thinking about doing was hanging around the bank, watching what the visitors were doing might help her find more households that the Anari were actively brainwashing. There was also the whole matter of what they were doing with these black bank accounts that they were making people consolidate their money into, since that wasn't just a precursor to being disappeared. She wondered what was up with that. The bank seemed to be her best bet for finding the answers to those questions. With a destination in mind she made her way to the elevator. On her way down. A courier girl pushing a large box labeled for storage entered at the second floor stop. She briefly read the more detailed label and marked another residence to be checked. May did not bother to follow the courier although their paths did briefly coincide as they both got off at the same stop and took the same route out of the building. They parted ways outside, however, and she headed for the bank. The rest of the walk to the bank was uneventful. She spotted a few couriers, and some an milling about doing who knows what. 
The couriers had all previously been tagged so she ignored them. The bank itself was modestly busy with a few scattered customers. Unlike when Kwa was here there were no Inairai in sight. That made her feel a little safer about being here. She had cloaked before coming in, so she approached the counters. May had no worry about anyone spotting her right now. The only threat to her was an Inairai, as only they could sense a cloak to Biomic. Well the stronger ones anyway, as Kairu had found out on day one. There was already a customer at the counter she chose, but she was merely making a deposit, nothing truly suspicious. Then again Kairu had no way to know if that deposit was into a black account. Some part of her doubted that was the case though. She made herself comfortable, and started to watch the line, figuring it would not be too long before something interesting would happen. She was rewarded not too long after she arrived. The first few people to show up were all there for either a quick deposit or withdrawal. When finally someone came up with a different reason to be there, it was a younger woman who came up to the counter, and she was a rare sight as well. She was pregnant. Something May had only seen a few times, May wasn't surprised about pregnancy being rare since there were no men in sight. She had not seen one since they entered the city. So either this girl came from out of the city, or she was pregnant before the men vanished. She lacked the info needed to confirm either theory though. The young woman was asked what she needed help with, and she replied to the receptionist, I'm here to consolidate my accounts and to make a deposit. That sounded suspicious, it matched up with what had observed previously. The possibility that this woman was moving her money into a black account was high. In any case she had a feeling that this was promising. 39. Interlude. She leaned back in her chair, it had been a busy day for her, thankfully it was nothing unusual just the normal routine stuff. Already she was looking forward to some relaxation. She had a very cute and lovely neck waiting for her. One she had some wonderful plans for. She slipped out of the room a moment later. Her day was done after all. Heading down the hall to meet her favorite little nephew. She had asked her to wait for her some time ago, and now she can finally have her fun. Her mind drifted to how they had met as she walked down the hall. It had started a couple of years ago. The Neku girl in question had just been brought in for some standard training after she had transferred her assets into a black account. One that they controlled, that was rather important actually. The training programs weren't cheap and the black accounts played a role in how they were funded among other things. That girl's money was used not only to pay for her own training but also the training of any of her dependents. Although in her case that was a grand total of zero which left more money for her training. Well, that and other things they used it for. Her being on her own had in fact factored into why she had not been taken straight to training in the first place. It wasn't the only thing the money they took from her would be used for, as once she put it in the black account it was theirs to do with as they saw fit. Besides, they would make better managers for it anyway, as they were less prone to wasting credits on silly things like clothing. Most Neku were not very good at managing their money in the first place. She remembered the impression that girl had left on her when she came in for her training that day. She was the most beautiful flower in the room, a stunning beauty, and the last couple of years had only served to make her even more beautiful. Back then she might have tried to take the girl right then and there, but she wanted to savor the catch. She had spent the last two years slowly seducing the girl, and now she was finally hers. Finally hers, and she was going to take full advantage. She rubbed her belly, it was past due she found someone, anyway. The timing could not have been better for her. Finally, she reached her destination where a very naked Nekia was indeed waiting for her. It was time for some fun. Announcement. I hope you enjoyed all the drops today. If you are hungry for more, my Patreon has up to chapter 71 available. 37. Chapter 56 in trouble. K had no idea how she was going to get out of this without getting revealed. Her path was blocked. The door closed again, and with it her only exit. A part of her was wishing she had Kairu's luck right about now, not that she had much time to think about that. She looked around the room, it didn't seem that the Anairai girl was going to just let her go, and worse she saw no other exits, she backed away from the Anairai girl, as she didn't feel comfortable being so close to her, it would be so helpful if she had something that would let her go through solid objects, but she didn't. The Anairai didn't follow her, still standing by the door said, I can do this all day, so stop being shy and show yourself. Her mind ran through her options once again. She could kill her, but that would just create new problems, both immediate and long term. Then remembered that Kairu had brought a pistol with a stun setting, and suddenly she was kicking herself. She had followed the Anairai in here, but she didn't bring a stun weapon with her. In fact Kairu had left her pistol back in the apartment, and K could have brought it with her. 
Now she was wishing she had brought it with her, as that would have given her a way out. Feeling pressed, she made a call for help to her cell with her location in it. Kyra replied first with a text that said, Sorry I'm in the suburbs, and rather occupied at the moment, can't slip away. Then May responded, at the bank. Might take a while before I'm free, can you wait? Her heart sank, Kyru was one thing, but May too? She had left her at the apartment. What was she doing at the bank? This certainly couldn't wait though. Once again her mind was furiously trying to work out how she was going to get out of this. The only thing that came to mind was trying to lean away from the door. Only the question was how. She hadn't followed her at all, but had stayed by the only door out of the office. She looked around. There didn't seem to be any other exit at all. Not in the main area anyway. There were a few windows by the beds, but they were high and narrow. She didn't think she would be able to get out through them. The exam room didn't have a way out. That left only the small office that she hadn't been in. She suspected that the nurse's terminal would be in there, but perhaps there would be a way out as well. She glanced back at the door. The Anirai hadn't moved. The girl was still looking in her direction with tentacles crossed. That door was definitely out. Trying the office it is. She headed for the door to the small office, and opened it slipping inside. Looking around she sighed. There was indeed a terminal in here, along with a desk and a few cabinets. There was also a door. Hopefully, it was an exit. She moved towards it, even as she noted the Anirai girl was now moving towards her. It better be a way out or she would be cornered. In her mind the Anirai feeling the need to actually move was a sign that this was a way out. Only for that feeling to be shattered a moment later when she opened the second door and came face to face with a closet filled mainly with clean sheets and bedding for the medical beds in the other room. She even noted a laundry machine in the closet, and several spare uniforms hanging in the closet. There wasn't a way out though. Turning around, the Anirai girl was now blocking the entrance to this little office. She should have tried the windows, but she had to be stupid. She tried the office. This just wasn't her day. Ready to show yourself yet? She didn't reply to that, but instead looked at the door behind her. K had few options left. Do what the Anirai wants and a cloak. Rush her, try and kill her, or simply see how long she really wanted to wait. She just didn't see waiting as an option. Killing her was again risky. The plasma discharge would likely draw even more attention. A dead Anirai would also bring too many questions, and put them on guard. So she ruled that out as well, as she couldn't carry the dead body with her. Her cloak wasn't designed to take that much extra volume. She tried to rush her, only to be grabbed by several tentacles. They gripped her firmly in an instant. K tried to shake them off, but the Anirai held her firmly. She could have easily broken the girl's grip, but not without hurting her. The Anirai then proudly declared, Got you. She slumped into her grip, so the girl did. Not that Kwa was happy about it. She let out her breath and dropped her cloak. Sheepishly she looked over her shoulder where she caught the smug grin on the alien's face. There you can see me. Happy now? The alien giggled. You're so cute. K felt her tail stiffen. That wasn't the reaction she was expecting. She suddenly felt very worried for a different reason. The alien ignored her reactions and then said, That was a neat trick though. How did you do it? K decided to play dumb. It just seemed to be the best play, I don't know, I uh, disappear when I feel a certain way, the alien gave her a look, really? <clears throat> well no matter, I'll figure that little bit out later, that was one problem dodged for now anyway, there were others that she still needed to get out of now, if only she had been more careful, but she hadn't seen any signs that the Anira holding her right now had been aware of her, C couldn't help but berate herself for this, she had taken a risk, and now here she was, being burned for that same risk. It was a mistake, she should have kept her distance. Now wasn't the right time for what ifs though. She knew she had made a mistake. Now she had to fix things. Worriedly she asked, so uh, what happens now? The Anirai girl chuckled. Well let's see. I had to catch you, so you have been a very naughty girl. She was a bit worried, but suddenly the Anirai girl released her. She straightened up and glanced right at the door. Oh, no you don't. I haven't said you can leave yet said the Anirai as a tentacle wrapped around her wrists. She sighed. It seemed the Anirai wasn't going to let her go until she was satisfied. Fine, what do you want? The Anirai girl smiled. Now we are getting somewhere. First take those off. Let me see you. K let out a breath of course she would want to start with that. Well it wasn't a problem, although she imagined Kairu would be blushing. That girl seemed to like being naked, but she was strangely resistant to being nude. K slipped out of her dress, dropped her panties, and removed her shoes. She hadn't bothered with a bra since she didn't need one. The panties weren't much needed either, but they came with the outfit. Happy? The Anirai nodded, and said, yes. 
Thankfully someone interrupted before she could be asked too many questions. This gave her time to consider any answers to the questions she was short to ask. The interruption was someone coming by to let her know the assembly had been convened as requested, and can actually ended up being dragged along to the thing. Apparently so that the Anairai could keep an eye on her. K had no doubt she wasn't going to be let go until the Anairai was satisfied. The assembly went just about how one would expect. With the Anairai girl giving the staff and students instructions. Instructions to not think about the missing students. The staff had also been ordered to forward everything they had on the students she took. K had an idea on why they would need the data so that they knew where to follow up. At the moment however, she now found herself sitting next to the Anairai girl in one of the trucks that had been sitting in the bus area as she suspected. They had been parked there to pick up the school girls. The vehicles had only recently departed the school, and the Anairai girl had turned her full attention back to K. OK cutie. Now that we have some time why don't you introduce yourself? I am called Zella, and you are? She hesitated for a moment before replying. K, my name is K. Zella smiled. Well K, I have quite a few questions for you. Let's start with what you were doing in the school. She felt being honest might go further here. Naturally there were things she couldn't say, but truth wouldn't hurt. She sighed. I was taking a walk. I was trying to take my mind off something. When I caught sight of you entering the school. She looked down, I let my curiosity get the better of me. Zella gave her a look, so you just followed me on a whim? K nodded, that really was the case. I was hoping there would be more to it than that. So, ah, uh, what were you trying to take your mind off of anyway? K glanced out the window. Um, well, someone important to me didn't come home last night from work. She sent a few texts, but I get the feeling she isn't telling me something. I'm kind of worried about her honestly. Zella leaned forward, maybe I can help then. What's her name? Or better yet her citizen id number? Maybe I can find her. K shook her head. No it's alright. I'm sure she will be home by the time I get back. I'll ask her what's up next time I see her. Zella shrugged, and leaned back. Have it your way then. K turned back to the window. Watching the scenery moving below them, it wasn't hard for her to guess where they were going, and she noticed they were almost there. A part of her was worried about what would happen when they landed. So have you been in the city long? She blinked, surprised by the question, and looked back at her. I'd guess no, because I'm sure I would have heard mention of someone like you, if you had been here long. So what brought you to the city? K sighed. Yeah, I arrived a few days ago. As for what brought me here, well that is personal. I would prefer not to discuss it. Zara gave her another look. You make it kind of hard to get to know you. What with evading my questions and all. She didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. As it was, she wanted to be anywhere but here. She turned back to the window again. Idly, she noted some movement but was surprised by Zala's next words. Well I have some business to attend to. So where do you live? Looking back she frowned, and opened her mouth to speak. Don't worry I am just going to drop you off. Just don't go anywhere. I'll be checking up on you later. You're letting me go? She said, somewhat not believing it. Announcement. Hungry for more? Join me on Patreon where you can read up to chapter 72. 39. Chapter 57 May and the Pregnant Nephew at the Bank The pregnant woman's visit went pretty routine at first. A fact that lined up with the previous observations Cree laid to her. The receptionist did most of the work on the computer before asking her to come back to sign some papers. May followed her into the back to watch. The receptionist had taken them to a small office where she had produced the documents and went over them with the pregnant nephew. They were just the standard documents in finalizing the closing and transfer of the money in multiple accounts. After the documents were signed, and the finalizing of the transfer of all her assets into the suspected black account was where things got interesting. The receptionist smiled as the last document was signed. All right we are done here. Is there anything else you need? The woman replied. Yes. I have a call I need to make. Can I do it here? The receptionist replied certainly. There is a com terminal on the desk. I will leave you alone while you make your call. May smiled to herself and did to stop her newfound tail from wagging, lest it knock something over. She wondered how the Neku dealt with them. Not for the first time either. Her life had definitely been easier without one. Meanwhile the receptionist showed the woman the terminal on the desk, and activated it before leaving the room. The pregnant Neku slipped into the chair while being careful of her bulk. She was clearly several months pregnant but she wasn't likely due for a few months more. Accessing the console, she entered a few commands, entering her citizen id. She then made a call to a contact whose commit May recognized. K had mentioned it in a report, 
It was the id the other woman had contacted when she transferred her money into a black account. After a moment the familiar and nude form of an irony appeared on the screen. She smiled as the woman gave her details. Details that may actively noted, they might prove useful to know later. The Anari nodded, as the woman finished with saying, I have finished closing my active accounts, and transferred all my money into the new account you have provided. The Anari, while tapping something into the terminal at her end, replied, Great, thank you for cooperating on this matter. I'm sending you details on a second account. This second account will be your spending account. As for the first account until we instruct you otherwise you are not to touch the money deposited in that account. You will be depositing all future wages you receive into that account. Money may disappear from that account, pay no attention to that, it is normal. As for the spending account, you will be paying all of your bills with that account from now on. Make sure you pay them on time. You will also be submitting to us a log of all purchases you plan to make weekly for review, and approval. You may not make any purchase with the account without our approval. The pregnant woman nodded, and said understood, May noted that the rules were the same as those given to the other woman. She expected the woman would be told that she should make herself available for some extended weekend trip or something next, as that was what happened with the other woman. Her expectations were soon betrayed. The Anira leaned forward, Great, now I want you to make sure all your bills get paid, furthermore, I want you to use the spending account to clear any debts you may have. In addition, I would like you to quit your current job, and make yourself available for an extended stay with us. A courier will be picking you up the day after tomorrow at 0500 for the trip. I want you to wait to buy your door for her. Wear nothing, do not pack any bags, and leave the door open for the courier. You will not be returning to your current residence. We will take care of your current possessions and move them into temporary storage for you. As for your lease, don't worry we will take care of that as well. The woman nodded, and said understood. May blinked. This seemed interesting. The woman was clearly being disappeared. She didn't know why or to where, but this might lead to something important. She made a mental note to be nearby when this woman was being collected. She wanted to know exactly where they were taking her. Hopefully, by then they would have had a chance to collect a specimen, and learn enough about the Anira to adjust their cloaks. Getting too close to one before that would be far too risky. She would almost certainly be found out, and May wasn't going to trust in luck. Kairu was very lucky with that first encounter. At that moment, she received a text from K. When she read it, she had to suppress a chuckle. Trust in K to prove her thoughts on that. Unfortunately it might be a while before she could get out of the bank, so she told her as much. While the Anirai was saying more, we will provide you with a new residence after you have completed your stay with us. Your stuff will be returned to you around the same time. The woman nodded, and said that she understood. The Anirai smiled, great, also we will provide you with a new job after your stay with us is completed. Details for that job will be given to you when you receive it. So do not worry about your future living arrangements. We will take care of everything for you. The woman smiled, I understand and appreciate that. I will let you go now. Remember to be ready for your pickup as requested. Take care of the requested items, and get it done quickly. Contact us when you are done with those items. The Neki nodded. I will. May then watched as the channel was closed. This was most informative actually. Although she did want to follow the woman home, but she figured she would have to go bail Kout as soon as she was out of the bank. She attached a cloaked tag to the woman so she could find her later. The woman sat behind the terminal for a moment or two after the com line was closed. Idly she stretched a bit in her seat, and then turned the terminal off. She carefully extracted herself from the chair, then made her way to the door where the receptionist was waiting for her. The receptionist gave the woman a friendly smile, and asked, Done. I am, thank you. The receptionist gestured, and said, Great, this way please. May followed the pair as they made their way out of the bank. The moment she was about to leave, she sent a text to Kasking for an update. The response was a little surprising. K replied, Might be a little hard to help now. I really needed you earlier. I'm stuck with her in a graft truck right now. I'll let you know when and where we sat down. The woman was already leaving. She followed after her, all the while making a few more brief exchanges with K, allowing her to come to the conclusion that she would be free to follow the woman for longer. That was a relief for May as she had a feeling that it might be worth watching this. At the very least, it would be useful to have visited the woman's residence before. It would make reaching it in time for her pickup easier after all. As it turned out, the woman lived in an apartment building, one she had visited before. It was the same building as her own. She had just never seen the woman before. Since they live on different floors, 
The woman's apartment was actually on the first floor, May followed her into the apartment, it had a standard sitting room at the entrance, the woman went straight through the room, heading to her bedroom where she accessed a terminal on the desk. May simply observed as she accessed her mail where she retrieved the information she needed on her spending account. Then the young pregnant Neki went about paying her bills with it. She was also making a log of everything she did with it. Likely for their records, May sat back and watched as she went through her own financials. She was very thorough with making sure everything was in order. May glanced at the door briefly wondering when she was going to get around to quitting her job. That seemed important. Her waiting did eventually pay off when she finally contacted someone. She sent a text file over with a hail. A Neku woman appeared on the screen after a moment. She smiled. Ah, Riku. An unexpected pleasure to hear from you. May I ask what this is about? The pregnant woman Riku nodded. Yes, I am sorry for the short notice but I am terminating my employment. The other woman frowned. May I inquire as to why? You seem to be doing quite well here. Riku replied. The Anairai requested I terminate my employment. I see. I'll have your termination filed by the end of the day. It was a pleasure working with you. The woman then signed off, and Riku leaned back. She stayed relaxed only for a moment then glanced at the clock. She hit a few keys on her terminal, locking it, and then left the room. May followed, and was reminded of the hour herself. When she noted that Riku went straight to the kitchen, she was preparing a meal. Meanwhile in orbit, Mulia was having a busy time. Megumi was actively reconfiguring the hull of one of her larger shuttles. An act that had drawn the attention of a few scientists. They had crowded the bay with equipment and were trying to study the process. She understood what they were doing, but she also recognized the danger. As such she was trying to keep them from getting too close to the shuttle while it was being reconfigured. Suddenly someone joined her in pushing back the crowd. It was Erisa. She smiled at the girl's welcome presence. Thank you. Glad you could help me. She scoffed. Well it doesn't take a genius to see that the shuttle is dangerous right now. I don't know what it is about you science types but I swear you need babysitters to keep you from losing your heads. She sighed. You say that, but didn't you mess up with that nerve stimulator the other day? Erisa blushed bright red, muttering it's not my fault that thing didn't come with a manual. Why does it even have a setting to inflict pain in the first place? Mulia giggled, like you are one to talk about that. Weren't you using the pain setting on yourself? Erisa somehow turned even redder. Thankfully, she didn't run off though. Sticking around to help her keep the scientists a safe distance from the shuttle. It was much appreciated help. Announcement. Hungry for more? May I take this moment to remind you that I have a Patreon. Advanced chapters are currently available up to chapter 73. That is 16 chapters not counting your regularly scheduled interludes. I hope to see you there. 33. Chapter 58 A Day in the Valley of a Dragon. So you stretched as she rolled out of her bed. It was a new day. It had been weeks since that fateful day she had pulled her own name out of that bucket. Her entire life had changed that day. Although she had to admit the dragon had kept her word. She and her fellow caretakers had gone with the dragon that very day to begin their training. That had been an experience. She looked around the room as she thought about the last few weeks. Alira had taken her and her fellows up towards the mountains. Where they were allowed a few hours to themselves. Although she had spent the entire time keeping a wary eye on the dragon. A part of her had been afraid that it was all a lie, and that she would do something to them. Even if she knew there was no chance she could resist them, what she ended up watching was Alira building her nest. With little more than mere thought, the dragon reshaped rock, and mountain. She simply carved out a den for herself, her unborn progeny, and her chosen caretakers. It was quite impressive watching rock simply reconfigure itself at the whims of a dragon. Solid rock seemed to flow like liquid, and soft earth condensed itself into solid stone. It wasn't long before the entire mountain was reshaped to suit the dragon's needs and desires. When she was done, Alira then herded them all into the newly built den. The front room was cavernous with polished stone floors. Huge tunnels led off deeper into the mountain. As they were given a tour of the den, Alira told them a great deal of what was expected of them. She remembered her feelings when she was told that she would never wear clothes again. Some of the girls seemed to take it in stride, but she had not felt very comfortable with the prospect. Not then anyway. Many of the others weren't either. Not initially. Alira helped them through that later that same day. That was part of the experience that being trained was. As she suspected Alira was molding them. That had been quite the experience, and something to get used to as well. It was strange having another in your mind, especially one so powerful. She had felt every change as Alira made them, but had done nothing to resist. 
she was afraid to even try. So you knew she wasn't the same Nekia who crashed here weeks ago, but that didn't matter much to her. That wasn't a change Jalairo had made to her mind either, she knew that much. She had paid a great deal of attention to that. Much of what Halara did was implant her with knowledge, and tweak a few inhibitions here, and some there. Hell a few of the changes were things she had been trying to change in herself for years. That dragon had helped her break a few of her bad habits. The only change she still questioned was the one that helped her through needing to go naked. She didn't understand that bit. Although it didn't matter much with the enhancements made to her body. Of course while Lalaira was working with them, she also helped the town. Later that same day, she had flown down to the settlement. Using her magic, she erected a proper building closer to the river like Saya had been planning. They were neatly arranged, with nice wide streets. The buildings themselves were made of hardened earth and stone. The frames were made from titanium and uranium though. The materials had been pulled from their older makeshift metal shelters. The dragon even took the time for aesthetics and even added wooden features to the structures. The result was that the town was even beautiful. Once she was done with the town, she prepared some fields for the new colonists. Although she left the actual planting for the new colonists, the dragon did help by providing seed, even pointing out a few edible local plants they had previously missed. After that she then noticed the men that had come with them from the ships. So you hadn't thought much of it until after the brainwashing had been broken, but many of them had bruised genitals, some worse. It had been normal to her, so you couldn't for the life of her figure out why they had those injuries. She had no memory of how those injuries had occurred. So you knew they weren't accidents, and that the men had not inflicted those injuries on themselves. Vaguely she recalled a link between these and the mysterious checkups. She had so many questions about what had actually been going on in the fleet, but out here she doubted she would get her answers. At least the men don't have to deal with the damage anymore. Alira fixed that. In fact she made sure everyone, male and female, was in perfect health. Using her magic to heal anyone of any injury she found, no matter how old, mind drifting back to the present, she took in her surroundings in the den. Her room was located off one of the smaller passages meant for her kin rather than dragons. Her room was polished stone with stone furniture, her bed was a stone slab with some thick cushions on it, and plenty of blankets. It was quite dry in here, and the temperature stayed comfortable all the time. Light was provided by a few magical sconces placed in the walls, light sources that conveniently came with an off switch. She also had a desk, a few bookshelves, a table, and a few chairs. It was a very cozy nook. One perfect not just for sleeping but also relaxing and studying. Her fellow's rooms were similar. She had added a few trinkets to personalize it. Not that she had much to personalize it. Most of her private possessions had been lost with her ship after all. Alira said they would be visiting her friend's world at some point in the near future. She promised them a chance to do some shopping while they were there. So you didn't know the particulars of how, but she was certainly looking forward to it. Putting those thoughts aside, she left the room. She didn't have a door or anything really for privacy. Not that it mattered since she didn't wear clothing anymore. That meant there was nothing to even slow her down as she headed out. Turning down the stone tunnel, she headed towards the bathroom. That was one of the good things about her luck of the draw. Now that she was one of Alira's caretakers, she had access to a lovely underground bath. It was large, the water was always sparkling clear, and the temperature perfect. Alira even provided some luxurious soaps for them. A nice soak in those lovely warm waters was something that she looked forward to every day, and a luxury she greatly enjoyed having. One she even missed from her days before joining the fleet. She had loved baths, and now that she had access to one again she was once again wondering what she was even thinking when she signed up for the fleet. She knew what she had been thinking then of course, but that didn't stop her from wondering. Her bath was a downright joy, and she managed to get in there before anyone else. So she had the room all to herself, allowing her to bathe, and take care of her other needs all in private before anyone showed up. That second item was more important to her as she wasn't entirely comfortable with others seeing her take care of that type of business, even if they were all girls. As she left the bath, she considered her plans for the day. Alira had given them the day off from training. That meant no dragon in her head, and no classes either. The second item was how Alira made sure they assimilated the knowledge she was implanting them with making sure they made it their own, forming it into a new skill set, one that they would later put to use when Alira's eggs hatched. That was going to be a while yet, since the dragon had not yet laid her clutch, 
so you already knew exactly where Alira was going to lay them. The hatchery was located in the deepest part of the den, just behind the cavern that Alira stuffed her hoard in. That was quite the sight, so many precious metals and gems, priceless artifacts, and pieces of wreckage, all set up in a rather tasteful display. So you had made the mistake of asking the dragon about a few of those pieces, and regretted it. That dragon had talked her to sleep about the stories about some of those pieces of wreckage. The long story short about them was that they were trophies taken from the wrecked ships of would-be dragon hunters. Hunters the dragon had bested and killed in battle. She just didn't know what to think about the fact that one of those trophies happened to be a piece of her own ship. Alira had displayed the piece in question in a location of prominence making it one of the first things a person saw upon entry. She found it an uncomfortable reminder of that fateful battle though, and chose to avoid that room as much as possible. Thankfully the layout of the den meant it was possible to reach the hatchery without going through the hoard chamber. None of the others much liked visiting that room either. So you wasn't going to the deeper parts of the den though. Instead she headed for the entrance. Already she figured it would be nice to visit the town. See how everyone was doing. Maybe even find something that she could help them out with. So you was very much hoping to find something to do in town. She wanted something to take her mind off the training. She arrived at the town a couple of hours before midday. The walk to town had been quite lovely, although it might have taken longer if Alira had not put in a portal. As the den was located on the valley rim, and that was normally several days walk, there were a few portals scattered around the valley. A stone structure about an hour south of the den was the portal from the den to the portal hub an hour north of the town. So you noticed the gazes of a few Neku as she entered the town. It did not escape her notice of how the men looked at her. She resisted the urge to cover herself. It wasn't her fault that she wasn't allowed clothing. Sayu's training from Alira had also taught her that it was best not to futilely try to cover herself. That would simply result in more attention being drawn to herself. Besides, she wasn't the only naked girl in the town. She could spot a couple of others walking around in the nude. Those others were also walking around proudly, not bothering to try and cover themselves either. She had barely gotten into town when a familiar girl appeared. She was topless, but wearing more than Sayu was. It was that ensign she had felt sorry for before. The young ensign had avoided being selected, but for some reason she liked walking around with her breasts out. Apparently that kind of thing had become normal back at the academy. The instructors also apparently encouraged the students to wear their uniforms a certain way. Thinking further on it, she had actually seen the ensign in question wearing her uniform in that compromising fashion that the instructors were encouraging them to wear them in. Yet so you had not thought it weird until that dragon broke her brainwashing. Just one more item on the list of strange things she had seen. A list she would never get answers to. Not here. Anyway, she smiled, still going without a top. I see. Didn't Dalira make it so you could dress normal again? The girl nodded. Yeah, she did. But you just have a hard time doing it, don't you? She simply nodded. No words were needed. It seemed that some of the damage from being brainwashed could not be so easily undone. So you just shook her head. Well at least the boys have something to look forward to. The girl flushed a bit. Yeah they seem to love to stare at them. So you decided to change the subject. Guess that makes it easy to know who is interested. Find anyone special yet? The girl shook her head. No. I just haven't been looking though. So you sighed. It seemed her plan for girl talk had been shot down. Still she had come here to have a day off. There was one other thing she could talk about. She leaned forward a little, and tried to ignore how the two young boys were watching her breasts move. Anything interesting happening in town lately? The girl nodded, a smile on her face. Yep, in fact. Announcement. Hungry for more? Join me on Patreon where you can enjoy 15 plus advanced chapters including interludes. 36. Chapter 59 In the Valley of a Dragon. The girl nodded as her face lit up at the question. Yep, in fact. Some new faces arrived this morning. They came floating down the river on their crude raft. Oh? Now that sounds interesting. Alira has led a few people here over the weeks, but this is the first I have heard of people coming to the valley on their own. She nodded. Yeah they have stories to tell as well. Seems things are more interesting beyond the borders of our pleasant little valley. Not everyone was as lucky as we were. So you giggled. I'm not sure being found and helped by a dragon could be considered lucky. Then again, most people would never believe it happened. She smiled, with their reputation as ship-eating monsters. So you nodded, that, and the fact that no attempt to communicate with them has ever worked. There is that alright, I wouldn't have believed it myself, if she hadn't spoken to us. 
The girl shuddered. Can't say it was an experience I would care to repeat. So you shuddered sympathetically. She tried to ignore how that movement excited the boys who were nearby watching them. Being maneuvered like a puppet was not an experience she had enjoyed. It did drive home how hopelessly they were outmatched by a single dragon. So you already knew she was going to have to get used to living under a dragon. They both were, and it was an idea they were still getting used to. So you could honestly say she had never imagined this would even be remotely possible. After all, dragons weren't known for communicating with other species. They were apex predators, ship-eating monsters, creatures that even the elder races respected and feared. Sharing a world with one was proving to be an educational experience. They were far more interesting than she had thought. At least one of them was. Alira was a majestic and deadly creature, but she could also be remarkably gentle, not to mention caring. So you changed the line of conversation. I'd like to meet these newcomers. The girl nodded, and gestured in another direction. So you glanced at the boys who had been watching them, and hoped they wouldn't follow. She wasn't used to people staring at her naked body that way. Even if she knew that she would have to get used to it, she was already getting used to spending her days in the nude. Hell with each passing day it got easier, more natural to her. They found the newcomers out by the river. Alira hadn't bothered to build any docks for them, and the town was only on the one side of the river. It was a nice wide river with a calm flow, the fish were plentiful, and Sia knew that a few colonists had already been very successful harvesting the river's bounty, their crude raft had been lashed to the shore with some rope, and a couple of stakes driven into the soft river soil. So you didn't think much of the work done, she figured it only worked because the river was calm, and the raft wasn't much of a boat in the first place. The crude raft was made from a couple of logs that someone had cut down and cleaned of branches. Then someone had built it a titanium plate on top of them both to create a floor and serve as structural support. For propulsion they had a couple of oars that someone had carved out. They had done a passable job making them, and they were lashed to the side of the craft. So you did note a supplely crate that someone had built it to the floor. Likely for storage and a place to stow their tools so they could take those with them. She could tell that the raft would do all right on the fairly calm waters of this river, but it wasn't going to cut it on more dangerous waters, nor did she think it would hold up well if a storm were to strike. Hell, it offered no protection from the elements for its crew. So you wondered how far the newcomers had managed to get with that raft. Her mind was already considering the conditions. The weather had been rather peaceful in the valley. Over the last few weeks she had seen a few gentle showers but nothing worse in terms of weather. At the moment it was generally cloudy, but no rain clouds were in sight. The river was calm throughout the valley, but she didn't know about beyond the valley. As the river cut right through the valley as it came down from higher elevations, she imagined it would stay rather calm for much of its length. So perhaps that raft was enough for exploring the river. The pair approached the newcomers who were by their crude watercraft and talking with someone Sia recognized. It was one of her ship's engineers, a younger man, a junior officer as she recalled. Not that it mattered much anymore, events had led them to becoming colonists. There was not much point in maintaining a military command structure, not rigidly anyway. Especially not after the dragon showed up, and the events that followed. The newcomers noted her approaching and turned to face her. The leader, a young woman with her breasts on full display, smiled, hello. More folks coming to welcome us to town? So you noted that she wasn't reacting to her nudity, simply treating her normally. She wasn't surprised. Alira had not undone the brainwashing of every nephew on the planet. Not yet, anyway. The dragon had been breaking it with every nephew she met though. She smiled, sort of. I was just told there were newcomers in town and had to see for myself. Enjoying life on the river? She chuckled. Well we were mostly exploring. The river is nice. Although you seem to have made some progress here. So you sighed, and gestured to the mountain where the den was. We had help. If you know where any other survivors are I suggest you tell them about this place. They will be welcome here, and we have the room. The woman nodded. I was hoping that would be the case. Your town could use a proper dock though. So you looked over the riverbank. Yeah we could. Just like you could use a proper ship. I'm sure we can help each other on that. I would like something better than the raft. It was the best we could do at the time with the materials we had on hand. If you are offering a better boat I will gladly take it. Just don't know where we would put it, given the lack of a pier. So you giggled, still going on about that? Well what river town doesn't have a pier? The ensign next to her answered before she could. One which is barely a few weeks old. I guess you have me there. So you smiled. Anyway, care for a tour? We can show you around. 
I spend most of my days out in the mountains, but I do spend enough time in town to know where things are. Sounds fun. Especially since your town looks like a good place for a home port. Once you fix your lack of a peer that is, the group soon found themselves touring the town. So you enjoyed showing the newcomers around. There was plenty to show them. The dragon had gifted them with homes and shops. The first place she decided to show the newcomers was the town plaza. A nice area featuring paved stones, a few shops, and a lovely fountain. The woman she had been talking with noted the fountain, so you had time to decorate. But haven't bothered with a pier yet? She giggled. Well actually that was a gift. The newcomers all frowned. The woman said, gift? From whom? So you gestured towards the mountain again, from the same person who helped us build the town. Ah. I see, and they didn't help you build a pier. So you shook her head. She helped us, but she doesn't want us to get used to relying on her. She wants us to be somewhat self-sufficient. That makes sense. The ensign interjected. Anyway, let's check out the shops. The group headed into the nearest shop moments later. They hadn't had much time to get settled, but a few colonists had already started doing business. Entering the shop, she was greeted with the sight of two younger girls, both topless. What really caught her attention about them was the fact that they were actively kissing right there behind the counter. So you looked away. It was a lovely sight, but she did not want to see it, mainly since she would not be able to really hide how she felt about it. Not with the dress code her new job forced upon her. She distracted herself with the shelves. The girls here had taken to carving, likely a hobby that they were making a business out of. They had carved a number of gorgeous trinkets and put them on display. They were not the only group in the shop. There were a couple of boys actively watching the two behind the counter, not even disguising their interest. There were also a few girls actively watching things as well. She ignored them, and focused on the trinkets. A few of them looked rather nice, and it reminded her that her room felt rather impersonal. Maybe she should try and buy one. Although being naked meant she couldn't carry any currency, that would not stop her from buying. Especially since their colony did not yet have an active currency system. They had been forced to go with the barter system. One of them caught her eye. It was a very gorgeous wooden carving. One that displayed a pair of very naked women that seemed to be dancing together. Most of the ones on the shelf featured women in various states of undress. Usually with at least one boob on full display. Part of the shop's theme she guessed. But she had to admit they were well done. It did occur to her that old her would not have considered it. But after everything that has happened to her. Well let's just say an immodest figurine wasn't going to really phase her. Besides the girls in the figurine were just dancing, nothing really lewd about it, it seemed okay to her, and it would add some much needed decoration to her room. She picked it up, already intending to negotiate for it, she had a few things she could trade for it. Announcement. Hungry for more? Why not check out my Patreon? Where more than 15 advanced chapters are available. 35. Chapter 60 followed home, Kairu carefully docked the truck. The inspection for today was over, and they had just been to the clinic. The Anairai there had been ecstatic to see the little girl she had been so worried over. That poor girl was practically first to be given a full assessment, followed by a lengthy brainwashing session. Kairu had been allowed to observe but mainly because Kelly brought her along, and wanted her nearby. Although Kairu couldn't help but think about the fact that she was going to be away from her mother, and sisters for years. Something that didn't sit right with her. Not that the Anairai would understand why that bothered her. Now, however, the inspection, and the brief stay at the clinic was over. They had also stopped by a storage facility to drop off the boxes the truck had been loaded with. Kelly didn't tell her much about what they were going to do with the stuff, but she didn't need to be told. She already knew a bit about what would happen, and what Kelly did say merely lined up with what she had already heard from May. Stepping out of the truck, she helped Kelly out. She gave Kelly a smile, and asked, Shall I escort you home? Kelly shook her head. Actually I would like to come with you to your place. I want to see where you live. She seemed a little excited about the idea. Kairu worriedly sent a message back to her cell. Megumi however was the one to send a reply. That won't be too much of a problem. In fact it would work out nicely for us. Especially if you get her to stay the night. Just be aware Corso has a guest. Kairu sighed. That sounded worrisome to her. But Megumi said it would be okay. Given that Megumi was some super advanced artificial intelligence. Kairu figured she might be right about that. Out of curiosity, she asked her about why she wanted Kelly to stay. To which Megumi replied. I have a shuttle outfitted with a full field laboratory. We can take Kelly up to it, and examine her. 
I can wipe her memory of the event after I am done. As far as she is concerned it will be a simple enjoyable sleepover at your place. That made a certain amount of sense, Kyra nodded, all right, I'll show you the way, just I don't live alone, and I would prefer it if you don't do anything weird with my sisters. Kelly chuckled, let's get going then, I just have to meet your sisters, Kyra sighed and led the way. They weren't too far from her home. So it was not a long walks back to the apartment. On the way she shared some idle banter with Kelly, as she had thought. It didn't take long to reach the apartment, and there was little in the way of distractions given the hour. With fewer in our eye around, leading poor young girls off to new lives, not many couriers could be seen running around either. Unlike many larger cities, the capital actually quieted down during the night. Kairu idly recalled it wasn't always like that. But perhaps the Anira had something to do with that. Thoughts on that didn't stay with her long, as they entered the apartment where they found both K and May relaxing nude in their seats. While another Anira was facing them, May noted them first. Hey, Kairu, welcome back. The look on May's face didn't escape Kairu's notice. She knew she would be answering questions later. She did not look forward to it, although from the looks of things, it seemed she wasn't alone. Remembering an earlier text. She had a feeling that the other Inairi was the source of K's call for help. The Inairi girl turned to face the door, then gave K a look, her face smiling. So, this is the person who had you so worried, isn't it? Why didn't you tell me that it was your sister that had you worried? K turned red a little and looked away. She said nothing though. While the Inairi girl stood up, and then glanced at Kelly, she smiled. I'm Zala, and you two are? They kept it short and gave only their names. Zala giggled. I'm not here to take your pet from you. If that is what has you worried, in fact I was just about to leave anyway. She turned, looking right at K and said, I'll be back tomorrow. We can continue our discussion then. In the meantime, I suspect that you and your sister have some catching up to do. Zala slipped past them, and out the door. As soon as the door shut, Kelly seemed to relax. Kairu felt some tension leave the room, and realized that everyone had been tense around Zala, including her new boss. What followed however was an awkward silence as nobody quite knew what to say. Finally May broke the ice. So I take it the reason we didn't see you last night is the young, ah, uh, lady next to you, right? Kairu sighed. She couldn't avoid telling them that story much longer now could she? Especially not after bringing Kelly home. She made for a seat and slumped down. Yes, meet Kelly, my new ah, uh, boss. Before she knew it, Kairu was telling the story of how Kelly came across her during her shift at the diner and what happened. She tried to hide how she felt about everything that happened. The others seemed to pick up on it though. Thankfully they weren't teasing her about agreeing to a job that required being naked. Yet, she knew they were going to do that eventually. Kelly took the time they were talking to explore the apartment, and respectfully let them catch up. Although the moment they were done, she spoke up, rather, um, sparse place you three have. Kairu did say you arrived recently, but I thought you might have personalized it more. Kairu sighed. We didn't have a lot to bring with us, K nodded. While May interjected, what we couldn't take is being held in storage. We were waiting until we all had jobs to call for it. I see. She looked between them, and then inquired about their jobs. Kelly shook her head with a wry grin. You three aren't very good at the whole job hunting thing now, are you? I know for a fact that there are plenty of better jobs in the city. Then she focused on May, and how the hell are you jobless? Both of your sisters at least got one. May with a wry look said, I'm still weighing my options. Kelly replied, well maybe I can help. Even better I know jobs that won't require stupid clothes. May chuckled, um, thanks for the offer, I think I can manage on my own. Kelly stared at her face for a moment or two, then replied, suit yourself, but if you change your mind you will know where to find me. Then she looked at Kairu, so which room is yours? Kairu silently messaged the others, and then smiled, I'll show you. Kelly looked around the room. Her gaze then noted the weapon Kairu had left sitting on the desk. She frowned. Why do you have a plasma pistol? She replied quickly. It was my service weapon. I'd tried being in the military, but it didn't work out. Kelly's expression changed, and she with a very worried sounding tone asked, You were in the military? By any chance were you an officer? Kairu lied. I left as an ensign. Why sound so worried? Kelly sighed with clear relief. That is good, for a moment there. I thought you might have been sterilized. That statement piqued her interest. Kairu had been wondering why she had previously been sterilized. Megumi had corrected that, but she wondered why that was the case. She asked. 
Kelly shifted her tentacles in an approximation of a shrug. I don't really know. All I know is that high-ranking officers are sterilized. They never told me why. Why not? Kelly walked over to the bed, and replied, honestly, because officers don't frequent the areas I am supposed to keep an eye on. Most of them stick near the base. Although some do occasionally come out this way to visit family. In fact, that plays into how I found out about the whole sterilizing officers thing. Last year, I came across an officer visiting her family during an inspection. Kairu frowned, that is strange. Any idea why? Kelly did the shrugging thing again, as she settled onto the bed. Honestly, no. I don't know why they are doing it. Anyway, can we talk about something else? I don't like thinking about those poor women. Kyra nodded. We can. Would you like to stay the night? I don't have much, but I think we can make it a fun stay. Kelly smiled. Yes. Apparently getting her to stay was actually going to be easier than she had thought. She quickly set aside the questions raised by the recent conversation, and focused on entertaining her guest. While she was also updating Megumi on her progress, who told her that a shuttle would be there in an hour. That meant she only had to entertain her for an hour, and she thought of something. She had some cards in her bag, and she felt that a card game might be fun. How about a card game while we wait for dinner? By now Kaz started cooking, and she will let us know when it is done. Kelly nodded, sounds fun. Kairu went ahead and pulled out the cards. She had not brought any of the games Megumi had introduced her to, but instead had the ship print her a copy of a basic Neku card deck. The kind she grew up with, she figured it would raise fewer questions if anyone saw it. Now she was glad she did, as it also opened up some options right here. As she pulled them out of her bag. She was careful not to let Kelly see the harder to explain items, like the grenades. The gun had been one thing, but explaining why she had a bag full of grenades would not have been as easy, especially since she brought those thinking she might need one to stun a room. In the end, it turned out that her most useful tool for capturing an Anari specimen for Megumi was neither the pistol nor the grenades she had thought she would need. No, it turned out to be a simple deck of cards. Who would have guessed? Certainly not her. Showing Kelly her deck she asked, so what game do you want to play? Announcement. Not satisfied with just today's chapter? Join my Patreon today, where you can have access to over 15 advanced chapters. Furthermore, you may have access to occasional bonus content, and I am open to Patreon requests. 36. Chapter 61 Answers She ended up spending a fair amount of time playing cards with Kelly. Dinner was fairly uneventful. Kelly made a few comments, but nothing unexpected. They had considered slipping her sedatives, but decided against it, given they didn't know much about her physiology. Thankfully, she was tired. Kairu tried not to think about why, so it wasn't long after that she went to sleep. Getting her up to the roof and to the shuttle proved remarkably easy. It was like moving a young child in her sleep, no guard at all. The shuttle itself was cloaked, but when they came close to it, a door opened. Kairu stepped into the shuttle holding the irony girl in her arms. And May followed her in after. A hologram of Megumi materialized and greeted them with a smile as they entered. Lay her down on the table. You three can wait over there. She pointed to a bench set in the corner. This will take a while. Kairu nodded, and set her on the examination table. It looked a lot like the bed she had her own procedure on. The one that involved her enhancement, and the undoing of her brainwashing. It wasn't the most pleasant memory, but if she could go back to that moment she would have climbed onto that table again. Albeit without the reluctance she had then, she honestly loved what Megumi had done to her, and if she had been in the mind to actually agree to it, likely would have. Especially now that she understood everything this entailed. Looking around, as she headed for the corner she noted that the shuttle was filled with strange equipment. Some that she had already seen in that lab, some of it new to her. None of it was familiar enough for her to know what it was for. Glancing at the table, she noted several mechanical arms hovering over Kelly. There was no obvious sign of what was going on, but she had a feeling that those were sensor arms. Kelly was likely being scanned. Megumi studied the incoming scan data on the newly acquired specimen. The fact that she was sleeping made her quite cooperative, while she conducted her initial scans. They were quite extensive actually, unlike the more primitive races that surrounded her. She could obtain all the data she needed from those scanning arms. There was no need for dissection, as she could discern everything she needed to know about the girl's insides via those scanners. Having already analyzed enough about her physiology to know which compounds would be effective, she deployed an injection arm. It had a special cocktail designed to awaken the specimen and keep her in a calm dissociated state. 
She needed her awake for the next set of scans. The cocktail was not dissimilar to what she had given Kairu for her procedure, albeit with a few adjustments so that it would be more effective on an iri like the compound she had given Kairu. It would also paralyze the specimen. The cocktail didn't contain any paralytic compounds but instead rendered the specimen immobile via a dose of nanites programmed to interface with the nervous system and inhibit motor control. Within seconds the specimen Kelly woke up, and was understandably rather confused. Her inability to move, and the strange circumstance caused several neurological responses. The conditions were triggering her fear responses. She activated a few speakers, and began to play music. The piece being actively changed and controlled by her as she noted Kelly's psychological responses to the music. At the same time she supplemented it by introducing calming impulses via her neural scanners. They were after all a complete neural interface not just a scanning device. Once the subject was sufficiently calmed, and controlled she began the memory scan. This was the main reason she need the girl awake. It was much easier to scan memories when the subject was awake. It also aided with other tests. Not to mention she could erase the whole incident later. In the meantime she already had new data to parse and assimilate. It did not take her long. Her ability to process and archive information was far superior to most organic species. Very few organics could compete with a computer like her on that. Many of those that could were highly shinic, both dragons and solians, for example, had highly evolved brains that were actually capable of making the complex calculations needed for interstellar travel without the aid of a computer. Yet both races still used computers, and in fact they were really good with them as well. As a good computer, even with such advanced brains, was invaluable for numerous applications. Her avatar stretched, and she looked over at Kairu. It had been a few minutes since she had started. Her scans were not complete, but since she was able to analyze the data faster than it was coming in, she already had a few answers for her. She is actually a very interesting specimen. I've answered a few questions already, and raised new ones. It seems that young Kelly here is the product of some very interesting genetic engineering. Kairu frowned. Someone created her? Oh, yes she was created. At first glance, an amateur might have thought the work Solian. That would be wrong. The techniques are similar. But there are a few markers that give away who really made her, or to be more accurate, started the work on her creation. Kairu's frown deepened. What are you talking about? The Anairai are incomplete, or they were, until someone tried to finish them. Whoever did finish them weren't exactly skilled, their techniques are nothing more than crude imitations of the more sophisticated techniques used by the original creators of the Anairai, the dragons. Leaning forward she said, you are saying the dragons created the Anairai? Why? Oh, there could have been any number of reasons. The important bit is that they clearly never finished the work, the project was abandoned. Don't ask why, I don't know. Someone else then came along, and tried to finish the work for their own reasons. I see. Can you tell me who tried to finish the work? No idea, but I don't think it was the Neku. They don't really have the technology for this. And frankly having studied you, I can say with confidence your race isn't stupid enough to mess with technology you barely understand. Whoever it was obviously stumbled across an abandoned draconic lab. Kairu glanced at Kelly. So you don't know. Can you find out? If Kelly knows, I'll find out soon enough. She sighed, although I doubt she would. She is young, and based on what I have already learned, the Anairai were already here when she was born. They were? What have they been doing here for so long, and why are that? I can already answer. A study of her physiology has been most enlightening. The Anairai don't employ the same reproductive strategy that the Neki use. They are a unisex species, entirely female. They are capable of carrying young themselves. But it seems that the Neku are biologically compatible with them, and can carry their young as well. As such the reason they are here is at least in part related to reproduction. Kairu interrupted, wait hold up, single sexed? How exactly do they reproduce then? She nodded, and materialized a holographic representation of the Anairai. Reproductive organs. The Anairai have four ovaries, which both produce and store their eggs. When it comes time to reproduce they will release a few eggs into the uterus where they mature. Once an egg is mature, the female would be compelled to seek out new genetic material. There is a special tentacle hidden in the folds of their vagina that plays into this role. They can use it to deposit immature eggs into another female. Eggs that would be absorbed by the mature eggs fertilizing them. These fertilized eggs can then either be retained in the womb or transferred to another host. Kairu's expression changed, and she asked with a sad tone, Does that mean, 
Megumi nodded and interrupted, what you think it does? Yes. Kelly was checking those girls she was inspecting for suitability as a potential partner, as a possible host for an Inairi child. It seems that neighborhood was chosen as a future nest, and the residents are expected to carry their children. It implies a few things about what they may be doing to the girls they take. At least about what kind of brainwashing they will be doing. That's awful. Well as I said it is not the only reason they are here. They aren't just using the NECU for reproduction. From what I have learned from her memories so far it seems they are also both a workforce and military for them. I see. Megumi smiled. This is interesting. What is interesting? Megumi gave the three a look, and then she began. Kyra those gaps in your memory? Remember those? She nodded. Yes, I do remember those. Well, I probably could have restored them if the Anira hadn't been so through with their removal of those memories. I had my theories about how they did it, but now I know for sure how they did it. It seems they inherited some draconic technology, although they can't fully replicate it. Kairu frowned. Okay, how does that play into my missing memories? That tech plays into how they removed those memories from your mind. They used a neural interface not dissimilar to the one I am using, just less sophisticated to transfer them out of your mind and onto an external data medium. To be more specific, a memory crystal. They weren't erased, they were externalized. Kairu's face brightened. Does that mean my memories can be restored? Possibly. Although there is a chance that they erased them already to make room for someone else's memories. Keep in mind producing memory crystals is no easy task for them, that means memory space on them is valuable, given they likely believe your fleet was lost with all hands, they may believe you are dead, those memories may no longer be of use to them, not to mention they can't transmit them, so only what memories of yours were brought here would still exist if they did, more recent extractions would have been lost with the fleet, her face darkened, and then went through several expressions, I see, um, any idea why they were doing this? Megumi nodded. There are a few advantages. We already know they are altering memories. Externalizing them actually makes it easier, especially when they alter the memories of entire groups. Helps them identify whose memories they need and ensure their false memories are consistent. Kyra nodded. I see. That does make a twisted amount of sense. Any idea why Kelly could answer this and not tell me a thing about why I was sterilized? Megumi nodded. They are doing the procedure here with some groups. Kelly has assisted with it. In fact, as for why she doesn't know that, it's because she doesn't really work with the military. As it is, I haven't found any answers yet about what happened to the men. I do need to take a look at an enhanced neck here though. It seems that they are doing more to the local women than just brainwashing them. A lot more. I'll tell you about it later. Why don't you three get off to bed? I have some more to do. And I will tell you what else they are doing in the morning. Megumi smiled and watched them leave. Then turned to young Kelly who was looking at her quite frightfully. Oh, don't be so worried. If I wanted to harm you I would have done so already. Now I am almost done here. We just have a simple correction procedure to perform. After that, I'll send you back down to Kairu. A panicked question spiked in the girl's thoughts, and Megumi answered, Ah, is that what has you so worried? No Kairu didn't betray you and I am not here to harm you as I just said. The corrections procedure is quite simple. Your creators never finished you, and whoever tried didn't really know what they were doing. I have a few things to fix in your genes, but you don't need to be awake for that. I'll wake you again later, when it is time to erase your memory of this. Maybe you would like some more pleasant memories of a good time with Kairu. Sensing some relief in the girl's mind, she quickly administered a sedative, putting the girl back to sleep. She wasn't lying to Kelly about having a few things to fix in her DNA. Some of what needed fixing was the part of her DNA that governed behavior. The dragons had done a fine job coding that part, but weren't quite finished. They had never installed the normal hard coding that both her own creators and the dragons were known to use. Creations like the Anira needed safeguards and controls to ensure they didn't get out of hand. The Anira had no controls, which is why they are out of control. There were also some other parts of her code that could use some work, especially those touched by the amateurs who tried to finish the creation of the Anairi race. They knew just enough about genetic engineering to complete the work, but not enough to do it right. When she was done, Kelly would be a far more complete and powerful specimen of the Anairi race. Thanks to those errors, she only had about a third of the telepathic power she should have been born with. Not to mention those controls would also be included in her completed genome, ensuring the race won't get out of hand again. Even if they were doing exactly what they were created to do, subvert other races, 
On the table she had already started the procedure. Robotic arms had lined up and were attaching injector ports to her body in key locations. This procedure did not require Megumi to open her up, as all the work was going to be done by nanites introduced into her body. The locations of the ports were calculated to maximize the spread of the nanites. All she would be doing was the programming and delivery of the nanites. It took only moments for the ports to be securely placed, and then she activated them. The injectors activated, puncturing the skin to allow the introduction of nanites to the key locations she had identified. Already those nanites were spreading through her young specimen's body. They had not yet begun to do anything yet. She had not given them the order to do anything but spread. Not yet, anyway. She paid close attention to their progress. It was not long before the nanites had spread sufficiently. Megumi initiated the next phase. Instantly the nanomachines began altering cells, and manipulating the girl's DNA according to their program. The machines had very sophisticated protocols for this, not surprising considering that the technology for this was very old. It was older than the Empire in fact. The Solian people didn't even develop nanite technology. They inherited it from an even older race that is no longer around. Their progenitors that race employed nanotechnology widely and even used it to extend life more than doubling their own lifespan with it. Being so old, the technology was very reliable and largely perfected. It had applications in virtually every field imaginable from medicine to construction. Her sensors monitored the progress of the nanites. It took them time to enact the changes. Once they were done with the first stage they moved on to the second stage. Her cells had already been altered, adjusted to the new genome she programmed. Now they were doing the same with her eggs, while also making a few minor adjustments to various organs in her body. Optimizing their function, once completed the changes would extend her life by about 150 years. The alterations to her DNA that were already completed had already extended it by a hundred, as such young Kelly would have another 250 years to look forward to. In addition to the years she had already had ahead of her. If she managed to reach transcendent level, which is highly likely given her lifespan, it would be more. She looked down at the sleeping girl with a smile. She was quite cute sleeping there. Announcement. Hungry for more? Right now is a prime time to join me on Patreon where you have over 15 advanced chapters available right now for your enjoyment. I look forward to seeing you there. 34. Chapter 62 Implications Megumi stretched her limbs, while one of her other instances, finished up with Kelly. Already she was considering the implications of what she had learned. In many respects, the Anari were an interesting species. One that was quite literally designed to subjugate other races to use as their workforce. And at the moment they were doing just that. Exactly what they were designed to do, but it was having a rather destabilizing effect on the region. Something the early especially were feeling with the recent aggressive expansion of the Neku Imperium. The why of that was still unknown, but she knew enough to speculate. However, what she had learned presented some far more immediate implications. The most notable had to do with what the Anira had been doing to the Neku, given what she knew from Kairu and the other cells, especially with what they were doing to their memories. She knew Kairu wanted her to reverse what the Anairai had done, and restore the Imperium she had been loyal to. The problem was, the Anairai had already made their mark. A complete restoration may no longer be possible. Now the question became what could she do to improve things? As it was, a restoration may not be the best course of action in the first place. This was part of why she wanted to see an enhanced Neku, what she learned from Kelly gave her an idea of what enhancements were being made. Many of them apparently focused on reproduction. Regardless of that, she needed to know the exact changes made, and the best way to obtain that information was to study an enhanced specimen. Perhaps there was some solution that would allow both species to live in some form of symbiosis. Something to think on. There was a lot to think on now. Pausing her line of thought, she briefly checked in on Erisa and Amelia. The pair had retired to an observation lounge after dispersing the crowd around her modified shuttle. She smiled to herself. They were practically flirting right now, but neither seemed really aware of that fact. Megumi knew full well the reason Erisa found issue with her so much was because Erisa felt threatened. Erisa was attracted to Melia, and on some level thought her relationship with Megumi would threaten her chances of pursuing a relationship with Melia. It was honestly rather cute. Maybe she should help things move along? The question was how, maybe that would work. Megumi quickly created a new instance and set it to work on her idea, while turning her full attention back to the main matter at hand. Solving that issue may take some time. Her considerable processing power had been added for a while, 
but frankly, she needed more data. She had ideas, but which one to pursue wasn't so clear yet. If she had a Solian Lord here, perhaps it would be easier, especially given their abilities, but she didn't. In fact certain Elder Lords had ability enough to actually affect a true restoration even with the missing memories. Unfortunately, that required Shinnik abilities beyond her own, and as such wasn't an option, not to mention she was on the clock. She had time, but not enough for a trip to the Empire and back. Certainly not without access to the Stargates, and with her lack of data that might prove the wrong move. If she did that, chances were the assimilators would grow unchecked, and morph into a true crisis. There were so many ifs to consider and so little time. Already she was reviewing projections, and contingencies made with the little data she had. Her thoughts turned to her new friend, Alyra, as a dragon nurse. She was a very powerful schnick, not to mention she might have some connections. Sure their culture was a bit skewed, however they very much had the time to babysit the cleanup. It might be a good idea to contact her. Besides, she still had to send those supplies she wanted. A quick check at her outpost showed that production was on schedule, and the last of them were being packed for transport. While the shuttle carrying the needed gate had launched on schedule and was halfway to Nalyra's new nest, Megumi made a note to speak with her about what she had learned. Preferably after the supplies were delivered, it would be the best time, and her friend would likely be in a better mood for such a discussion after receiving the supplies. Mentioning the fact the Anari were originally a draconic creation might also help in getting a few of them on board with helping fix this. Although the Neku might not fully appreciate the draconic aid, it would be the best they could get given the circumstances. Kelly slipped out of the shuttle. She glanced back at where the alien shuttle had been, but saw nothing, not even a hatch. Some part of her expected to see more, but she was not sure why. Why she had even been on the shuttle, she didn't know. She didn't even know what had happened while she was in the shuttle, but she had the strangest feeling that she was supposed to forget it. Already her memory of being in the shuttle was fading, slipping away, and she couldn't even bring herself to try and hold on to the vanishing memories. The young Inira girl headed for the door. She needed to get back to Kairu. Visiting the roof had been nice, but being up here had lost its appeal. Maybe she could play another game? Kairu was such fun, and she was so glad that she had stumbled upon her in that diner. Meeting Kairu had certainly done away with much of the boredom she had lately. It certainly made the inspections more interesting. Having someone along she could actually talk to. Sure she could do that with an ordinary courier, but it just wasn't the same. Especially since she could so easily read their minds, and knew exactly what they were thinking. Making her way down the stairs, she realized that she hadn't told Kairu a lot of things, that maybe she should have. Especially if she wanted her to be her friend. Where that thought came from she didn't know, but it felt right. Although to be fair a few of her questions came rather close to reproduction, and that could be a little private not to mention uncomfortable to talk about. Still, the Neku were her people, and she wasn't an ordinary one. She deserved to know more about what she was helping with. Just how exactly was she supposed to explain that? She dropped the thought. It wasn't that important right now anyway, and who wants to have such an awkward talk anyway? She hurried her step, and exited the stairwell, already having a game in mind. Right now was the time for fun and games. She could have that talk with Kyrie later, maybe during an inspection tomorrow. Idly she rubbed between her legs, feeling the special tentacle hidden there swell a little at her touch. Perhaps even show her this. It might be helpful for the explanation, if a little awkward. As that tentacle was only ever displayed when you planned to use it. Thankfully Kairu didn't know that, and she surely wasn't going to tell her that. Kelly made her way down the corridor, with a bit of a skip in her step, looking for the door that led to Kairu's apartment. Eager to get back to the special Neku girl she liked so much, that was part of why the idea of her possibly being sterile scared her so much. Regardless, she certainly wanted to check to make sure, Kairu was very cute, and a part of her certainly wanted to take their relationship further. Ah but it wasn't yet time for that. In any case, Kairu was certainly the kind of special girl she would want to be her first. In the meantime, it was time for games. Finally, she noted the door she was looking for. Reaching a tentacle over, she pressed the bell, something she normally never would do. But for Kairu, well that was a different story. She liked her, and well, she was no ordinary Neku. She was special, an equal the others, not so much. After just a moment Kairu opened the door, still delightfully nude, and not wearing any of that stupid clothing the Neku seemed to like so much. She really didn't understand why they did. Kelly had curiously tried it before, and it felt so. Confining, 
The world was so much better when you were naked, not to mention clothes hid way too much. Kairu smiled, have fun? She nodded, I did. Let's play some more games together before bed. Kairu's smile grew wider, and she shifted in a way that was absolutely cute, before agreeing, sure. What do you want to play? She entered the front room, and excitedly declared the name of the game she had in mind. It was a card game she was particularly fond of, it just wasn't any fun playing it with normal Neku, largely because their minds were just too easy to read. So she always knew what cards everyone else held when playing a game with them. She could play it with other Anairai, but finding enough players was hard. Many of them were busy or just didn't like card games. She had to admit that playing with tentacles was a little harder, but that wasn't a problem in her mind. Kelly had gotten quite skilled at holding, shuffling, and dealing with cards and all without the fingers the neck you had. Kyra nodded, sure that could be fun then she headed for the couch, her tail swinging delightfully as she walked. Kelly paused briefly to enjoy it, and then made for the couch opposite, noting that Kairu already has the deck sitting on the table having moved it out here. It made her kind of happy to see her friend knew her well enough to know she would want to play a game when she got back from sightseeing on the roof. Kairu was definitely a good friend, and this was already proving to have been a very enjoyable sleepover, and they hadn't even gotten to the sleeping part. As she settled into her seat, Kairu started dealing out the cards. In moments they both had a hand of nine cards, and she started looking over the cards she got. It was an okay hand. Not great. Still. She had a chance, after a few rounds of cards Kyra ended up carrying Kelly to bed, curling up next to her. Kelly seemed much the same despite her visit with Megumi and clearly didn't act like she had just had an invasive examination. Kyra recalled Megumi calling Kelly young, and that left her wondering how old was Kelly exactly. She knew that Kelly had grown up here on Neuri. It made her also wonder about the implications of them having been here so long. Still, she had hoped that Megumi could fix the damage, that her beloved Imperium could be restored to what it once was. Even with the complications added by what they were doing, it never occurred to her that perhaps Megumi couldn't fix everything, that some of the damage was possibly beyond her capabilities. It didn't help that the alien AI seemed practically godlike in her eyes. Announcement. Hungry for more? Join me on Patreon. Over 15 advanced chapters are currently available in the first tier alone. 34. Chapter 63 Clues in Collection. May made her way down the corridor. It was early in the morning. It wasn't even five yet. The others were asleep. Yesterday had actually been rather uneventful. At least from what she heard. Kelly had slept in late, curled up with Kairu, and then they had gone off on another inspection. Now those two were back, and Kelly was curled up next to Kairu again. It seemed she had grown rather attached to the older Nekia girl. It was honestly very cute. As for Zala, much to relief, she hadn't been able to continue her conversation like she wanted to. Unfortunately, it was just a postponement. In any case, at the moment she was heading to the first floor apartment that the pregnant woman Riku was leasing. Today was the day that she was scheduled to be picked up by a courier. From the sounds of things, she was going to be disappeared. May had also actually caught the second call, when she reported things taken care of. It hadn't been all that eventful. They had thanked her for cooperating and then they mostly reiterated her instructions for being ready for a pickup today, at this awfully early hour. Honestly, she wanted to be in bed, even though she had deliberately gone to bed early yesterday. Good thing she didn't have a job. Thanks to the improved cloak, she had a feeling she could follow this woman safely. That means today would likely yield clues that previously were out of their reach. As she approached the door to the apartment, she noted that Riku was already standing in front of it. Her pregnant body was completely nude, and the door was wide open. May wasn't worried about Riku or the courier seeing her at the moment though. She was currently cloaked, since she had taken the opportunity to cloak earlier. After all, May knew she would need it. Bringing up the time in her HUD, she found she still had a few minutes before five. So she poked her head in the apartment, to find it hadn't changed from before. The furniture was exactly where it had been previously. Photos and ornaments were still on display. A quick search through the kitchen and bedrooms found nothing at all had been packed. May wasn't entirely surprised. Rick had been told that she wasn't coming back, but no instructions to pack had been given. She rejoined Rick near the door with time to spare. May could guess by the state of the apartment that Rick wasn't going to pack the place up. Obviously a courier was going to do that. It certainly wasn't going to be an inairai, she knew that much. They clearly preferred to make others do the menial work for them. It was not long before the courier arrived. She was naked, like they always were, well with the typical exception of a belt. 
and she had a clipboard with her. She approached Riku, and smiled, ready to leave for your extended stay with us? Riku nodded, I am. The courier nodded, and extended the clipboard. She pointed at a line on the page. It was a document, one that May quickly looked over. Clearly a legal agreement. If you would sign here please. This is simply your agreement for using the Inairi courier services. Packing and storage service. It indicates your understanding that items will be missing when we return your boxes, and that we reserve the right to alter and sell your possessions while they are in our care. You will be informed about anything we do sell and receive a small cut of the proceeds. After expenses, in most cases, this will at most be 10% of the proceeds. These expenses include your storage fees and other services including those from your stay with us. We may replace some of your sold items at a later date, and you will be informed if we do. Due to the above, we will also be doing a complete inventory of your belongings, including items that might be considered private. In addition, our reserved right to alter or sell your possessions will be extended to those private items, and for the duration of this agreement they will not be considered private items. May, having read it, noted that it did say all that, there was more to it than just that as well. It was the most blatantly predatory agreement she had seen the Inairi put forth. The other such items at least tried to look fair on the surface anyway. The document also mentioned where they would be putting her cut of the proceeds. It was in her new black account, the one she wasn't allowed to touch, only put money into. So, in other words, it really didn't matter if they gave her 10, 50, or 90. In the end, it was effectively zero. There was also a line that stated that she agreed not to think of her stuff until instructed otherwise, and to know it was in good hands. There was also a blank line about when she would be informed about what they were doing with her stuff. The woman signed, and then the courier smiled before tapping the blank line about when she was to be informed. Please fill in this line. We recommend choosing to be informed only when we return your stuff. Rika nodded, that makes sense. She then filled in that as her choice. Rather than a more immediate timing, May figured it must be some of their brainwashing that led to her so readily agreeing to that. The courier smiled, great. Now the movers will be here in a few minutes to start packing up your stuff. We don't need to be here for that. So if you would, follow me and leave your door open. We can get going to the facility. Rika nodded. And May sent a text to K while also deploying a small cloak drone to keep an eye on the apartment. Just so that they could observe the packing up process, the courier turned towards the exit, and Riku followed. May hovered nearby, as they headed out of the building. A truck was waiting outside, and Riku was asked to board. May slipped onto the vehicle with her, while the courier headed to the cockpit to drive the vehicle. K stepped off the lift with a bit of a yawn. May's message had woken her up. This was quite the early hour to be up. But unfortunately she needed to be up to observe what they were doing while May followed the primary target. Reaching a nice spot, she cloaked and then made her way towards the apartment in question. She arrived to find it standing wide open, and no one in sight. A quick check with the monitoring drone found that no one had gone in, or walked by it, not yet at least. She settled near the door to wait. Having been to the storage facilities, she had a rough idea of how things would go already. It wasn't too long before a group of couriers arrived with boxes and griff pallets. She counted eight couriers dressed in their usual uniform. The group filed into the apartment, and she followed them to watch. One of them opened a data pad she pulled off her belt, and started a file. While the others started looking through the apartment, what quickly followed was them taking an inventory. Images were taken of each object, and a description was made as well. Then it was added to the inventory. Then boxes were set up and they began packing the apartment up. Before anything was backed each box was either labeled as for sale or for storage. Clothing without fail was always packed into the for sale box, and that wasn't a surprise. Most items did end up going into the for storage box. It seemed they were just doing what the Anairi normally made the resident do, with the exception of the item inventory. May had mentioned in her message about what she had seen, but so far the only missing items were the normal ones. When they reached the kitchen, however, they created a third label. They also brought in a special box. Her food was packed into two boxes. Dry stuff that required nothing special was placed into a standard box, while the other stuff was placed in a refrigerated box. Both boxes were labeled for donation. Predictably leftovers that were not finished yet were simply tossed. The containers were cleaned, and packed. Then they got to her plates and silverware, which were wordlessly packed into a box for sale. One of them made a note in her inventory, saying that her plates and silverware did not meet standard and would need to be replaced. Then they moved on. K noted that when they got to her terminal, 
someone plugged a device into it. Immediately, it booted up, and opened to the operating system, automatically logging in for them as well. They quickly ran a program on it, and plugged a second stick into it when prompted. After a couple of minutes they removed it, the stick was then plugged into the data pad, and the inventory updated itself to include a complete copy of her data drive. Then the copied stick was promptly packed, while another girl proceeded to wipe her entire drive on the terminal. She looked up from the screen, and then informed the others that it was ready to be packed. They unplugged their device, and shut the wiped terminal down before packing it into a for sale box. By this point the sun was already up, and the apartment was more boxes than things. The girls were packing them up and loading them on the Griff pallet, while another checked something. Then they started on the furniture. It was clear that none of it came with the apartment. They folded up the pieces, labeled them and readied them for transit. Watched as everything was rapidly taken out and loaded into a waiting truck. She saw little that provided much insight into what they were doing, but questions were raised nonetheless. May stepped off the vehicle while still cloaked. The ride had proved to be rather uneventful, and Riku was the only passenger this courier was picking up. They had not gone to the nearby clinic though, but had instead gone to a large facility on the city's outskirts. It looked to be a complex with several unmarked and the marked buildings in close proximity to each other. It was built right next to the beach, with privacy fencing placed around the building. Nude bathers could be seen, either playing in the water or relaxing on the beach. She spotted quite a few ironies scattered around that beach as well, but most of the people there were Neku. The courier led Riku through the gate, and down a path towards a larger building in the resort. It was unmarked, and didn't seem all that special. A few people could be seen coming and going from the building. Still, May was curious about it. They ended up going right up to the doors, and walking into a reception room. The courier brought Riku up to the receptionist, a completely naked Neku woman, who smiled as they approached. The courier informed the receptionist, This is Riku, she is here for her admission exam. The woman nodded, and said, One moment, all right, I have one Riku listed here, and the images match, so no need for last name. She pointed to a door on the left, head through there, and take a seat. The doctor will collect you when she is ready to see you. Riku nodded, and headed for the door. The courier exchanged a few more words with the receptionist and then walked off. May caught them, but didn't think those words to be worth noting. Regardless of that, she did add them to a file already full of notes, and kept close to Riku. Beyond the door was, quite naturally, a waiting room, where a number of Neku sat doing nothing but waiting. It was a rather boring sight, and she took up a position near Riku to wait. She had a feeling that today was going to test the adjustments Megumi had made to their cloaks. Announcement. I hope you enjoyed the chapter. If you did, and are hungry for more, might I suggest that you check out my Patreon? Over 15 advanced chapters are currently available. Also supporting my work helps me produce more content for you. 29. Chapter 64 Observations at the Nude Resort I May looked around the waiting room while she waited for Riku to be called. Every few minutes someone was taken from the room, either by a Neku or an Inairai. In fact, she had seen quite a few Inairai on the grounds of this resort, and she thanked her luck that they had improved the cloak. Now they were no longer detectable by the more esoteric senses the Inairai had, not while cloaked anyway. An Inairai could still sense them when they were visible, but there was a reason for that. One that was very obvious to anyone who spent more than a moment to think about it. This place may not have looked like much from the outside, but it was definitely something they would have checked out regardless. She had little doubt about that, especially given that there were quite a few you in Ira here, something that automatically made it more suspicious. This might be some kind of brainwashing facility and not the resort it looked like on the surface. It wasn't long before a younger in Ira called for Riku. Riku stood, and headed for the door, where the in Ira girl smiled. This way, Riku followed in the direction indicated. Little chatting occurred as she was led to a small examination room. It had a few banks of equipment, and one of those strange exam tables the in Ira favored. Riku was directed to the table and made to sit down. Once she was securely settled in the chair, a mechanical arm was maneuvered over her swollen belly, while a couple more in Irai entered the room. Together they started attaching probes to her body and began a rather invasive set of scans. Scans that seemed focused on her belly more than anything else. In fact, one of the odder probes was even inserted into her vagina. She wasn't sure of its purpose, but thought she would likely find out soon enough. The first Inairai watched the monitor, as data was generated on it, 
displaying Riku's growing child, along with a great deal of medical data. She smiled, she looks very healthy, developing very nicely indeed. At the same moment, as she was saying that, she was pulling out a few tools. I am going to have to make a few alterations though, nothing to worry about, just relax, and let us do everything we deem necessary, May blinked. As she watched, Riku simply nodded, relaxed, and said, of course, go ahead, and do what you need to do. That was not the normal reaction you would expect of a mother being told that, obviously, she had been previously prepared for this encounter at some point. Likely brainwashed to cooperate with them, to the point that she wasn't even going to try and resist whatever they wanted to do with her unborn baby. Already several strange needles were being pushed into Riku's belly, the Anaira getting to work with some procedure. The exact purpose of the procedure, she didn't know, but the active monitor gave a few clues. Much of the medical data streaming across the monitor made little sense to her. As such, she established an uplink with Megumi, who quickly began analyzing what she was seeing. Interesting. I see what they are doing, responded Megumi. May mentally inquired about that response. Their techniques, while not as sophisticated as the ones I can use, are fairly advanced. The infant is being modified, adjusted to fit an altered genome. I believe they are ensuring she will be born enhanced. Further investigation of this facility might yield the data I need on what exactly that means. May remembered that Megumi wanted an enhanced NECU specimen. It felt nice to find a lead on that so quickly, although it was obvious to her that Riku's baby wasn't going to be that specimen. However as suggested, if they were enhancing one, it stood to reason that others would be enhanced here as well. In any case, she had a feeling Megumi had an idea of what exactly they were doing. Naturally, she inquired about that, as she was curious about what exactly they were doing to Riku's poor unborn daughter. Genome modification by the look of it. By regional standards, their techniques are quite sophisticated, although primitive when compared to Solian and Draconic standards. I suspect they will need a few follow-up procedures to make sure the modifications hold. Genome modification? What exactly are they modifying? Inquired May. Over the link, Megumi was quiet for a moment, before replying, from the looks of things, they seem to be introducing parts of their own genome into the child. Most notable are the segments dealing with reproduction, but they also seem to be altering the genes that deal with shnick ability, May frowned. They were messing with reproduction and schnicks. Odd set to be messing with. The question was why. She was about to ask for Megumi's thoughts, when she noticed the Inairai removing the needles, and putting their tools aside. The first Inairai smiled at Riku. The procedure went perfectly. I'll need to see your baby in a couple of days for a follow-up. But first we need to move on to your own procedures. They will be a little more involved, and will take a little longer. Just relax, and we will be done before you know it. She noted that not everything had been removed from Riku's belly, and they were already attaching new tools and equipment to the region. Several needles were strategically placed, and almost instantly she saw fluid being exchanged from Riku and a machine on the wall. Megumi informed her that they were isolating her womb, and putting the baby on external support, that it was no longer drawing any nutrients from its mother and was instead being supported entirely by that machine. What she saw did line up with that observation, but she was left wondering why exactly they would be doing that. What happened next shed some light on what they might be doing, as they hooked various needles into Riku's body. Special tools were also attached, and they began the procedure in earnest. It looked like a far more involved version of the procedure they had done with the growing fetus. That made a certain amount of sense though, the baby was still developing. While Riku was mature, as such, it would be easier to make the changes they were making with the baby compared to Riku. Why they were doing this remained the question, but she was learning quite a bit about what they were doing. Hopefully, Megumi would be able to make use of what was being learned here. Even if it did reinforce the need to obtain brief access to a specimen, getting them into a shuttle with the labs for just a few hours would be the fastest and best way to get all the data the Megumi wants. At the moment, she watched as the attached tubes started to deliver a strange fluid. At the same time, the Anairai were using their odd tools on her head and genitals. Each tool emitted a ray of pink light that didn't seem to do anything, at least not on the surface. May was not quite sure what they were doing but made every note of it. While this might be meaningless to her, it wasn't a Megumi, who analyzed everything she sent to her, including every detail of both procedures she had witnessed so far, and to think this day had barely started. The procedure itself certainly took longer than with the unborn infant. Eventually, the Anairai finally started putting their tools away and unhooking equipment from Riku. 
They removed all of the tubes and needles, and probes attached to her for the procedure, but they left the equipment used to isolate the baby. Then the first Inai returned to Riku, smiled and said, We are almost done here, just lay back and rest, we are going to take a quick break and be back in about two hours. She paused and showed off a pair of needles, before we go I am going to insert these in you. Make sure you don't disturb them, or the equipment still attached to your womb. I understand, I'll be careful. The Anairai smiled, glad you understand, May briefly glanced between the group, and Riku. Unsure of if she should follow them or stay to monitor Riku, Megumi however made the choice for her. Stay with Riku, and conduct a full scan for me. Your sensors aren't as good as those in a lab, but they will be enough for some preliminary data. Are you sure that is a good idea? She glanced around, there wasn't a visible sensor pod in sight, but there may be security systems that could detect something like that. Her cloak wouldn't be able to fully hide an active scan like that. At least she would not have to decloak for it. The risk is acceptable. Besides I need more data on what they are doing. Any data would be useful, even if lab data would be preferred. I understand, she replied. By then the three Inira doctors had left. She stepped up to Riku, and began scanning. Her sensor array contained basic biometric scanners, so she was able to collect some data. Most of it didn't make much sense to her, she knew what it meant. But understanding it was a different story, that was the case with much of her knowledge, not everything she knew was something she understood. Understanding took time, and the medical side of things was something May had not made her own, not yet anyway. She knew enough to know that nothing they did had impacted her health, at least not that she could see. May knew enough however to know that what was done likely impacted her lifespan, and if they were enhancing Shinnik ability as other indicators implied they were, that would indicate an increase in lifespan. Even with her beginner level understanding of the subject, it quickly became apparent that subtle alterations had already taken root in her brain. Alterations that seemed likely to increase Shinnik ability. What they were doing to her elsewhere was remarkably less clear, at least to her untrained eye. Megumi likely knew what she was looking at, and she had little doubt they were going to have quite the discussion about what she had seen here. As it was, May could only guess why they had just left her here. They had not even removed the external support system for the baby, but had added two more needles for purposes unknown. With a little bit of thought, she could make a guess, but honestly, she was hesitant to make that guess, not with her limited understanding of the subject. There were any number of reasons they could have done this, it could simply be that they isolated the baby in this fashion to protect it, but that might not be the only reason, there was little doubt that the cocktail they pumped into Riku could have been harmful to a young child, especially if they were using the method she thought they were using. If they were using that method, however, it would mean that changes made to the baby would likely spread to mommy, and vice versa, what they were doing was likely meant to accelerate the process, to what end, remained unclear. There were plenty of questions to answer, and she hoped some of them would be answered when they came back. Announcement Great news Today is a double release with a second chapter coming out at noon, and even an interlude to look forward to. Also last week I released my rewrite for NS, titled Chronicles of Soul. Do check it out. And if you haven't already considered joining me on Patreon, as they are getting a triple release today. 27. Chapter 65 Observations at the Nude Resort 2 May finished with her scan, glanced at the closed door before finding a spot on the floor to make herself comfortable. She wasn't going anywhere until the doctors came back, Riku seemed content to just lie there while the new needles exchanged fluids with her body, and a nearby machine. While the other machine continued to silently support her baby for her, she still didn't know why, but it seemed they had some time for discussion, especially now that she had nothing new to really observe not for a while anyway. So she directed her mental connection with Megumi, and inquired, did those scans reveal anything interesting about what they are doing? Quite a bit actually. I'm not ready to discuss my findings just yet however. I need some time to consider the implications, and I would like to confirm what I am seeing. I've already directed a group from another cell to locate an enhanced specimen. Your scan will prove quite useful to them. I'll let you know if they procure a specimen. She sighed. It seemed a conversation wasn't in the wings just yet. Megumi wasn't ready yet to share what she had learned. It was alright. But May was glad to hear that her scan was already being put to use to achieve one of Megumi's goals. It was nice knowing that she was actually useful and fulfilling her purpose like this. Even if for the moment she was currently stuck in a small room, unable to gather more information. At least until the doctors came back, 
A part of her wished that she could have gone to observe them. Still the scan was useful to Megumi so things were not all bad. Megumi closed the line with Mei, as she considered the implications of what she had been able to determine. Mei's biometric scanners were rather rudimentary, so she was not able to obtain a complete genetic workup. Something that would have been quite useful. But what she did gain was quite interesting. It seemed the Inari were quite skilled with biological alterations, and genetic engineering. Subject Riku showed indications of a rather interesting set of enhancements. The early changes in brain structure were clearly designed to enhance her shinnik abilities, and while interesting, that was not the only set of changes going on. The changes going on down below were quite intriguing. She had only been through one treatment so far, but already she could see a few interesting developments. In the case of the baby, it was harder to tell, but for mommy, she could see the first changes, the vagina had changed slightly, and a new proto-appendage was starting to grow. Megumi figured a few more treatments would be required to finish the changes, but they may complete on their own if given time. As for what changes were occurring from the looks of it, they were forcing the Neku subject to develop their organs to more closely match those of an Inairai. Already she could draw a few conclusions from this, but to be sure she wanted a more complete scan from a fully enhanced Neku, until then, she didn't want to share her findings, not until she was absolutely sure about what they were doing. Mei stretched and stood up, a couple of hours had passed, Riku had done little since the procedure started, and Mei had passed the time keeping tabs with Kairu, and Kk had relayed what she had observed, and apparently in the last couple of hours ran into Zella, who had not forgotten their incomplete conversation. K ended up agreeing to meet her for lunch, something she seriously considered blowing off, but May had advised her to attend. Zella might prove to be a problem if they don't deal with her, and blowing her off would likely make things worse. As for Kairu, she had gone shopping with Kelly. Kelly had some time to kill before inspection, and she wanted to spend it with Kairu. May suspected there was more to that than met the eye, not that she planned to say anything. It was honestly kind of cute and rather endearing. She put those thoughts aside, as the door opened and a pair of irony entered the room. One of them was the leading doctor, but the other was younger. If she had to guess, the second girl was around Kelly's age. That in Ira smiled, when her gaze locked on Riku. Is this the Neku you were telling me about? She is alright, we are almost finished with her first procedure. I just have to remove a few devices. I see, and you wanted me to meet her. Why? The first smiled replying, you will be her manager and caretaker for a while, not to mention I plan to have you care for her child once it's strong enough to be taken from its mother. The younger one turned to the first Anairai, a large smile on her face, you think I am ready? Yes, it's about time you looked after a child. Just remember to keep in contact with her mother. When it is old enough, it will be returned to her, not to mention I will be keeping tabs on its development. She nodded, I won't let you down. I'll make sure she grows up to be a good girl. May frowned. This interaction seemed interesting, although perhaps not entirely unexpected, especially given the attitude that Kelly had apparently expressed. Something about Neki not making good mothers, just May had not expected them to be taking children from their mothers so young. What was said next however shed some light on why they were doing this. You better. Her own mother won't have time to care for her soon, much less teach her. As such it will fall to you. Now I am going to start removing the equipment, and then you can take her down to extraction. The younger girl nodded. I'll make sure she gets there. May wasn't sure what they were talking about with the mention of extraction, but the other bit. Well, that implied something. She had to wonder what exactly the first in Ira meant about Rick and not having time to care for her own child. May had a few ideas. It may have something to do with the ongoing brainwashing, or perhaps whatever they had planned for her. More likely it was some combination of brainwashing and what they planned for her. Putting those thoughts aside, she watched as the first Inari girl started removing the equipment. She started with the pair of needles that had been inserted just before they went on break. The strange needles came out of her flesh easily. A small tool was run over the wound causing the flesh to knit back together quickly. It was a dermal regeneration laser, a common tool. DRLs were often found in first aid kits, and could quickly heal most minor wounds by stimulating the flesh to regenerate at an accelerated rate. She moved on to the devices hooked up to Riku's belly, and carefully disconnected them. It was a delicate process as at the moment the fetus was supported entirely by that machine and not her own mother. 
The Anairi removed each connection carefully and stood by with the DRL, using it after each removal to quickly heal away all evidence of what had been done. The last thing she did was shut off the fluid exchange before removing those tubes, finishing with a quick treatment from the DRL. She then smiled at Riku, okay we are done here, for now, I'll see you again in a couple of days for a follow-up procedure. In the meantime, Yuria here is going to take you down to extraction. It's nothing to worry about, we simply need access to your memories. She nodded. My memories? Sure you can have access to them. She smiled, and then gestured for the younger Inairai, Yuria to guide her. May followed the pair out of the room. They ended up going down several corridors, and a couple flights of stairs to end up in another small room. It had another strange table chair, but the equipment differed. Another Inairai was waiting and smiled when Riku and Yuria entered the room. Sit here, and we can have this done soon enough. Riku settled into the chair, while Yuria settled in to wait in a chair set off against the wall. May moved closer, and watched as some equipment was set up around Riku's head. While different in design, she recognized it. It was a form of neural interface technology. A disc was settled into a slot, and the new Inairai smiled. Okay, I am going to get started in a moment. You may feel some discomfort and have difficulty accessing your memory while I am doing this. That is normal. Since we have time, I am doing a more involved version of the procedure. One that is less likely to destroy your original memories, although some may be erased in the process anyway. That is okay, since we can simply replace them with copies. Understand? Riku replied. I understand. The Anairai smiled. Great. Then she turned on the device. Riku's face distorted instantly for a moment or two, but settled back to a less discomforted look. A monitor activated, and began to fill with data. The Anairai began tapping away at a console, and it took May only a couple of moments to realize that she was organizing the results as they were generated. Creating an archive and adding notes onto the crystal, May was not surprised to see them doing this, especially after they went to the trouble of disappearing Riku. As the Anairai had indicated they had time to do what they wanted, and she could easily guess why they wanted a full copy of Riku's memories. It was something that would be quite useful for their brainwashing program, not to mention since they were known to alter memories. Doing this would allow them to go through them at their leisure. That time would allow them to make stronger, more consistent false memories. Along with other advantages, May watched them work, noting how the archive formed. A reference table was being created along with markers indicating the original memory location in Riku's brain. It was a remarkably detailed data archive they were forming. Watching them do it was fascinating, and the techniques were somewhat different compared to similar processes used back in the Empire. At least according to the knowledge she was born with, unlike Megumi she couldn't tell how sophisticated they were in comparison, but that didn't make it any less impressive to her. The Anaira using the device seemed to be quite diligent with helping the process along. It certainly ended up taking a while. In the corner, with the chair, she noted that Yuria had produced a mobile terminal. It was settled onto her lap, the screen up, and she seemed to be engrossed with whatever was displayed on it. Occasionally she manipulated a control, but not often. May was more occupied with observing the memory archival process, so she didn't go over to look at what she was doing. She also noted each time Riku's expression shifted, and occasionally the Anairai woman would ask Riku a question. Riku would then answer it, but to May, it seemed the goal of the questions was to get Riku to think about something. Her answers were not relevant. Eventually, the Anairai stepped back with a smile. She disengaged the device, and as she started removing the equipment attached to Riku's head, she said, All right we are done. How do you feel? Okay, I think. But my head hurts something fierce. That's normal. We just copied every little memory in your head, and some of them were erased in the process. They can be replaced later, but we aren't going to right now. The headache should pass on its own in a few minutes, and you may experience a little disorientation when you get up. I'd like you to not worry about the missing memories. You won't need them. Not while you are here anyway. We will make sure they are replaced before you leave. Rika nodded. All right. The Anairai pointed her at a monitor, pressed a few keys, and a video began to play. Although it was not just any video, it was taken from Riku's memory. Riku commented after a moment, that is so weird, I remember that, but it's also clearly on the screen. The Anairai nodded, I'm going to play a few more, just pay attention and watch them. I may ask you something, as well, but you won't need to answer, I just need to gauge how well your memory is working right now. Riku focused on the screen, as asked. The Anairai would then play different memories from the archive, 
and would write notes down. May looked over her shoulder at the pad the notes were on. She was noting memory function all right, measuring and recording how well she was remembering something. This must be a normal memory test done after an extraction. She could guess a few reasons for it. This part took a bit, but not as long as the archival process. The Anirai's notes even marked where the lost memories were, and which memories she now had difficulty recalling. Among other little notes. Once she was done with that, she smiled. All right Riku, I have what I need. Yuria over there is going to make sure you get where you need to be next, and I'll see you again after we finish going through your memories. Riku nodded, and when prompted slipped out of the chair. Yuria smiled, and pulled her along out of the room. May followed, curious to see where she would be taken next. As she left, she glanced at the clock and noticed it was already past noon. Thanks to her machine heritage, she was fine. Even without that heritage, skipping one meal would be okay, but she figured they would be taking Riku to eat about now. Especially since she was with child, and they seemed to have plans for that child. Not to mention plans for Riku as well. Sure enough, that was exactly where Riku was taken next. A cafeteria, where Yuria ordered food for both of them. She ordered a fairly large portion for Riku, one that Riku stared at when they reached the table. Oh, don't give it that look. You will need to eat at least that much. You are eating for two, and I believe you didn't get breakfast. I had a brief meal when I got up this morning before heading to the door to wait for my pickup. Well then all the more reason to eat, that couldn't have been enough. Anyway. Since we are going to be together for a while, why don't you tell me a bit about yourself? Riku shifted in her seat, and frowned, I guess. But couldn't you just go through my memories? Yuria giggled. I could, but I would like to learn a bit about you. From you. All right. I guess we can talk about my life for a bit. Anything, in particular, you would like to hear about? Announcement. Enjoy the chapter? Consider leaving a comment. Also, do check out my other story Chronicles of Soul. 28. Interlude Legend of Starhold. Starhold. A legendary fortress lost to time, but her name continues to live on. She was the most feared fortress of her age, built in the final days of the First Lords as the ultimate weapon for the Solian Empire. It was their Manhattan Project, and was touted as the weapon to end all wars. There are many theories about what exactly the weapon it carried did, but thanks to modern fortresses based on her, her defenses are largely known. It was a massive spherical construct with the main body being roughly 12,000 kilometers in diameter, and it was surrounded by three orbiting rings with twice the diameter. The first ring rested at the equatorial layer, while the other two were offset by 45 degrees above and below causing the rings to intersect at a common point considered the prime meridian of the Starhold Fortress. A massive sprawling collection of towering spires dotted the surface of Starhold, while also concealing a vast weapons array and planet-side starship docks. Weapons included numerous missile and torpedo emplacements, supplemented by Hellfire plasma cannons and PBBs. Her surface, while heavily armored as well, relied on a powerful primary shield matrix for protection. The rings actually played a role in projecting that shield matrix. Still none of what is here, explains why the fortress was so feared. What super weapon did it carry, that it could strike fear into so many? The most prevailing theory is that it carried some new more deadly version of the ASC, able to wipe out entire star systems from a galaxy away. While that would be a terrifying weapon. It doesn't mesh with the facts. ASCs have been around for a long time as well. They would not have terrified the First Lords of their own weapon to the point that they would suppress all knowledge of it, and seal it away so that it could not be used. That brings to question, what was the true weapon? Perhaps some kind of shockwave weapon able to destroy entire galaxies at once? Truly a terrifying weapon, and there is more weight to that theory. But there are people who doubt that one Project Star Destroyer led to many more doubting this theory as well, especially after it was mentioned by Supreme Protector Countrymen that the Starhold and Star Destroyer projects were unrelated. If that wasn't a lie, then it means the weapon could not have been a galaxy-destroying weapon, as that is exactly what Project Star Destroyer produced. Regardless, that theory holds some weight. The theory with the most weight, even if it is somewhat dismissed, hold that the weapon does have a galaxy-wide effect. However, that effect is not believed to be destructive. So what kind of weapon is it? The answer is that the fortress itself was a massive Shinnok amplifier unlike any other. Granting a wielder god-like Shinnok ability, the implications of such a device are beyond terrifying. No weapon of mass destruction could compare. An ASC can wipe out an entire star system in an instant. But it can also be defended against. For this amplifier, 
there would be no defense. You activate this, and an entire galaxy would fall under your domain in an instant. In other words, this little fortress would allow for a single person to mind control an entire galaxy at once. War as we know it would be over. Rebellions would fold before they could even form. Entire populations would dance in the palms of a single man. Such a prospect is so terrifying and brings to mind the true evils that such a weapon could bring about. In that light, a weapon that could grant absolute power of such a degree cannot be allowed to exist. With that in mind, if this theory is true as many believe it is, it becomes little wonder that the First Lords reacted the way they did, after but one use of the weapon, they suppressed all knowledge of it, and the science used to create it, then they sealed the fortress away, so it could never be used again, and even created an order to prevent such a weapon from being made again. Announcement That's all for the day folks. I hope you enjoyed all the extra content. 26 Chapter 66 Clues in Conversation May quietly snatched a piece of fruit off the plate of a passing Inairi. Her cloaking field quickly encompassed the stolen fruit. Sure her biology meant she didn't need to eat, but that didn't mean she didn't want to eat. The Inairi didn't even notice the theft, and she paid close attention to the conversation unfolding at the table before her. It might not reveal much, but she couldn't dismiss any information out of hand. At the moment, the Anirai girl, Yuria had just asked Riku to tell her a bit about herself, and Riku wanted to know if there was anything particular she wanted to know. Yuria picked up a utensil, and replied, I believe you are rather new to the city, right? Riku nodded, yeah, I moved into the capital a couple of months ago. Yuria smiled, I thought so. What brought you into town? Looking for work mostly. She rubbed her swollen belly, it costs a lot to raise a kid, and my old job didn't pay that well. It might have been fine if her father was around, but he was drafted, he sends me money, but it's barely enough to make ends meet. As such, I was in the market for a better job, preferably with both better hours, and pay. I found one here, and they helped me move into my current apartment, although I am not sure what I am going to be doing now, since one of your fellows asked me to terminate my employment, and said something about me not going back to the apartment. Yuria nodded. I see. Well don't worry about that. They won't leave you without a job or shelter. I'm sure they already have a place lined up for you, and perhaps even a job. One that will likely pay quite well, but I can't say anything about the hours. If anything they will almost certainly be quite long. Perhaps, she did say not to worry about that, and they would take care of everything. Oh, that they will. You shouldn't have to worry about a thing. Glad to hear that. The Anirai girl smiled and took a bite of her food. Then she changed the subject, since you mentioned her father. I take it your old town was one of the townships that still allows men, or perhaps it was a world that seemed interesting. May paid close attention to the response while nibbling at her stolen fruit. While the skin wasn't edible for a Neku or Anirai, the entire thing was edible to her. It was on the home world, a smaller town to the north, and yes, men were still allowed there, until recently. A couple of months before I moved down here, all the men were either drafted or relocated. As for the boys, thanks to the new gender laws, they were required to visit the clinic for gender correction. Yuria shifted in her seat. Interesting. I guess your old town must have been selected for a new nest. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so aggressive with making it a girls only town. Riku shrugged. I wasn't really thinking about it until now, but you might be right about that. There is little doubt about that. She paused for another bite of food, why don't you tell me a bit about your life back then, your friends and family, that sort of thing, Riku nodded and started to relay her experiences. Yuria would occasionally ask questions, but she revealed little about herself, as the conversation continued, May noted that what Riku was sharing grew increasingly intimate, no surprise there, especially given her lack of a problem with having her memories copied. She had even lost a few in the process and was acting as if there was nothing wrong with that. So there was little surprise that she started answering very intimate questions about her relationship with her husband. I see. Sounds like he was a rather interesting man. Have you been in contact with him much recently? Riku shook her head. Not really. The military restricts contact between us. Ah, ah yes, that was to be expected. Now that you are here, I expect the others to take a controlling interest in your relationship, possibly even terminate it. Riku frowned, I guess. I don't see why they would want to terminate it, though. Well don't worry about it, and if they ask you to terminate it just do it. All right, I will, she said, agreeing to that far too easily. 
In fact she seemed to be barely questioning it, and not very resistant to the idea either. May wondered if they had indeed been preparing her for that sort of thing, and if Yuria was just probing her to see how she would react to the idea. From the look of things, she seemed to dislike the idea, but would go along with it if asked. Great, glad to hear it. She paused for another bit of food, and said, I guess we can talk about your baby now. She pats her stomach, and replied, I guess. But there isn't much to talk about is there? Oh. There is a bit to talk about. I've been told that you are going to be busy. You won't have much time to care for her. So I am going to be doing much of that for you. Her tone seemed a bit more defensive. You are? Yeria reached across the table with a tentacle and started stroking her head. Rika visibly relaxed. And after a moment she was told, Yep. Yeah, you might not see much of her. I will take good care of her for you, and make sure she grows up a good girl. Don't worry you will see plenty of her for her first few weeks. I won't be taking over until she is strong enough to leave you. May licked her fingers of the last juices of the stolen fruit. She had eaten it slowly, but it was gone all too quickly. In any case, this seemed more interesting than it had been in the last few minutes. I guess that is okay then. Although I would like to know you a little better first. You don't need to know me. Just trust me. That is why I am here now so that you can learn to trust me with your child. She nodded, and May noted the slightly glazed look in her eyes. I don't need to know you. I just need to trust you. I understand. Glad to hear that. We can work on your trust over the next few days. Sound good? Rika nodded again. That does. Now moving on, about your baby's name? Her glazed eyes lit up, and she said, Oh I already have a couple of names picked out. Care to hear them? Nah. I want you to forget those names. I want to name your baby. I know it's normally a mother's right, but since I am going to be taking care of it, I want that right instead. Her eyes dimmed and glazed over. All right, you can have that right. Yeria smiled. Thank you. It's so nice of you to start trusting me enough to hand over that right. We can make it more formal later. Rika replied. Yes, we make the agreement more formal later, and you did say I needed to learn to trust you. Good girl. Now finish your food. I have another appointment to get you to in a few minutes. It's nothing to worry about, and we will be done before you know it. Rika nodded, and went back to her food. The conversation died off, and the two finished their meals in silence. Yeria signaled someone to collect their food, and led them out of the room. May followed them, and led to another small room. This time quite a few Inairai were waiting for them, and Riku was promptly guided into a chair where they quickly attached probes to her, while others wrapped their tentacles around her. What followed was clearly a brainwashing procedure. It seemed they were strengthening their grasp on her mind. Kairu stretched, after helping Kelly into the truck. They had just recently finished lunch, and now it was time to head off to another inspection. She sighed, it was not a job she looked forward to. After all she was helping take girls away from their families, where who knows what could be done to them. Getting involved with Kelly had certainly shed some light, but she didn't really think it was going to yield more. Not any time soon, but maybe Kelly could open some doors for her? It was worth thinking about, but it would require bringing the girl more fully into the cell. That seemed risky, however. Still, maybe there was a way to gauge the risk before trying. After all, she wasn't going to get anywhere without taking risks. With that thought, she climbed into the driver's seat, and closed the door, as she guided the truck out of its bay. Kelly spoke up. Um, Akairu, uh, can we talk about something? Ah, uh, sure. What do you want to talk about? Asked Kairu curious about why she seemed hesitant. She didn't answer right away, but after a moment, she said, Remember when you asked me about why that neighborhood was selected? Kairu nodded. I remember that. Um, well I never fully answered that question, and I think you deserve to know a little more. Um, she prompted. Kelly sighed. Um, well a major factor in the selection is, um well, reproduction. That neighborhood was found to be good for that. We're um, compatible with the NECU, and can breed rather quickly. I see. So what exactly does this have to do with selecting that neighborhood? Kelly shifted, twisting her tentacles together, and several expressions morphed her features. After a moment or two she quietly replied, Remember what I said about enhanced NECU, and taboos? Kyra nodded. I never really told you about it, but I guess I should mention what an enhanced Neku is. You didn't, and I have been curious. Well, I don't know all the details involved, but in short, they are being enhanced for stronger mental powers. The more important bit is what we are doing elsewhere. We are making them more like us. They won't need men anymore to get pregnant once the process completes. We don't either, 
She knew that Megumi had told her that they were a single sex species. The rest seemed to imply that they were trying to do the same to the Neku. The question was why? Unfortunately, it seemed Kelly wasn't sure how to explain what she wanted to explain. Kelly sighed and fidgeted. Those girls are being trained, among other things, to be less reserved about sex. And we are even going to set up facilities and services for child care there. The whole goal of selecting neighborhoods is for nesting, and not just for our own children. We want, and need, Neku children as well. Kyrie looked back, and smiled. I seem to have noticed. Most Neku seem to do a lot of work for your kind. Kelly nodded. We are born leaders, but leaders need a workforce. That is what they are for. Any task beneath us, they exist to fulfill. Kairu was inclined to dispute that. But it certainly lined up with observed behaviors. They did seem to consider themselves above ordinary Neku. There was one thing she had to point out. I've noticed that tendency, but I don't think that gives you the right to turn people's lives upside down and turn them into sex workers. Kelly frowned. Um, that is only part of what they are doing. We make sure they have nice productive jobs. It is not just sex jobs that they have both the aptitude and inclination for, if possible. If not, we can nudge them to develop an inclination for something they do have an aptitude for. I see replied Kairu, likely part of that workforce angle, but she wasn't sure she liked the picture Kelly painted. Unfortunately even if she could convince Kelly that this was wrong, convincing the rest of her kind would prove impossible. Reaching the block, they were heading for, she set the truck down. As she was doing that Kelly said, um, I, uh, would like to show you something. Announcement. Hungry for more? It's a great time to join me on Patreon, where you can check out the advanced chapters. Also do check out my other stories, and I have more good news. After a lot of thought, I have begun work on a rewrite for Dimadag. Do look forward to it, and before you ask it should not affect your regularly scheduled chapters. 26. Chapter 67 in Iri Flirting, and Clues in Contract. May stretched a little, as she watched Riku being released from the Iri brainwashing her. Yuria stepped forward with a smile on her face. She reached forward with a tentacle and began stroking Riku's head. Riku leaned into the tentacle with a pleased look on her face, while her eyes glazed right back over. After a couple of moments, Yuria removed the tentacle, and let Riku stand up. Riku carefully slipped out of the chair, as Yuria told her, All right, you have a spa session coming up, but before that, we will need to conduct a few very invasive scans to see how you and your baby are doing after your procedure. Nothing to worry about. In the meantime we have a little free time to make our little agreement more formal. Riku nodded, of course, let's get that done. May noted that she seemed almost eager to get that done. While Yuria began leading her out of the room, May followed her, allowing her to listen in on their conversation. Yuria inquired, so how do you feel about the prospect of terminating your relationship with your husband? Riku smiled, I'd gladly do it if asked. May blinked, it seemed her feelings on that had already changed. They were clearly working on making her more willing to terminate the relationship. The question was why? Yuria seemed to like her answer, great, I'm glad to hear it. We'll be asking you to terminate that later. In the meantime, I'd like you to forget I asked you about it. Riku nodded. Alright, consider it forgotten. Yuria smiled, and gestured to turn left leading the way through the complex. May continued to stick close and listen to their conversation, making note of what items she considered to be interesting. Before too long they ended up in a small office. Yuria led Riku over to the desk, and had her sit down in front of it while pulling something off a stack of nearby papers. She smiled. All right, while the others were working on your mind, I went ahead and prepared a few forms for you to sign. Now we will be simply going over these, and then you simply sign them for me. We aren't going to be negotiating just me dictating, and you agreeing, all right? Riku nodded, without even protesting, instead she said, yes, that sounds agreeable. Yuria's smile widened, seeming almost predatory, as she said, excellent, before placing the first item in front of Riku, all right, this one is simply the formal version of our arrangement, it simply states that you agreed to hand over your right to name your baby to me. Riku nodded, leaned over and looked at the paper. May also did, and noted that with the way it was phrased, she was handing Yuria that right permanently, which Yuria then mentioned. As you can see, this also outlines that I will retain that right for your future children as well. So just sign here, and it will be official. Riku grabbed the pen, and signed where indicated with little hesitation. Yuria seemed quite happy about that. Yuria reached forward with a tentacle again, then asked her, out of curiosity. 
Can you still remember those names you said you picked out earlier? A beaming Riku shook her head. Nope, I can't remember them at all. Just like you asked me to. I forgot them. Yuria's predatory looking smile widened further. Good, glad to hear that. And how do you feel now that you have officially given me your right to name your baby? Riku frowned for a moment, strangely glad, but a little worried. You aren't going to name her something weird right? Don't worry about it. Remember this is meant to help you learn to trust me. Just trust that I won't name your daughter something weird. Okay. Riku nodded. I'll try. Yuria shifted. And I am here to help you. She then pulled out a larger stack of papers. Yuria placed it before Riku, while saying, Now this is the big item. This outlines the Anairai caretaker service, which we are enrolling you in. Riku glanced at the first page. I see. This document largely outlines our relationship, saying that you agree to allow me to care for, and raise your child. This also outlines what rights you have to the child, while also outlining what rights I have over your child. Riku nodded, clearly starting to pay more attention to the page. May looked over her shoulder and started to read it. She also noted that it clearly favored the appointed caretaker, greatly favored the caretaker. As she was reading it, Yuria began going over it, detailing the rules and rights it outlined. In other words, how exactly this service functioned. If you could call something that takes your baby from you and gives you absolutely zero control over how she was raised a service, now the Anairai caretaker service provides you a caretaker, who in this case will be me. As caretaker, I will be granted primary control in the raising of your kids. This means, I will make all the decisions about how they are raised for you, from the moment they are born. Out of curiosity, how do you feel about that? Riku frowned, strangely relieved. It's kind of nice not having to worry about raising her. Yuria smiled. Good. You should be feeling that way at this point in your conditioning sessions. Now as outlined here, you will be spending plenty of time with your baby when she is first born. But once I deem she is strong enough to not need you, I will be restricting your access to her. You may not see her for months or even years at a time. As caretaker, I will have full discretion on when you are allowed to see your baby, but you and I will be meeting regularly. During those meetings you have the right to information on how your daughter is doing in my care. This includes the possibility of videos and slash or memory implants detailing important milestones in your baby's development. However I will have full discretion in what I share about her development, and I can ask you to waive that right if I so desire. If asked, you are required to waive it, you cannot refuse anything I ask of you in that regard. Understand? Riku nodded. Yes, I understand. As my appointed caretaker you will make all decisions regarding the care of my children. You will also take my baby from me, and restrict my access to her once you deem she is able to leave my side. I have the right to information on how she is doing, but you have full discretion on what is shared and may request that I waive the right. If requested I must waive that right. Also while you and I may meet regularly, I may not see my baby for months or even years at a time after you take her from me. Yuria nodded. Good. You do understand. Now I'll tell you a bit about how the program works. Normally the child is left with mommy to nurse for a few weeks. She paused and lifted one of her own tits. However we don't let her nurse solely on mommy. Her caretaker often offers her own milk as well. Once the caretaker deems she is ready. Your baby will be taken away. After that, you will have restricted access to her, until she is around 10 years old. The exact age is up to the discretion of the caretaker. She may let this happen at either a younger or older age, at which point your baby will be allowed to move back in with you. Even at this point you are required to defer to your caretaker's wishes in all decisions regarding your daughter. In addition, the caretaker retains the option to restrict your access to her at any time. How do you feel about that? Riku frowned, and sighed, I'm not sure I like the fact that I might miss so much of my baby's development. Yuria leaned forward and placed a tentacle on her head. Most mothers don't, not at first. Removing her from you however is critical, as it allows you to focus more on your assigned work. Besides, doing it this way ensures she will bond first to me, rather than you. Something that is quite important given that I will be her primary caregiver, trust me. You will feel better about this later. Riku's eyes glazed over, as she nodded. Then moments later, she was directed to sign the multi-page Inairai caretaker service contract in several places. May watched her effectively sign her child away. Not that she could do anything about that just yet. She wasn't idle, however, as she relayed everything she saw to Megumi, who would make sense of everything they saw. 
The only page not signed when Yeria pulled the pen away was the last one. Yeria smiled calmly, all right then, now, this last part deals with how the service will be paid, in short, you don't have to worry about a thing, simply deposit your money as normal in your account, and we will withdraw money to pay for it when needed. You will not be informed of the withdrawals, and they will occur regularly. We ask you to continue not paying attention to the money that disappears from the account and to continue refraining from touching your money until stated otherwise. The service uses an unfixed rate, and the cost of the service may change from a day-to-day -day basis at my discretion, while withdrawals will occur on a regular basis. I may take additional money if needed, the money taken will be used mainly for the care of your daughter and other services we may enroll either you or your daughter in. Understand? When Rika nodded and acknowledged her understanding a moment later, she was asked to sign that page twice. As for Kairu, she was having a rather unexpected experience. She had just landed the truck while having a somewhat unusual conversation with Kelly. A conversation that took a weird turn when Kelly nervously mentioned wanting to show her something. So now she was in the back of the truck, with Kelly flushed bright, and lying on her back. Her gaze was locked on something extending out of Kelly's engorged folds. It was a tentacle that was fairly short, but reasonably thick yet looked quite flexible. Where her other tentacles were a pale green, this one was rather pink with streaks of purple in it. The skin looked much more delicate as well. Kelly shyly put her fingers together, and with a cute panting breath said, this is my reproductive tentacle, we don't normally show it to others, only to those we intend to mate with. Then she paused and flushed more brightly, and looked away for a moment. I am. Um, I like you, and want to have a baby with you. Kairu didn't know what to say, and she certainly wasn't used to others being this. Direct. She had remembered a bit about what Megumi had told her about this process, but she wasn't sure she was ready to be a mother. She didn't even realize she had voiced that concern until Kelly said, if it helps, I am more than willing to both carry the child and care for her, but please consider granting my request. Feeling unsure about this, she contacted the only person she could think of that could grant her advice. Megumi replied quickly. She can indeed have a child with you and be the one carrying it. Since she has a tentacle and you don't, the baby would be created in your womb, but it can be easily transferred afterward to Kelly's womb. Her tentacle is perfectly capable of doing that. Especially now that I fixed a little problem for her. Something about the Anairai not being able to carry their own young to term. Kelly can though, and she knows it instinctively since I coded her that way. Megumi paused, and then after a moment said, Anyway, I would recommend giving her what she wants. The Anairai move quickly in their relationships, and we could use having a strong bond with her. However, if you don't want to do this, I suggest being very careful with how you reject her, as she will take your not granting the baby she asked for as a rejection. That bit of advice left Kairu in an awkward place, but after a moment more of thought, she made her choice. She certainly had never considered this to be a decision she might have to make, but she was able to make one announcement. Enjoying my work? Consider supporting me on Patreon. Not only can you enjoy advanced chapters, but you will help me produce more content for you. 27. Chapter 68 offers inspections and considerations. Kelly blushed when she heard the words she wanted to hear. It was actually happening. She was going to be a mother. It had been a dream of hers for years, and many of her friends also wanted a child of their own. There was just something special about that but she knew plenty who would rather care for someone else's child than their own. She remembered how fulfilled her own mother had felt raising her, and soon she would be able to feel that herself rather than through someone else. Even better, it would be her own child. She pulled Kairu close to her, and pressed her lips against the Neku girl's lips. Her tongue slipped between the barrier, and after a moment Kairu returned the kiss. Sparks passed, and she reached out with her mind. To her shock, something in Kairu responded for once. She couldn't just feel her presence, but something more. Not thoughts, not memories like she could with other Neku. Something far simpler, but equally precious to her. The sensations sent her right over the edge. In her heart, she had known it, and in her head suspected it. But now she knew, Kairu was far too precious to let anyone else touch her. As she came back from the edge, she wrapped a pair of her tentacles around Kairu's breasts. Even as Kairu's fingers found her way to her own specifically her middle pair of boobs, it felt nice, electric even to have them gently teased like this. She redoubled her efforts, and brought a second set of tentacles to bear to tease Kairu's entrance. She was rewarded with a moan, which felt quite pleasant against her still dueling tongue. Pleasant enough that they broke the kiss for a moment. 
before diving right back into it. At this moment she knew she could plunge her reproductive tentacle right into Kairu's entrance, but she didn't quite yet. It was too soon, and she wanted to feel more. At this moment, she could feel exactly how Kairu was feeling, and not just her own sensations. With a thought, she pushed against Kairu's mental barrier, sending everything she was feeling right back at her partner. At first she didn't seem to be getting through, but after a moment she felt Kairu open up a little more. Sparks exploded in her head as the pleasure suddenly doubled. A bond was forming between them, and now they both could feel everything the other was feeling. They both went over the edge, sticky fluids pooled on the seats below them. In the heat of the moment, she cared not about that. Besides, she wasn't going to be cleaning it up later anyway. Some Nekia would be doing that. She arched her back, and moaned loudly in sync with the more flexible Nekia girl above her. As the sparks died, she became aware of the growing burning heat in her loins. Heat that only grew all the more due to the strong shinnick link they had formed. She increased the speed of her movements, kneading her partner's breasts more and even twisting the nipples a little, sending powerful bursts of pleasant electricity through Kairu, bursts that she felt return through the link, she moaned, and again went over the edge, her mind blanked, turning white as even more fluids pooled beneath them, by this point she was quite aware of how ready the two of them were, and as her high subsided, she finally drove the tentacle into the wet folds of her partner, it slid in easily without even a hint of resistance, she began stroking it back and forth, each movement sent spikes of intense pleasure through the both of them. With each movement they both climax slightly. She relished the heated pleasure of the sensations, letting her instincts guide her, as her mind simply stopped thinking about anything but the moment itself. Kelly was loving every second of this, enjoying the way she was being bombarded by the sensations and feelings of her partner, enjoying the delightful feel of her partner's breasts under her writhing tentacles enjoying the feel of fingers teasing the nipples of her own breasts, and rapidly moving between them. Each little flicker and touch sent delightful sparks up her spine, her pleasure-soaked mind was also relishing in the way Kairu's folds squeezed and compressed and writhed around her sensitive reproductive tentacle. Finally the heat and pleasure coursing through them both hit a crescendo, and she let out a loud moan, as a rush left her from below, and her partner joined her in voicing the great pleasure she was feeling. Her tentacle swelled up below as her load entered Kairu, and she fell back tired. Kairu collapsed on top of her, and her reproductive tentacle remained firmly inside her partner. At the same moment, she became aware of Kairu's mind withdrawing from her own, and hers from Kairu. It seemed that they could no longer maintain that link, it didn't matter to her. She felt nothing but joy and pleasure from the experience they had shared. A part of her regretted not doing this sort of thing earlier. Most of her simply relished in the contented afterglow and feelings. At least until she fell asleep with Kairu snuggled on top of her. May followed the pair down the corridor, while she considered the documents she had just watched Riku sign. Documents that had effectively signed away her kid. Hell, Yuria could, thanks to that document, legally kidnap her daughter? It just went to show how thoroughly they had brainwashed her already. Hell. She didn't even blink at the method of payment outlined or the cost. The contract for the Anirai caretaker service stated it had an unfixed rate. Her caretaker could change the price at her own discretion. While it was indeed stated that the funds would be used mainly for the care of her daughter and any other services either mother or daughter may be enrolled in, there was a whole section stating that the funds may be used at the discretion of the caretaker. In addition, she was not entitled to any refunds or allowed to even request one. Of course with the whole bit about not being allowed to notice her money disappear or being allowed to touch it, that was kind of moot, another item she noted, but Yuria didn't mention, was a line about how Riku would not be allowed to request termination of this service, the service can only be terminated at the discretion of the caretaker, and if terminated the caretaker retains the right to take Riku's baby with her. Just one more in a long list of little items that were designed to favor the caretaker. Still the fact that she had signed that just went to show how deeply brainwashed she was, and the reason she was here was to deepen that brainwashing. It left one to wonder how much more poor Riku could lose to the Anirai. Likely not much, since she was practically a slave at this point. As the Anirai now controlled just about everything that mattered, and there wasn't much more they could take from her. Especially since they had effectively taken her mind from her as well. May pushed that thought aside, and considered the contract again. It basically allowed them to steal her earnings. Them having consolidated her money into a black account had given them easy access. But this just legalized them taking it. She could already picture it, 
Riku would be given a job with absurdly long hours where she is expected to practically work her butt off for effectively no pay, as everything she earns will go into that black account, where it would promptly disappear into the hands of whatever services they have her enrolled in, forcing her to use that spending account she would have been given for anything she needs, and that account would only allow her to buy things they approved. Of course, this was only possible because of the foolish things they had brainwashed her into doing for them. Some of this just didn't sit right with her, but she knew Kairu would have a larger problem with it. May noted their course was taking them towards a room she was familiar with, so she put that line of thought aside. She had a growing list of things she wanted to chat with Megumi about, but at the moment she figured it best to focus on the task at hand, observing what they were doing to Riku. Already it was providing invaluable insights into their brainwashing program and what they were doing to the Neku, it was clearly more than just a brainwashing program going on here. As the procedures done to both mummy and unborn baby indicated, Yuria opened a familiar door, and led Rika into the room. May followed and noted it was the same room she had her initial exam and her procedure in. A familiar face was waiting as well, she smiled. Ah, Riku, glad to see you are on time. Sit down, so I can start the exam. Now this will be a highly invasive set of scans, so you will feel some discomfort. That is perfectly normal with scans this invasive, and nothing for you to worry about. We just need to see how exactly you and your baby are progressing after your procedure earlier today. Rika nodded, and settled into the chair, where the doctor immediately began hooking up probes to her body, and inserting devices. Rika's expressions showed some clear discomfort as some of those items were inserted, but it only got worse from there when the devices were turned on. Yet she didn't complain, even though she was clearly quite uncomfortable. Meanwhile she noted both in Iri paying far more attention to the wealth of detailed medical information streaming across the monitor May kept an eye on it as well, mostly for Megumi's benefit. Her mind however wandered to the mention of a spa appointment after this, she had this feeling that it was much more than just a simple spa appointment. There was likely something more to it, Kairu shifted a bit, as she woke up. It took her a moment to realize that she had fallen asleep almost immediately after having sex with Kelly. In fact she could still feel Kelly's tentacle lodged in her pussy, beneath her. Kelly, who had also fallen asleep was stirring. She took a glance at her internal clock. She hadn't been asleep too long, but they were now a couple of hours behind schedule. Kelly looked up at her with a smile, and then Kelly pressed a tentacle up against her belly. Her face lit up with a beaming smile, and clear joy. She practically whispered, it worked. Kyra needed to ask no questions to know what she was referring to. Her own HUD had already informed her that an embryo was developing in her womb. One that Kelly was going to carry, not her. It occurred to her that she wasn't sure how the transfer process was supposed to work. Glad to hear that. So how does this transfer process work? Kelly looked her in the eye and gave her an naughty look. It would be easier to show you. Suddenly she felt the tentacle still in her pulse and move. It quickly began to build in her belly. As the pulsing tentacle moved deeper, each little movement and pulse sent pleasant tingles up her spine, and she could feel herself growing moist down there again. She began to pant. Moments later, she could feel the tentacle push into her womb just as she felt a particularly pleasant tingle running through her, and her vision turned white. When her hair dropped back down moments later, the tentacle was retreating into Kelly's body, and her had informed her that she no longer had the embryo. The whole process had been far faster and more pleasurable than she would have guessed. The way Kelly was rubbing her belly was enough to tell her that the transfer had worked properly, but she ran a scan just to be sure. It was indeed in her belly, and now establishing connections in Kelly's womb. Kelly smiled, thank you. Anyway I think we better get started on the inspection. Then she sighed. I guess we will be up late today, but it was worth it, don't you think? She nodded. It had been quite the experience actually, although that reminded her that she had a few questions to ask Megumi. Questions related to a certain aspect of that experience. Pushing those aside for the moment, she let Kelly up, and helped her out of the vehicle. Moments later they made their way to the first door. One they should have knocked on around noon, not two hours into the afternoon. A young woman answered the door, shortly after she knocked. Kelly smiled. This is an inspection. Allow us in, and leave the door open. The woman nodded, and opened the door fully to admit them, leading the way into the house where Kairu could smell something cooking. She showed them a sofa, and then said, I'll go get my daughter, and turn off the oven. This might take a while won't it? Kelly nodded, not too long, but yes you probably should turn that off. Don't want your food to burn, the woman nodded, 
and hurried to collect her daughter, and turn off the oven. She was back moments later, and both of them were soon nude. Kyra noticed the slight bulge of her daughter's stomach after she stripped. It raised a few questions, given her age. If Kyra had to guess she was 14 maybe 15, but that was only an estimate. She could be older. In any case, she was obviously a couple months pregnant. As Kelly was inspecting the younger girl, she asked, So have you two been out of town recently? Her mother nodded. Yeah, we had a beach vacation not too long ago. Visited a lovely resort down south. Kelly nodded. I see. I take it your daughter played around a lot with the boys. The woman nodded. Kyrie glanced at the girl and wondered if her being pregnant meant anything special. So she asked Kelly what would happen to the pregnant girl. Announcement. Enjoy the chapter. Feel free to drop a like, a comment, or visit me on Patreon. Have a question? Simply ask, and I'll answer as soon as I can. 26. Chapter 69 Kelly's Insights and Clues at the Spa. Kelly glanced at the pregnant teen and after a moment began to explain what would happen to her, answering Kyrie's question, and more. Some of what she was about to say, however, would be somewhat worrying to Kyrie, and certainly didn't sit right with her. Well, she would be enrolled in the Anirai caretaker service, and a caretaker would be assigned to her. Kairu frowned dubiously, caretaker service, what exactly is that? She sighed, not many Neku are trusted to raise their children properly, and teen mothers like her are especially bad at raising their kids right. The caretaker service exists to ensure those children are raised properly. Kairu gave her a look, that sounds good, but why do I have the feeling it has a dark element to it? Kelly shifted her stance. I've never thought of it that way before, but I guess it does. Kairu blinked. She had not expected Kelly to say that, but she refrained from commenting. Nothing seemed quite appropriate to say in response. That statement did make her wonder if Megumi had done something. Kelly continued. Anyway, back to the service. Once a caretaker is assigned, that caretaker will stick close to her like they would any other mother to be. The goal being to gain the trust of the mother mainly due to how it helps with the next step. The next step? I have a feeling I won't like that. Kelly nodded, you won't. After the child is born, it will be taken away by the caretaker. Once the caretaker deems it is strong enough to leave its mother's side. Kelly was right, she didn't like that. Kairu didn't know what to say about this. What Kelly said next just made those feelings worse. Apparently the sooner the newborn is removed the better. From what I have been told it has something to do with ensuring the child bonds first with her caretaker, and not her mother. There is something special about that first bond a child forms, but I'm not entirely sure what that is. Putting aside her feelings she asked the one question that mattered, surely you have some idea? Kelly nodded, are you familiar with dragons? Star Lords would be closer but I doubt you have any familiarity with them. As it is, I only know what I do about them because my mother told me, and I don't even know where she learned what she did about them. I have some knowledge, but I am not sure what you are getting at. Dragons have this pesky reverse imprinting deal where females of other races schnickly imprint on their pups. While Star Lords apparently do something similar except with their own birth sibling. As for ourselves we form strong bonds with our own children. It's something common among truly gifted Shinnik species, and the Neku are becoming one thanks to our awakening them to their Shinnik heritage. She blinked, and I take it that these caretakers develop that kind of Shinnik bond with the children they care for? Kelly nodded, based on what I have heard. I believe so, I just can't say for certain. She glanced back at the pregnant teen still standing naked, and waiting for Kelly's instructions, then looked back, so why would they want such a bond? May stretched a bit, as the Anairai removed their sensors from Riku, it seemed they were done with their scan. The doctor told her that she was progressing nicely, May had an idea of what that meant, but it seemed Riku wasn't being all that inquisitive about what they were doing to her. Obviously just one more effect of the brainwashing they have been doing to the poor girl. Moments later, Yuria led the girl out the door, and she followed. May was curious to finally see what this spa treatment was all about. She had spent some of the time waiting for it, conversing with Megumi. They had a few ideas, but one thing that stuck with her was that it might include some deep brainwashing. Apparently, the mind was far more vulnerable to telepathic influence when it was relaxed and unguarded. Something that a spa treatment could help produce in the mind. She figured she would know for sure what was up with the spa. When they got there, as they navigated the corridors, she noted the way they were going. The route was actually familiar. May suspected that this spa treatment might not be in this building. That made a certain amount of sense to her. 
Instead of speculating, she focused on following the pair, and listening to them chat. Although she noted nothing of real interest, Yeria was asking Riku more questions, of a very personal nature, and she was answering them. There wasn't anything too interesting in those answers. As such she began paying a little more attention to the other Neku in the building, all of which had an Inaira leading them around. Although, unlike Riku, none of them were obviously pregnant. Which given that they were all nude likely meant they weren't. Not unless they had practically just conceived. Something may dismissed as quite unlikely, although not impossible. She didn't overhear much of interest from them either, but that may have had more to do with the limited windows she had to eavesdrop. It wasn't long before she was outside of the building again, just like she had expected. Yuria gestured at another building in sight. It even had a sign. It was a rather elegant looking building. May noted its features as they started moving towards it. She listened to what Yuria had to say about it. That building over there contains the spa. It has quite a few amenities and treatments. But don't worry about the options. Your entire visit has already been planned. It has? Yep. Just trust us with your body and relax. That is all you have to do, and by the time we are done you should be much more comfortable with your body. A few more visits will be needed for best results of course, which is why we will have a session here every day until you are ready to leave. I understand, May blinked. That sounded interesting, and had a few implications. Some of which weren't stated outright, but indicated something. Still it made a certain amount of sense given their goals. Regardless of what that brief bit indicated. She still wanted to actually take a look and confirm her suspicions. Thankfully she wasn't going to have to wait long, as the building in question was only a brief walk away. Putting her suspicions aside for the moment, she focused on listening to what Yuria was telling Riku about her spa schedule. Although it didn't seem strange to May, perhaps more would be revealed when they actually got there to see it. May stepped into the spa building following the other two. A younger Inaira was there waiting for them, and greeted the visible pair with a smile. Yuria spoke briefly with the younger Inaira, and then they were led into the back, away from the reception room. They were led down a corridor, and into another room, where a number of other naked Neku were being attended by Inaira attendants. May noted this as significant, given Inaira tendencies. They weren't the type to act as servants after all, so she had no doubt that something more was going on here. Although the room looked fairly normal, at first glance, there were a number of recessed tubs scattered around the room, and she noted a few necky relaxing in them. May even noted that in a few of them, some strange apparatus was attached to their heads as they reclined in these pools. Riku was led to an empty pool, one empty of people anyway. As they got nearer May noted the water. Well, more like whatever liquid was in the pool, it sure wasn't water, and it didn't smell like it either. The smell was somewhat sweet, with some undertone she couldn't quite place. The smell was somewhat pleasant, but not something she trusted, not given who was managing the place. May energized and adjusted her shields, and a moment later the smell changed. She then took a quick look around, and noted no one had noticed the brief signs of an engaging personal shield. For most uses, shields and cloaks are mutually exclusive. While running a shield with a cloak was possible according to Solian science, it was a very draining process. Her internal reactor barely had the power for this, and she had to completely shut down her defense cannon for this shield. The why had to do with the particulars of how cloaks and shields interact, but the short is running both simultaneously requires more power than just running one of them independently. On the order of a factor of 10 to be specific, she briefly glanced over her HUD, as she considered that, and noted that it was draining her reserve batteries. At current expenditures she had about an hour and a half before her batteries were depleted. Then she turned her attention to the pool, and the three figures she was observing. Figures that were already talking, something she started to register as she took in what the pool liquid looked like. It was certainly thicker than water, and it didn't look like water either. It was a clearish golden yellow color with swirls of purple in it. Perhaps a mixture? Rather than think on it, she simply took a few scans with what sensors she hadn't turned off. As she listened to them talk. All right Riku, this is your first treatment, a soak in our special mineral bath. It's very good for the skin, and the warm bath should be quite relaxing. It will also be good for relaxing stress and tense muscles. Riku nodded, sounds kind of nice. Although the water looks a little different. It's an oil bath, not water. But you don't have to worry about that, said the attendant, before she continued, this time speaking to Yuria. I need to get back to the desk. I trust you can take care of her. Yes? Yuria nodded. Great. I'll be by later, to let you know when it is time for her to move on to the next treatment. As the other Inairai left, Yuria turned to Riku. 
Okay, go ahead and get in the tub. I simply want you to relax, and soak. Let the mineral bath do its job, and while you are relaxing I am going to massage your scalp to help you relax further. Sound good? Riku slipped into the tub, and replied, It sounds relaxing. Within moments, Riku was relaxed into the tub, and granting Yeria easy access to her head. Yeria quickly reached forward with her tentacles, and started to massage and rub her head. May noted Riku's expressions, and didn't think the Inairai caretaker was in her mind just yet. It seemed the goal at the moment really was to get her to relax. To what end was the question? One she hoped would be answered soon enough, and she hoped they would get out of this room before she had to drop her shields. Then again, who knows, maybe that smell was actually harmless. Well she would know for sure soon enough, as she had already sent the details of those scans she had risked taking to Megumi. She figured the ship say I could analyze that stuff quickly enough. Although she had not heard back from her just yet. Announcement. Enjoying my work? Consider leaving a like, dropping a comment and joining me on Patreon. All of these help me produce more content for you. 26. Chapter 70 May of the Spa, and Megumi's Musings Megumi walked down the corridor, as her other instances actively considered what she was learning. One of her cells had successfully managed to get her the look she needed at an enhanced Neku specimen. Enough of one that she now had a solid idea of what the Anairi were doing. In many respects, these enhanced Neku really were enhanced. While clearly of secondary import, there was some enhancement of physical abilities, minor improvements, nothing really drastic but enough to make a difference. The real kicker was the focus on mental abilities. The enhanced specimens were made smarter, with improved potential and development for shinic abilities including telepathy. In addition, they were made much more receptive to telepathic communication. In other words they could hear, and understand it more easily, among other things. This did make it easier for them to be telepathically brainwashed. But that was only because most Neku weren't trained to defend themselves. If they had that training this would be an advantage as being more receptive to telepathic communications, was basically the same as having really good hearing after one was trained to defend against hostile telepathy. Of course, putting aside what they were doing to the mental and physical abilities of the Neku, there also were the alterations to their reproductive organs, as Megumi had noted earlier, and now confirmed, the Anairi were introducing their own genome into the Nekus. This not only made them more compatible with the Anairi, reproductively speaking, but it also meant their organs were changing to better resemble Anairi ones. Although without the limitation that they had, one introduced by the idiots that tried to finish them. One that Megumi had already fixed in Kelly. Speaking of the genome tweaks, she did note that some of them would have an impact on the instinctive behaviors of the Neku species. She had done some tweaking on Kelly in that regard, but she didn't think it would be needed to reverse everything the Anairai had done to the Neku in that regard. Anyway with the changes the Anairai were making, she had little doubt that once their program had run its course, the Neku would no longer need their men, not for breeding, anyway, and the enhanced female genome was certainly more dominant, if she removed the Anairai, but did nothing. The enhanced would eventually replace the normal on their own. Especially given how the Inairi were doing this, they were using controlled retroviral engineering to rewrite the Neku genome. This was combined with the use of a special cocktail of minerals, vitamins, growth stimulants, and retroviral programmed cloned stem cells, among other things, to accelerate change. It was primitive compared to what Solian bioengineering could do, and harder to control than the Solian method, but for such a young species, remarkable. The exact particulars were actually quite fascinating, those exact particulars even shed light on why they had worked on Riku the way they had, they had isolated her womb specifically to protect the child, since the doses needed to affect mommy the way they planned could prove harmful, if not fatal, to the unborn child. Although once they had worked on the baby, the changes would have eventually moved on to mommy as well, albeit at a slower pace. So in that light it had been quite illuminating. This new data had also revealed something she had not noted before. While she could not be sure, since she had been following protocols, many of the Neku she had recovered from the fleet she captured including Kairu had been infected with a mild virus. Naturally she had simply purged the virus to ensure their health. Now she was wishing she had analyzed it before she had destroyed it. It might just have been the Anairi retrovirus. Oh well. There was no point lingering on what ifs. Her mind then considered the data she had recently received from the spa trip May was observing. The mineral bath was interesting, and it was a mineral bath, but it was also more. 
Not only did it do everything a normal mineral bath did, but it was also laced with special compounds. She found those compounds quite interesting, but she felt they were part of something larger. They struck her as incomplete, but she did note what effects they had. Most notable were the ones they had to nerve fibers. It would be temporary, thanks to the incomplete nature of the compounds. But for a brief period the subject would be more sensitive. Of course she had her fully enhanced subject to inform her opinion of this, and she had a feeling this played a role in certain observed characteristics of that subject. All of that data however was something she was going to keep to herself for now. Instead, she was going to share what she learned about the air in the spa. As May suspected, it was laced with something, but nothing too nefarious. It was a simple relaxant, meant to help relieve a subject of undue tension, and render them more docile not exactly something she wanted May breathing, for obvious reasons, at the moment her shield was keeping her safe, but that was a short term solution. She was already working on a more permanent solution to the problem. In the meantime, she went ahead and informed May about the contents of the air, May shifted as she took in what Megumi had told her moments ago. While watching Yuria give Riku a scalp massage, by this point her gaze had turned somewhat glassy, and she seemed rather relaxed as well. She had little doubt that Yuria was in Riku's head, brainwashing her further, molding her into whatever form the Anairai wanted her to fit into. As for the air, Megumi told her it had some kind of relaxant in it, but nothing else. The ship already had a solution to it, but it wasn't ready to be implemented. As such in the meantime, she was expected to keep her shields up. May wasn't surprised that the ship had a solution, nor about it not being ready just yet. Megumi wasn't going to deploy something without testing it in a controlled fashion first. Hopefully, the ship would be done making that solution ready, before her shields had to be lowered. Her mind dropped that line of thought as something interesting began to happen. Yuria shifted, and suddenly asked Riku a question. How are you feeling? Riku was slow to respond, but when she did respond her tone was slow, and dreamy, really. Nice. That's good, you should be feeling quite relaxed by now. She paused. In fact your mind should also be quite open for me to mess with, so we are going to use this opportunity to work on your trust and make sure you are completely comfortable with the caretaker program. Does that sound alright? Riku was again slow to respond. Yes that sounds nice. It seemed that for the moment at least, she was rather gone. No real surprise there, but May wondered where this was going. Yuria leaning forward, a somewhat different expression on her face, said, Great, I was hoping to discuss the name I had in mind for your baby. I was thinking of naming her Miku. There was a pause, and after a minute or two, Riku tried it out. Miku, Miku, I, are going to like the name. I picked it after all, and doesn't it feel nice knowing I didn't pick something weird? Riku nodded slowly, as Yuria continued massaging her scalp. Yes, it does feel nice knowing you didn't pick something weird, it's a nice name. Just, Yuria cut her off, it is a good name alright. So you should be happy I picked it for your baby. Yuria paused and glanced at Riku's swollen belly meaningfully, and I really like it, so just forget any complaints you have about the name. Riku after a moment, simply said, yes, it's a very good name, thank you for naming my baby so quickly. You're welcome. Anyway speaking of your baby, we should discuss your afterbirth schedule, and how much time you actually spend with her. You will have full access, naturally, since you both need to spend time with each other, but that time should be carefully managed. It's best you don't spend too much time with her, during such a critical time in her development after all. Riku's glassy-eyed face soon frowned, and she said, I'm not sure I like that. Yuria nodded, and cooed, I know you don't. Not yet. But that's why we are talking about it now. So you can work through those feelings. Besides, remember how I said that taking your baby from you was critical? This discussion plays into that step, and will prepare you for the extended absence. Okay? Riku replied. Yes. Yuria smiled, and soon drifted into talking about the schedule just like she said. May paid attention, but nothing about it really stuck out to her. Riku did not seem to fully like it, even as she agreed to some of it, but not all of it. May had the feeling that this was one of the things they were going to be working on with Riku. Anyway, I think with this schedule your baby will be ready to be separated in about two months. That is the whole point of it, to get your baby ready for that extended separation. Riku gave her a look, I know, but, trust me, this is a long way off, you will feel better about it when the time comes. I, ah, uh, guess. Yuria grinned broadly, you will, I'll make sure you are ready for it. 
May figured Riku wouldn't just be ready to be separated from her daughter like that, but eager for it by the time they were done. In fact that might be one of the goals of this training program, but obviously not the only one. Before much more could be said, the other Anaira came back, she slipped over quietly, and said, it's about time you moved on from the bath. Yuria nodded. I thought it was about time. I made good progress here. I'll get her ready for her massage then. Riku blinked slowly. Massage? You're sure that is a good idea? She asked, while rubbing her swollen belly. Yuria replied. We have a specially designed massage table, meant to accommodate girls like you. It is made of a special material designed to provide the appropriate support without putting undue pressure on your belly. Riku gave her a look, and after a moment started to ask a question, but was interrupted as Yuria helped her out of the tub, before leading her out of the room. May moved to follow, curious as to where this was going to lead. There was something else going on here. May was sure of it. On the bright side, she was getting out of this room. She was looking forward to being able to drop her shields, and breathe normal air. 25. Interlude a glimpse into Kairu's nights of school. Kairu sighed and glanced at her VR gear the special gear she had gotten from the ship. Kelly was already asleep, curled up next to her. The young Inairai could be fairly mature at times, but at other times she behaved very much like a child. Although she wasn't sure why, Megumi had told her that the Inairai had a relatively short childhood genetically speaking. They would reach physical maturity at roughly the same time as a naturally born biomic. She certainly knew that her sisters could be quite childish at times as well. Megumi had told her not to worry about it that such behavior was normal for the very young. Anyway, that line of thought was just a distraction. She was just hesitating to put the gear on. Kyra knew very well why she was. The Solian school experience was rather different. With a sigh, she put it on her head and went to sleep. As different as it was, she did have to admit the program was illuminating. She was learning things as usual. Upon falling asleep, she found herself appearing in the school courtyard. It was a nice courtyard if a little unique. The Solians lived their lives out on ships. This school was no different. It was built inside a massive city ship, but this city was inside a large artificial environment. Not that the program really let her explore it. It did give her a chance to see Solian architecture. The school was a decent example. Soft flowing lines combined with etched metal construction. It was surrounded by high walls that featured the same soft lines, and odd etchings. It was a mixture of form with beauty. One assimilation didn't give her much time to appreciate, as she was not the only student here. Young Solian girls were streaming into the courtyard, heading for their respective classes. The ages varied quite a bit, given this was a Solian elementary school with the youngest being a mere three years old, while the oldest were twenty-eight years old. Not that any of them actually looked like they could be nearly thirty. Just one more little sign about the Solian lifespan. Not to mention it helped plot out their school year and put the age of her own simulated classmates in perspective. The girls in her class were around 11 or 12. She headed for class and tried not to think about the fact that she was stuck in a classroom with a bunch of 12-year-olds. It helped that they certainly didn't act their age or look it. A fact she was reminded of, when she reached the classroom. A trio of girls to her left were exchanging gossip of the high school variety. Love gossip to be specific. She wasn't all that interested so, she tuned it out heading for her seat. Not long after, she settled into her chair. A young woman made her way into the room. Kairu sighed when she noted that she was topless. Utterly unacceptable in Neku society, but the Solians were much freer when it came to clothing styles. This woman was of course, her teacher. Like most Solians she was fairly short, but she had a good figure, a cute face, and Kairu thought she had a cute pair of boobs too. She stared at them for a moment, and then blushed when she realized she was doing it. Her teacher settled at the head of the classroom, near her own desk. The teacher set a few objects down, and turned to the class. All right class time to start. Activate your terminals, and open your textbooks to page 22379. We are going to pick up where we left off yesterday. For those of you who missed yesterday, we are covering hyperspatial physics. Chapters 437, 444, and 521. I suggest you quickly review those chapters, as I am not going to go over them again. I also have homework for those of you who missed class yesterday. Come see me after class for it. Kyra nodded along, and activated the terminal. This was one of the reasons why she ultimately chose to wear the headset. The virtual environment would have skipped today's lesson if she had, which sucks. 
perhaps that was there to encourage her to actually wear it every night, she hated to admit it, but that little factor certainly worked. Since she was here yesterday, she wasn't going to have to collect extra homework after class, which was great, there was another problem though, she put that aside, choosing not to dwell on it for as long as she could, instead, she tapped the keys and brought up her holographic textbook, she loved this and wished she had this the first time she had gone to school, unfortunately, her NECU schooling experience had been behind the times even for her own people. Everyone was expected to actually carry heavy physical textbooks, and her old school made zero use of computers. Here that would have been a nut nightmare. Imagine having to lug around these textbooks. Her physics book alone had nearly 50,000 pages, which would have made it a pain to lug around. As it was, it was a pain in a different sense. Being a virtual book, it only took her moments to find the page the teacher requested. Marking the page, she also opened her notebook app along with the worksheet app the class used. Having been here often enough she needed no prompting to do this, and wasn't going to get it either. She had just finished when the teacher launched into the lesson. Turning to the hollow board, she began to write her movements making her exposed boobs bounce. It was kind of distracting, but Kairu tried to ignore it, instead trying to listen to the lecture. Yesterday they had been covering the depths of hyperspace. It was honestly hard for her to wrap her head around that. The neck made use of hyperspace, but frankly she had learned more about hyperspace in the last week than she had during her entire career as a naval officer, the Imperium didn't really know hyperspace, not the way the Solians did, ok, now as we covered yesterday, ships can't safely traverse hyperspace below the 96th layer, however, that is with hyperdrives, which include all Tian hyperdrives which are rather unique among hyperdrives. There is one drive type that does allow ships to travel below the 96th layer. Can anyone tell me what that drive is? Kairi raised her hand. She wasn't entirely sure why, but she was pretty sure about the answer. The teacher turned to her and said, All right, Kairu, tell us what drive it is. Hyperwarp drives. She smiled, Very good, Kairu. Now can you tell me why they allow safe transit? Um, something about a uh, subspace folding? She replied, trying to remember what she had heard. The teacher giggled, the words you were looking for were subspace tunneling not folding. I'll give you points for trying. Now can anyone tell the class how subspace tunneling actually works? Kairu scanned the page, trying not to stare at the teacher, hoping to see something. However, one hand shot up, a hand the teacher soon acknowledged. Subspace tunneling is a bit of a misnomer, as there is no digging involved. Hyperwap drives allow passage through deep hyperspace by twisting the upper dimensional hyperspace into the lower dimensions. This creates an unusual, but stable conduit through hyperspace that allows faster than light travel in the order of several million times the speed of light. Once formed the conduit is a stable passage not unlike a tunnel, where ships can only enter or exit at defined points. Any attempt to enter elsewhere can destabilize the conduit, and may cause the twisted dimensional layers of the conduit to unravel. Very good, Iris. A bit basic but you covered everything important. The teacher paused, and turned to the board where she quickly wrote out several complex equations, the kind you only saw with multidimensional physics, and were often a headache to deal with. Kairu hurried to copy them while trying not to let the teacher's bouncing boobs distract her. She would have thought that with all the naked Neku, and an Ira she sees during the day this wouldn't be a problem. But apparently, it was. She blushed slightly when she realized she was letting herself get distracted again. While the teacher began explaining the equations she took a few notes, as she listened as well, making sure she listed down what each variable meant, the entire time she was also wishing her teacher would just wear a top, anything even just a bra would have been better, Kairi blushed when she realized that her notes included a freehand sketch of her teacher with a focus on her bouncing boobs, that was embarrassing. Why was she doing this, it wasn't like her at all, well not the current her. She had done this a lot back in high school. Except it had been boys then, not girls. It made her wonder what had changed. She knew she could ask Megumi, but so far she had been hesitant to do that. Forcing her mind back on the lesson, she eventually made it through class. Even managing to complete the in-class work, despite her mind constantly wandering to her teacher. Ah, she really wanted to touch those boobs. They looked so soft. The way they bounced while the teacher was using the board was so delicious as well. Shaking her head, she pressed the submit button for her completed classwork. Thankfully before the bell rang, if she had pressed it after, the assignment would have been marked as late, and she would have lost points. 
Kyrie let out a breath and logged out of her terminal before turning it off. She would be back in this classroom later. Now that the first period was up, she had a bit of a break. It was free period right now. Most students used this time to either relax or catch up on their work. There were a few girls already talking to the teacher to get the classwork they had missed. She hadn't missed any, so she could leave. She was free for the next hour. At least she thought she was. However before she could leave, the teacher spoke. Kairu, stay after class for a bit. I need to talk to you. That sent a shiver up her spine. It was never good when the teacher asked you to stay after. Maybe she had been caught staring. Kairu didn't have that long to wait since only four girls had missed class yesterday. Why she didn't know, but they were out of the room with their missed class work. The free period would give them plenty of time to catch up on it. The teacher then turned to her with a calm smile on her face. She pulled out a pad, and showed it to Kairu. On it was a copy of her work, a graded copy. In red letters in the upper right corner was a big 35 out of 100 marked on it. So Kairu, I know you can do better than this. Mind telling me what is going on? She flushed, not quite sure how to explain what was going on. How exactly was she supposed to explain that her slipping grade was due to her being too busy staring at her teacher's boobs? That it was just downright embarrassing. Even if the teacher was a virtual creation, it was also utterly unbecoming since she was acting like a horny teen, and not a person her age. Her teacher looked her over, her smile changing. She felt a strong shiver go down her spine. Moments before the teacher shift her stance, her boobs bounced sexily, and Kairu couldn't help but watch them. An action that did not go unnoticed. Ah, I see, said the teacher, as she deliberately raised her own boobs. You want to touch them don't you? She looked away her face red. The teacher sighed, come on, it's best if you get this out of your system. Can't have you slipping any further. Next thing Kyra knew she had been pulled against the teacher. What followed was one of the more interesting experiences she had while using this program. Announcement. Enjoying my work, consider joining me on Patreon, and leave a comment. I love hearing from my readers, and your support helps me produce more content for you to enjoy. 30. Chapter 71 Spa Massage, and Fun Times May followed the relaxed and dazed Riku to the massage room. Her eyes were still kind of glassy after the mineral bath and scalp massage. Yuria wasn't even touching her at the moment, but it seemed she still wasn't all there. Perhaps an effect of that relaxant in the air. Worse, it was apparently present in this room as well. As such, she was still forced to keep her shields active, which was wreaking havoc with her batteries. Thankfully she still had a few minutes before her power levels dropped to critical levels. She did, however. Request that Megumi hurry up on that fix to the drug dare, Riku looked around, while May noted the room. It was a small side room, with a massage table, several counters, and what looked to be a shower room. There was also one other Anairai in the room, who seemed to be cleaning something, before May could even guess as to the purpose of these items, or what this was for. Yuria said, go ahead, and step in the shower first. It will apply your first coat of special oils, Riku simply nodded and stepped into the shower. It activated instantly, as several moving arms began to spray her naked body with an even coat of light pink oil. The shower cubicle also seemed to fill with some kind of gas. Although only for a moment, it vanished quickly, and the oiling took only a few seconds before automated brushing arms started moving, helping brush the oil into her fur and skin. By the time she stepped out, the only sign she had been oiled was a slight glistening to her skin. Yuria smiled as Riku stepped out, while picking up a tool. May noted it was a type of wide area injector, with numerous small and short needles. All right, hold still. The next step before the massage is a series of injections. They contain special compounds that will speed up the uptake of the mineral oils and enhance the experience. You may feel some slight discomfort during the injections, but it will be totally worth it. The two Inari then followed up, by using the injectors to deliver a series of injections. Each injector made use of a low-power dermal laser to accelerate the healing of the minor punctures all the needles made. They didn't spare a single inch of skin from the experience, and Riku didn't resist, other than some wincing when they got to her more sensitive bits. That and a few complaints about them touching that area. Yuria gave her a look, but Riku didn't seem to notice the look. May did, however, and noted it down. It might mean something. A moment later, she was guided to the table and helped onto it. Where May noted the special feature it had to accommodate pregnant females. The table stretched and deformed as her belly pressed into it, molding itself to fit her belly. May got closer for a better look, and noted that it gave to the touch. 
yet seemed to also offer support for her belly, it appeared to do the same for her breasts, this was interesting. She recalled that the Solian people used programmable nanopolymers for the same sort of effect. As soon as Riku was securely settled on the table, the pair of Inairai began applying a gold oil to her back and working it in. They started with her upper back, between her shoulders, working slowly. Even in her rather glassy-eyed, and dazed state Riku seemed to enjoy the massage as they slowly worked their way down over a period of several minutes. After a couple of minutes of the massage, May noticed Riku twitch, and juices began to glisten and mix with the oil down there. It was barely noticeable given the light and the oils, but May realized that she had already come. Several more followed that, and they hadn't even touched any of her sensitive bits. At first they stayed away from those, the massage seemed pretty normal, as Riku melted like putty under the gentle yet firm touch of their tentacles. They worked her muscles and skin in a fashion that seemed very relaxing, especially judging by the way she was moaning under their touch, even occasionally orgasming. With every passing moment, she seemed to relax further, her eyes eventually glazing to the point that May doubted the pregnant neck really knew what was going on anymore. It was at this point that Yuria finally spoke. All right, your backside is feeling very loose now, we are going to flip you over and start working on your front. Okay, Riku was slow to respond, very slow, they had already flipped her over. When she finally said, yes, of course, Yuria smiled and rubbed her head for a moment. Then the two of them began massaging her belly, they stayed there for a few moments, while constantly applying their oils. Slowly they moved apart working to get every inch of skin on her front side as they had for her rear. Riku didn't even protest when they started working on her boobs and thighs, May noted them avoiding her pussy. Although she suspected they would not for long, she proved right, as they did eventually work their way there, and at that point, it didn't even look like a massage. They were quite deliberately working her up into orgasm. After orgasm, Riku didn't even protest their attention but instead seemed to welcome it, not that she was really in a state to protest anything. Yuria started whispering to her but May didn't quite catch it. It was at that moment, that Megumi informed her that she was ready to implement her solution. The timing was excellent too, since her batteries were running low. She had mere minutes left before she would have had to drop her shields to conserve power. The update to her systems and the alterations took only moments allowing her to drop shields and focus on what she was observing. Riku's pussy was not the only part of her body they were lavishing attention on. They were also playing with her boobs and other sensitive bits, with the clear goal of bringing her to climax as quickly and often as possible. Both Inairai seemed to be paying a lot of attention to her responses. The second one pulled out an injector and suddenly used it on Riku's clit. Riku whimpered but did nothing to resist. The injector was refilled and set aside while they went back to teasing the sensitive little nub. Gauging the reaction to the stimulation, obviously not satisfied, they used the injector on her again. This time she reacted a little more, but again did nothing to resist the treatment. This time they didn't just stop with her clitoris but followed up with several injections to her labia, her boobs, and her nipples. Again they set it aside and focused on stimulating her, gauging her reactions. This time they must have been happy with her responses as they put the injector away. A few gels were rubbed into the skin of her sensitive bits a moment after that, before they helped her to her feet and prompted her into the shower. The shower again sprayed her with that pink oil, and worked her over. It didn't end there this time but moved on to apply a light red and a purple tinged set of oils. Oils it let set for a few seconds before finally washing her off. A blast of warm air was used to dry her off and then the door opened to let her out. Strangely, she seemed a little more awake, when she stepped out of the shower but not by much. Yuria stepped close to her, and started rubbing her head. After a moment she spoke to Riku in a calm or authoritative tone. Okay Riku, I need you to listen. While you are here we are going to be doing a lot of strange things to you. I want you to think of it as normal. Also while you are in our facility you are allowed to remember, but not dwell on anything we do. Understand? Slow as usual Riku replied. Yes. Yuria smiled. Good. One more thing. When we leave the facility, you are to forget everything that happened here, and merely remember you had a good time. Understand? Riku replied in the same manner. May figured that in her current state she was absolute putty in their hands. Great, I'm going to start messing with your mind a little. Just let me in, and don't even try to resist anything I do. Okay? Okay. Yuria's smile widened, and then her face changed, seeming to lose focus on the world. She was doing something, something at a far deeper level. What she was doing, May didn't know, but could guess. 
she had been watching Yuria long enough to get a general idea what her mind focused on. If she was a betting girl, and everyone knew she was, she would bet that Yuria's actions were mainly focused on Riku's unborn child, altering Riku's mind to be more amenable to Yuria's demands on the subject. At the moment, she was certainly not in a state to even resist that. Yuria didn't stay in her mind for long. After about a minute and a half she released the poor Neku. All right we have one last appointment here, and then it's time to get you to bed. Riku nodded. After a moment, Yuria told her. It's merely a consultation with the spa's beauty director. She will be looking you over and deciding what treatments will get you looking your most attractive, and responsive. Don't worry about a thing, we will be deciding all the important details for you. Just relax and let us do the work, okay? Okay. That predatory smile returned, and she was rushed out of the room. May followed. But the consultation was quick. It was in a small office attached to the building, but none of the Anairai spoke much other than Riku being examined like a prized animal. There was nothing of note, little surprise there given how easily the Anairai could bend the Neku to their will. It was just a sign of the current relationship between the two species. Kairu stretched as she stepped out of the latest house. It was getting late, and the truck was nearly full. There was only one last house on the list, and then they would be done for the day. Kelly had been pretty happy the whole time, likely due to the experience they had so recently shared. One she still had questions about, but hadn't yet asked Megumi about them. Kelly slipped out behind her. Kyra noted her dreamily rubbing her belly, likely dreaming of the day that little one was born. Kelly could be such a child at times, but at this moment it seemed she was meant to be a mother. How good of a mother she would be remained to be seen. Kairu did have a few questions. She had to wonder, would the child be an Inairai, a Neku, or a hybrid? With most races, the result would be a hybrid. But since she hadn't seen any before, she had to wonder if that was the case with the Inairai. There was also that question about what happened while they were having fun. Kairu had felt everything that Kelly was feeling, and it seemed like Kelly had been feeling everything that Kairu felt. The sensations had bounced between them magnifying to be quite powerful that had been the most intense experience she had ever had, more intense than even her virtual teacher reminded of that encounter. She pushed it aside, however she could not help but think about her trips to school. Every time she went there, she found herself acting like a horny teenager. Why she wasn't entirely sure, and it was so embarrassing she was afraid to ask. Then she remembered that in her last class, she had been wondering why she was suddenly so attracted to girls. Now that she was more clear-headed, she was able to pick out what had changed. Before she could really focus on that however, Kelly frowned. End of block 2